Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. My name's Sage, and today's guest is Mr. Ahmet Sinair. He's the managing partner at Smart Citizenship. Getting a second passport these days can be complex and very time-consuming. Today's guest will help us to understand the new paradigms of gaining a second citizenship. I so want to find out more from Ahmet, who will help us understand this subject better. So bringing you live today, we have Mr. Ahmet Sinair, founder and managing partner from Smart Citizenship. Welcome to the show, Ahmet. Hello. It's really nice to uh, be here. It's fantastic to have you join us today and you have so much knowledge to share so let's get started. You created Smart Choice, a simple investing methodology that lets your clients protect their wealth and get a plan B efficiently. So can we find out more please? Of course. Uh, smart citizenship and the smart investment algorithm, it's all about leveling the, the playing field. Uh, residency and citizenship by investment. So let's get uh, how this works first. So technically, this is retail or individual FDI. Uh, for indirect investment, it's usually made extremely easy for institutional investors. But uh, what we are out to do is to provide similar support systems, giving them cold hard data on investments, evaluating and comparing investments for individual investors within a singular algorithm. So uh, technically, individuals, when investing overseas, are able to act uh, and uh, invest like institutional uh, investors. So uh, giving the data, we help making sense of the data. And after the investment is done, uh, acquiring the attached documents, be it a passport or a residency card it's it's uh, extremely easy it, it becomes an operation after you get the investment right that's fantastic so you're giving the retail investor the same opportunities that perhaps are usually open to institutional investors is that correct that's exactly great. exactly and what about the minimum investment amount does that um change as well regardless of whether someone is a market retail investor or institutional well, uh, individuals, of course, uh, a little different than institutional investors, they are actually uh, ringing our door to get a second citizenship or a residency permit. Uh, so for them, uh, of course, there are minimums. So for example, uh, 250,000 euros gets uh, you a Greek uh, golden visa, or uh, if you want uh, another uh, country in Europe, you can uh, go to Portugal, that uh, gives you 280k uh, golden visa. Or if you're feeling adventurous, you can come to Turkey and take advantage of the 250k real estate investment route that gives you a fast-tracked passport. So uh, it, it depends on what the individual is looking for. Oh, wow, so you're ringing us from Turkey today. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so exactly. much. Exactly, uh, from the other side of the uh, world. Yes, it's amazing technology these days. Um, so can we find out a little bit more, now that our, curious, our curiosity is definitely peaked, what are the popular programs at Smart Citizenship? I think you touched on it a little there. Can you expand on that? So unfortunately, there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution here. 
So uh, programs these days have become very versatile to accommodate different needs from different people. So the first question would be, are you relocating? Are you open to relocating? If yes, you can just uh, get the really uh, simple and straightforward Portuguese D7 visa, which is very uh, popular with digital nomads or people just looking to relocate. Or if you want to, uh, if you're relocating and if you're uh, open to start a company, you can uh, get the innovator visa from the UK, for example. Or if you are a really talented individual, uh, if you have specific skills, you can go to Canada, UK again, who are very accommodating. But let's say you want to stay where you are, but you just want a plan B passport or a second residency. So then the question becomes how uh, big of a, an investment you are willing to make or how much time you have until you have that uh, passport uh, in your back pocket. So, but to really uh, say to your curiosity on the popular programs, I mean, uh, for people who are looking for a plan B, uh, the Portuguese golden visa is almost 90% of the time uh, our go-to route. But uh, the Greek program is making trails. The Greek government is making everything uh, right and correct all the correct moves so they are uh, next in line to become really popular and the turkish program it blindsided everyone we never expected to be uh, this powerful when compared to other programs that give you schengen zone access uh, uk access the turkish uh, citizenship program gives you a very modest passport but it seems due to lifestyle choices people are uh, investing in turkey to become turkish that's very interesting. And the Portuguese passport and the digital nomad lifestyle, that is something that a layperson wouldn't know. So thank you so much for sharing your information. Now, um, you may have heard of those countries sometimes advertising $1 residences, come and stay here and buy a house for $1. Have you heard of those schemes advertised usually on social media? Are they true? Would you know? Would you, know, would you have any information on that? Sure, sure. You'd be surprised uh, how many programs uh, we uh, take into consideration for any individual. That $1 purchases, uh, here is how they work. Let's say you're a beautiful uh, uh, town in uh, Italy, uh, but uh, most, most, uh, let's say most of the housing stock over there is in shambles. You can't uh, exactly tear them down because they are uh, most likely historical. I mean, they are priceless buildings. So what you do is that you go out and look out for investors who are willing to renovate them. So uh, you can move there, but of course it comes with strings attached. Uh, and it doesn't work uh, the sa in the same manner as a golden visa or a citizenship by investment program. So for example, not all countries can move over there, but and of course, once you own the property, you're obliged to renovate it. And let me tell you, uh, renovating an historical villa in Tuscany, it costs quite a bit of, uh, of money. Thank you so much for offering us a little bit of light on that situation. And becoming a digital nomad is so much more popular than it was 10 or 20 years ago. So investing overseas now will also free up people's time and give them a bit of financial freedom. So what are the best ways of limiting risk in your opinion? So first of all, use everything on cold hard data. Touching back on the point, giving the uh, weapons the institutional investors have. So let's say you're managing a real estate investment fund that invests overseas. You're not going to take anything at face value. Uh, you, 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 you will be a cold and calculating person and base everything on data. That's, that's the first thing you need to do as an individual, because let me tell you, as an individual, you're exposed to more risks because you don't have access to top of the line lawyers like institutional law, uh, investors do. You don't know uh, a lot about the country you're investing in. You don't have many friends over there. So that's why you don't take anything at face value. For example, if uh, a developer or a seller is giving you a rental guarantee or a buyback guarantee once you're done with the program, you need to dig deep 
into what sort of a guarantee is it? Is it an SPV guarantee? Is it a bank letter? Is it, if, if it's a SPV guarantee, it's more or less the same as me promising to give you back your money. That's it. So, and even on top of that, uh, what I would do if, if I didn't have anyone to count on, I would just follow the local smart money. Just ignore the hypes. Just uh, limit your exposure to uh, the marketing uh, companies like us, unfortunately, are doing. And you just follow the local money, where it's going. And it's going to take you where you need to be 90% of the time. And my biggest, uh, biggest uh, worry would be individual investors investing in asset classes that they wouldn't invest at home. So here is how it works. Let's say all of your real estate investments are in residential. I recommend if you go to Portugal or, uh, or Turkey or anywhere for that matter to invest in residential because you know how the game works. But all of a sudden, if someone pitches you student housing that you don't know anything about, well, I just I would just take a step back. If it's something you're not exposed to back home, why take the risk with your first investment abroad? So basically, if you do these, I mean, these, I know these, uh, to do them, uh, it's a tall order. Like saying the, these things uh, over over uh, a call like this, it, it's, it's very easy. But actually doing that, following the smart money, these are big things. And that's why... Uh, some blatant marketing on my side, you need really good consultants. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so we've noticed that maybe the trends have changed over time with citizenship and immigration. Everyone used to want to go to America and now, I don't know, things change perhaps with President Trump's uh, change in immigration policies and things like that. Um, from your perspective, how has the availing or gaining of citizenships transformed over the years? Have you noticed any particular trends? The USA example you've given, it's the perfect example. Uh, thank you for just uh, giving that to me on a silver platter, because I wasn't going to name names uh, of countries. Uh, but a very surprising thing is happening in the USA. Uh, people, as you said, uh, people from countries like uh, mine uh, and even all around the world for that matter, people were looking to go to USA. The trend is still continuing. Uh, don't get me wrong. People want to relocate to USA. But the big news is US citizens are looking to relocate elsewhere uh, because uh, the cat is out of the bag now. Uh, with, with the previous president, uh, they have seen how uh, prejudiced people can become overnight. Uh, I'm playing it, but there was a civil coup attempt at the Capitol. These aren't small things. And on top of that, there's this tax the rich trend. Uh, I'm all for social justice, but tax the rich with the pitchforks and the flames, that's not nice. So because of this, USA citizens are looking to relocate to greener pastures, if you, uh, if you can believe that. So uh, lower taxes are attracting them lower uh, social friction is attracting them. But in terms of transformation, there is, uh, of course, the biggest trend is from the developing world. Here is how it works over there. Uh, people from the developing world, they no longer want to be judged by the mistakes of their governments. They want options. They want to be treated better. Uh, they want their kids to be able to uh, attend top-of-the-line education without pulling strings. So that's why uh, uh, citizenship paradigm is shifting. People want to choose their citizenship now. Uh, but of course, there is the uh, social friction and uh, disgust, if I may say, from most countries, including Turkey. Uh, this uh, passport for the rich, uh, as they put it, uh, campaigns. They don't want these, but imagine this. I, I always use the institutional investor and institutional FDI example. When a big company is looking to relocate, they get zero taxes, all sorts of privileges. These huge companies have been paying zero taxes in Ireland for a while uh, until, of course, it changed. But when we give individuals 
residencies or even passports for their hard-earned money to be poor countries, people lose their minds. This is the biggest challenge in uh, that is stopping this paradigm shift. Uh, the paradigm shift, to put it uh, as a summary, is that you're no longer uh, a prisoner to your current citizenship. Con countries out there want you to be uh, on their team and they are going the extra mile for in exchange for a uh, small investment in most cases 250k it used to be a lot of money but in, but inflation and everything it's becoming more of a middle class thing these days so can i just confirm or just clarify one thing with your services you help people um to gain a second passport in many cases but also through the process, help them to gain knowledge and opportunities for international investment. Is that correct? That's a, a very astute observation. Uh, the different thing about smart citizenship, most uh, companies like us, and there are many, by the way, uh, they just beeline to the citizenship privileges attached to investments or the residencies attached to these investments. We're more focused on the investment side. So a, a, a very interesting thing uh, that struck us was no single investor we have has only invested uh, for the citizenship with us. They kept investing uh, because I think we give that extra punch when picking the investments. But I mean, so mo most people see the uh, residencies as the main course. For us, the residency and the passport that come with the investment is just the cherry on the top. The investment has to be very solid, very sound. And if we get a passport out of it, that's awesome. Uh, and I mean, it's an end-to-end -end service, but uh, I think it's because of the DNA of the company. I mean, we have an investment banker, we have a lawyer on board in-house. Me, I come from a real estate investment background. I mean, we can't sort of uh, stop ourselves from being very aggressive on making a good investment. Thank you. And I guess part and parcel with investment comes taxation. Does your company also help with uh, international tax and, and how to get started with that? Exactly, as you said, we help with how to get started. Uh, taxation is a, a heavily regulated uh, industry. I mean, tax consulting anywhere. So we have a network of uh, very solid advisors anywhere you go. It could be Dominica, it could be Turkey, it could be Portugal. Uh, we just point you and make a play matchmaker with uh, investor and tax advisors because some investors move everything. For example, their companies, their uh, entire residencies, their uh, disposable income, everything. Uh, so for that kind of person, you need a different kind of tax advisor. But for the guy who is looking to just buy a flat in Athens, uh, you don't need a lot of uh, taxation consulting firepower. I mean, it's not cheap, so we are uh, a little... Uh, stringy about how we uh, use our clients money but to give you some flavor for example portugal has a very uh, interesting taxation tax break for people relocating over there so they uh, tax your international income at zero percent if you structure it right so uh, of course we get people started on the nhr uh, but Taxation is a it's a jigsaw. It jigsaw. You can't uh, give a one size fits all solution. Tax experts. Great, thank you so much. And we have to start winding up the discussion now. So we have been living through a pandemic era, and travel tourism has all been affected in a in a massive way. How has it affected your business? How did you manage to stay buoyant? And what are your near term goals in the pipeline? Sure. Uh, I mean, any conversation cannot end without talking about the pandemic, of mm -hmm. course. But even though pandemic has been the worst thing to happen to most people and most companies, uh, speaking only commercially, commercially, uh, there was a demand boom for us. Because once people are stuck in their countries, imagine you're from the developing world, you, get, you end up in the red list. Uh, of the European Union. You can't go anywhere. 
you feel in prison. So what you do is that you call the guy you talked to maybe six months ago uh, about the second citizenship and you fast track the process. So there was a demand boom, but it was very hysteric. So it was really hard to keep up on our end. But over time, it stabilized. There is less hysteria, of course, but people are just uh, taking more solid steps. So for us, it increased revenue. But of course, being a startup uh, in the middle of the pandemic, it is providing huge, huge uh, problems for us as well. I mean, uh, the end of this thing couldn't come sooner. But uh, over time, once things stabilize, we want to stay hybrid, but I really want to see uh, my teammates more in person. Uh, because, I mean, honestly, I missed them. Uh, that's it. And uh, business-wise, I think we would be much better off having the flexibility to travel more freely without fear. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the end of this. Yes, exactly, exactly. Thank you so much for sharing your personal story there. And before you go, just going to ask you one thing from your personal knowledge. In your opinion, what's the best passport to have? You've mentioned Portugal a fair few times. What passport, in your opinion or from your knowledge, gives you the most access to the world? It's situational. Uh, access to the world, uh, Singapore, uh, Japanese uh, passport, it's awesome. Uh, I mean, Portuguese uh, on the t passport is on the top five, but I really, uh, I think you may have noticed, but I try avoiding naming uh, a best option all the time. It's very situational. Uh, it's very dependent on what the investor wants to do uh, with their passport. I mean, uh, some passports are uh, very modest uh, in itself. So I, I think it, we have to go... Uh, in best case by case on this. But I mean, if if I wanted to magically receive a passport, uh, it would probably be the Singaporean passport. Oh, very interesting. Well, it's an emerging economy with some great um, tax uh, exactly. infrastructure for crypto, <laughs> I believe. Well, anyway, thank you so exactly. much, Ahmed. I really appreciate you sharing your passion for what you do. It's, it's clearly evident you love your job. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to the next time, perhaps. Take Absolutely. care. Absolutely. Bye-bye. So today, guess, uh, viewers, if you have just joined us, we had a very informative discussion there with Mr. Ahmet Saner. He's the founder and managing partner from Smart Citizenship. And please watch the full interview via YouTube at Calkine Media. Until the next episode, please keep watching for more live market updates and hot trends. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Social media influencers often draw criticism for promoting cryptocurrencies looking to take advantage of the hype around well-known virtual assets. New cryptocurrencies have frequently been surfacing in the crypto market and some of them vanish overnight after wiping off the money from investors. Please subscribe to the channel. This article has been written by the team of Kalkine writers. I am happy to present it for you on behalf of Kalkine Media. My name is Sage. If you are into social media, you might have often come across celebrities and influencers promoting one of the altcoins available in the market. An altcoin is an alternative cryptocurrency to Bitcoin, and there are plenty of altcoins available in the market. At the beginning of this year, celebrity Kim Kardashian, you may have heard of her, and professional boxer Floyd Mayweather were sued over allegations that they misled investors while promoting a lesser known cryptocurrency called Ethereum Max. 
Now, a social media influencer named Ice Poseidon is under fire after it was alleged that he stole US $500,000 from fans through his crypto project, which is now abandoned. So what are the allegations against Ice Poseidon? And what is the underlying controversy? Let's take a closer look. Twitter user named CoffeeZilla, who describes himself as an internet detective exposing scams, said that Ice Poseidon has admitted to taking the money from his fans through a crypto scam called CX Coin. The CX Coin website described the project as a platform for streamers and content creators to receive support through virtual assets. The Twitter user wrote, Ice Poseidon claimed that the cryptocurrency project was a long-term play and promised supporters that he would not pull the rug on this project. However, it now remains abandoned. And CoffeeZilla claims to have confronted the social media influencer who admitted taking the money from his fans and has no intention of giving that back as he will look out for himself. The Twitter user is reportedly asking people who have been duped of their money to report the scam with the Internet Crime Complaint Center, IC3, a Federal Bureau of Investigation website for online criminal activities. In conclusion, the cryptocurrency market is highly volatile and those indulging in making investments in virtual assets must be aware of the ups and downs of the market. It appears that investing in the newer cryptocurrencies is a high risk job and it is essential to be cautious before investing. Thanks for joining us on the report. And if you do like the information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos by Kalkine. But for more articles like this, head to kalkinemedia.com. My name's Sage for Kalkine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Seems as though the crypto market has been on a losing spree so far this year. However, the gains of Bitcoin and Ether are less compared to some metaverse and NFT cryptos like Mana and Sand. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields reporting for Calcine Media. Let's take a look at the top potential three NFT cryptos for February of this year. Number one, Flow. Flow is not a typical non-fungible token asset. It's an ecosystem that supports the development of blockchain games and NFTs. Flow is an enabler for blockchain gaming developers, and though it supports a variety of decentralized apps, the primary focus is on games and digital collectibles. The team behind CryptoKitties, a blockchain-powered game, is said to have developed Flow, a proof-of-consensus-based blockchain for creating smart contracts. Flow's token of the same name has gone up almost 50% over the past seven days. Number two, Engine Coin. Engine is another diverse ecosystem with blockchain gaming at its heart. The network's primary function is to allow developers to use Ethereum's blockchain and create in-game tokens. Engine claims that every NFT minted on the network comes with an ENG token. And this token is used to back the value of minted digital assets. And as of now, Engine has a market cap of nearly 1.5 billion US dollars. Number three, Decentraland. Mana is a top metaverse token popular in its use of NFTs for digital real estate. 
the decentralized market cap is the highest among all these cryptos. What makes it popular is the high price of its virtual real estate, which has stunned market watchers. A piece of land on Decentraland's metaverse can sell for millions of dollars. In fact, Samsung recently launched its virtual reality store there not too long ago. In November of last year, the crypto hit a 5.5 US dollars, but the rally was short-lived. The high market cap and real estate NFTs make Banner a close watch in the near term. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. This has been Holly Shields for Kalkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Three crypto predictions for February 2022. The January blues seem to be retreating and most cryptocurrencies have gained somewhat over the past few days and metaverse tokens are leading this recovery. Though the total market cap of the cryptocurrency market has yet to rebound to its all-time value, the ongoing recovery has come as a breather. In the first few days of 2022, there were doubts that Bitcoin would ever reach 100,000 US dollars. But investors are looking hopeful now as the macro fundamental factors do point for long term bullishness for the crypto. But what are the major predictions for cryptocurrencies? What are some of the factors that may shape crypto prices in February? Let's have a look. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media and this article has been kindly written by Kalkine's writing team. Rate hikes and banks. Inflation has been one of the worst economic fallouts of the pandemic. Economies are reeling from record high prices of virtually all goods and services. Much of the January sell-off in cryptocurrencies was attributed to fears of high interest rates. Investors retuned their risky portfolios. And from here on, there are two likely possibilities. First, the market may have adjusted to the looming rate hikes and a further sell-off may not be as deep. Secondly, actual rate hikes may again trigger a wider sell-off in all the risky asset classes, including the volatile cryptocurrencies. Rebound in the stocks. The S&P 500 index has shown signs of rebound over the past few days and after last year's impressive gains, the global stock markets remained subdued in the initial weeks of January. Tech stocks suffered a rout, but things may get better in the coming weeks. Cryptos are often clubbed with stocks in the riskier asset category. The price movement in stocks and cryptos has been comparable so far in 2022. Investors may now look favorably at stocks and cryptos after having adjusted their portfolios. But a few experts are also warning of a deep correction in the market and only stocks with strong fundamentals may emerge as winners. Regulators on cryptos. Different regulators in the world have different stances on cryptocurrencies. The emerging economy of India introduced a range of aspects, including taxing of virtual and digital assets and levies on cryptocurrency gifts while presenting the national budget 2022. In February, a few other countries like India may come up with their plans to regulate cryptos or even ban their trade. Any move, negative or positive, would have a profound impact on crypto prices. In conclusion, to sum it all up, it's important to note that predicting anything about cryptocurrencies and their linked blockchain projects is a difficult exercise. Uncertainty grips the market a lot more when the macroeconomic indicators like inflation and growth are not exactly favorable as they are 
this February. That said, cryptos are on the rise of late and this limited rally could translate into gains for investors that buy and sell cryptos at the opportune time. Thanks for joining us on the report and if you do like this information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel and press that bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos by Kalkine. For more articles like this, head to the website kalkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's show features Ms. Jane Morrow, President, and Ms. Claire Bird, the Executive Secretary at the Integrated Bioscience and Built Environment Consortium, also known as IBEC. Frontline workers like nurses, teachers, and airline and public transport workers have been most at risk during the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's guests will help us understand the salient issues surrounding this topic by sharing insights from the work they undertake at IBEC. So please keep watching till the end. Bringing you live today, we have Ms. Jane Morrow, the President, and Ms. Claire Bird, the Executive Secretary at IBEC. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a lot of questions regarding access to PPE equipment, isolation timeframes and being fit for work duties, making the headlines of late. I'm, I'm so glad you're available to shed some light on these subjects. So let's get started. Um, the frontline workers are more at risk of contracting COVID in some cases. How can PPE equipment provide assurance for frontline workers, please? And the surgical and N95 masks are single use only, but how effective are they if they're used more than once? Absolutely, Sage. Thank you for this opportunity to share more about PPE. PPE is short for personal protective equipment, and it's one of the critical tools in protecting frontline workers and others. Respiratory protection is the PPE item that reduces our exposure to harmful gases and particles like asbestos and silicon, for example, or in this case, airborne pathogens. It's a key element in the hierarchy of controls we employ to reduce the risk of spreading and catching COVID. We hear a lot about N95 masks. They get their name as they've been tested under standardized conditions and shown to be successful at removing 95% of airborne particles of that otherwise may enter our respiratory system. So when we inhale, far fewer virus particles are present than when we wear one of these masks. So wearing a mask helps protect us from these infectious particles. The P2 mask in Australia and the FFP2 mask in the UK are broadly equivalent to the N95 masks here in the United States. Claire has additional comments around uh, PPEs. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, um, I think we've seen a paradigm shift in how we view respiratory protection. Normally, we use PPE as a last line of defense against a hazard. Respiratory protective equipment is designed to stop us from inhaling harmful airborne material that's already there. But really, our first choice is always to prevent something harmful becoming airborne in the first place. So COVID's changed our perception of respiratory protection. Wearing the right mask has the added benefit of reducing how much virus an infected person puts into the air. And that's why masks have become such an important measure in controlling COVID outbreaks. So to decide how important personal protection is for a given situation, we really need to think about our exposure risks and use what we know about our immediate surroundings. You know, who are we considering protecting? How many people are there? How long are they there for? And what type of activities are they undertaking? Thank you for clarifying that for us because I know a lot of people seem to think that an N95 mask means that you can wear it for 95 hours. So I, I think there's a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding circulating about 
the PPE equipment and how it should be used. So thank you so much for clarifying that. Now, isolation timeframes can also be confusing. We've seen some changes in regulations and with the Omicron outbreak, and isolation mandates have been reduced. What are IBEC's opinions on this, please? Yes, we agree. Um, the change in guidance and our definitions of post contact, for instance, is confusing. There's also great variation in these requirements in different countries. And traveling internationally has become a minefield when you're trying to respect all of these different guidances. So restrictions keep changing in part because the transmissibility and the severity of symptoms caused by the virus keeps changing. When we see shifts in rates of hospitalization, serious illness, and death, the goalposts must move. The impact of some of the changes to our economies has not always been predicted accurately as well, and it's hard to forecast because we don't know what the next variant will be. A great concern to IBEC and the wider scientific community has been reluctance to accept COVID as an airborne disease. Following uh, the Cortese, which is a, a principle that we deploy at IBEC and have facilitated in our Commit to Care program to help folks understand the risk and the vulnerability in safe has been a big uh, a big effort in helping to slow the rate of spread and reduce exposure of frontline and vulnerable workers. Thank you. Thank you for, for letting us find that out because I think some people are being pushed back to work when they're asymptomatic but are still perhaps testing positive for COVID. Um, where do you stand on that? Have you heard of that occurring? It's very important that we think about um, the number of viral particles that we're exhaling as a function of sneezing or coughing and how we can reduce that exposure by the time that we spend together as well as um, the time that we and the distance that we are from each other. So um, when we're together in spaces and we exchange enough viral particles to make us sick, um, it's going to, that's going to change depending on the variants themselves. So really how you protect yourself is, is in direct response to how long you're around other people and being very cognizant of what those guidelines suggest about exposure and exposure times is dependent on the number of viral particles you're, you're emitting and of course that's changing for the different variants. Okay, thank you. And sorry, Claire, did you want to add something as well? Yeah, I'm actually, um, yeah, well, just, um, so in sort of some of the work, I guess, that's going on in Australia at the moment, um, a lot of what um, has been happening has been happening around the, the building industry, the medical community, um, and that's why IBEC connects people, pathogens and places. And we've been buildings together with building science, with medical science, with indoor air quality science, because we really want to improve the understanding of how infection spreads and sending people, I guess, back to work when they're still testing positive um, really is a decision that's, that's been made because we haven't controlled necessarily airborne transmission as we hoped we would. And it's an Australian um, science group on stage that's been working very strongly um, in trying to provide material to government and to bodies who are responsible for making decisions on how to reduce airborne transmission so that we don't end up with staff shortages and problems with our supply chain. So with all of the information out there, and IBEX hoping to bring all of that information together, um, we'll be having a knowledge repository that people can access to find out what the latest understanding is. Um, so that's how we do it and how we've approached it. All right, thank you for that. Yes, and I think they have been implementing the use of some air sanitizers as well in some cases, which will hopefully protect the people in that environment. And we'll, we'll just keep moving on. Um, third booster shots are being encouraged. Is there a chance that COVID-19 will reach an endemic stage where it becomes like the seasonal flu? Do you think a yearly booster shot could become the norm? So I'm not a medical expert, Sage, but one of the things that we feel qualified to address in this question is that we can learn from past pandemics to better understand what our future response to this virus will be. So for example, if you look at flu, you can see how the science community works on an annual cycle to share data and information 
on the emerging flu strains. This is how we know which strains should be covered in vaccines and develop vaccines appropriately. So we may need to apply these same principles in protecting people from future variants of SARS-CoV-2 as well. Okay, thank you. And how effective can antibody tests be? You've mentioned it a little bit about um, the earlier uh, topic of people going back to work when being tested positive. Is it possible that people may have built up an immunity through exposure? Yes, yeah, so um, in order for antibody tests to arrive on the market, the manufacturer must produce test data and these, these data are reviewed by a regulatory body. So we've seen a plethora of new tests on the market with wide ranging published data on their effectiveness and different times during the infection. Um, the performance data are available to the public and you can look up how well your antibody tests have been have worked against various variants um, through these third party testing sites like in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration. And it's important that we continue to challenge these tests with data from new variants so we can make sure that they're still effective at detecting it. And of course, people can and will mount immune responses to the virus if exposed and infected. So how long immunity lasts is likely varies between individuals and the strain of the virus. Um, the immune response is indeed the science that underpins measuring the extent of a person's response to having it been infected with COVID. And so laboratory assays can look directly at current antibodies circulating in your body and are particularly useful once you have had an infection and your body has mounted a response. And they can be detected for many months on. So alternatively, there are some rapid detection devices that use antibodies, and these antibodies are commonly derived from animals in a response to a viral protein. And they're used to detect an active COVID infection. These assays are different from the laboratory procedures, and they can be used in, in real time, similar to like a, a, a pregnancy test is what the assays tend to look like. Um, they must also be challenged with different variants so that we end at different countries so we have confidence in both the detection level and the minimum concentration of viral particles in the assays we detect. This is really important for our, our earlier discussion point um, around the concentration of viral particles emitted for different people and different phases of detection with different variants. So knowing how the test perform is important to you as a consumer and a frontline worker in deciding when you have confidence to and the ability to re-enter the workforce recovering from an infection or if you wish to monitor your own health or potential exposure. Claire, what are your thoughts on antigen testing? Claire, did you have anything to add on that topic to follow on from Jane? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um, I actually can't hear Jane, unfortunately, so I'm not sure what she's covered. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that one of the main things um, um, is that uh, rapid antigen tests uh, are very, very useful when you've got the infection uh, being able to tell you um, when you're safe to, to return. That's what they're being used for at the moment. So I think a lot of people are a bit confused about rapid antigen tests and PCR. Um, rapid antigen tests are less specific than PCR, which is still more reliable for confirming that you've got the virus in your body. Um, however, you know, there are time delays and costs associated with PCR because they need technically competent staff to um, take the samples and analyse them. And um, yeah, they do still where you need a very high level of certainty. Uh, but we're still waiting several days for results to come back from them because it's a lab-based test. Um, PCR does also detect um, RNA from the virus even after the infection's passed. Well, rapid antigen testing is less likely to continue to give you a false positive result after you're infected. So there's not really a one size fits all answer to testing methods. And um, I guess in terms of our own immune response, uh, we are seeing that people who have had Delta in the past are not necessarily getting strong protection against Omicron. Um, so we still would always be saying that vaccinations are really important. And even when we have got that response ourselves, it's still very important that people continue to follow the recommended vaccination programs. Thank you. Yes, it is important to follow the guidelines. And 
I've noticed that with the emergence of this pandemic, there's been so many technological advances in med tech, which is actually making it um, better for the um, identification of other viruses and other ailments. For example, STDs are a bit of a hidden pandemic across many mm. global geographies. And these sort of testing kits can be used. These rapid testing kits can now be used for things like sexually transmittable diseases as well. So it's one good thing that's come out of um, quite a severe situation. And as we start to wind up the discussion now, thank you again for your insights today. It's really been valuable. And we've noticed that people's experience with COVID has been so varied from some people, you know, experiencing the extreme and other people having a very mild um, case of infection. Even asymmet sorry, asymptomatic COVID and long COVID are quite baffling phenomena. Can some people, in your opinion, be more susceptible to COVID over others? I understand you're not medical experts, but do you have any insight to share on this? Yeah, you know, Sage, this is, um, it really is complicated. And again, I'm not a medical professional, nor am I an epidemiologist. However, it is well known that some people are more vulnerable than others due to compromised immune systems, age or health background and susceptibility. So nonetheless, there's a number of individuals that seem affected by long COVID lasting more than 35 weeks, and it's being reported as a leading, as leading to a wide range of mental health and physical health issues. So research suggests that long COVID is often, but not always associated with more severe infection, and certain individuals may be more prone to it. It's, it is likely too early in the Omicron wave to really know whether this strain will lead to a greater or less uh, cases of long COVID than earlier variants, but um, certain health conditions do seem to make people more vulnerable to severe infection, and those individuals must assess their risk of exposure and help mitigate that exposure through various measures to help keep themselves safe. Um, this is in part why IVAC uh, worked closely with the American Industrial Hygiene Association to cre create a pledge program called Commit to Care. And we really encourage folks to join us in taking this pledge to help reduce the risk of exposure and keep each other safe. I think Claire has additional comments around um, long COVID as well. Hi, Claire. Would you like to share your comments now about long COVID? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that COVID seems to have lasted a very long time um, from that perspective as well. Um, but in terms of a disease, it's still fairly new. And of course, Omicron is very recent. So as yet, we have really no feel for whether we are going to see um, high numbers of long COVID cases um, arising from Omicron. And, and again, we don't know whether if somebody gets reinfected, having caught Delta or even reinfected more than once with Omicron, how that will impact us. So I think the thing with it is, is that it's a new virus still, and it's defining its own timeline. And it's kind of superimposing that over our attempts to stop it, which is why things keep changing in governments and all their guidelines keep altering. So I think there's certainly a very strong case for more research being conducted into long COVID. And I think we're seeing significant, from what I've seen in the literature, again, I'm not a medical expert, but we're certainly seeing, certainly seeing significant impacts on mental health as well as physical health from long COVID. And I think it is definitely taking a toll. Um, but again, unfortunately, we're still learning as we go. Um, and I think there's an awful lot more work ahead of us. And that's, I guess, why IBEC exists, is to bring those experts together and get them to speak to each other so that we can Thank you so much for your time today. It must be such a challenge to find the right patients to run the tests and find the data and evidence to be able to uh, complete the studies that are required and, and your work is so valuable and appreciated. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks.
And if you've just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion on a very difficult subject today. And if you'd like to watch the full interview with Ms Jane Morrow, President and Ms Claire Bird, the Executive Strategy at IBEC, the Integrated Bioscience and Built Environment Consortium, please head to Calkine Media's YouTube channel to check it out or revisit it. And please keep watching Calkine Media for more live expert talks and market updates. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calkine TV. Could DeFi impact the global economy? An interesting thought, right? Well, let's find out more in this video. Please subscribe to the channel, I'm Sage for Calkine Media. The world went through a financial crisis in 2008 and is currently dealing with the corona epidemic, both of which have put world's financial systems to the test. Decentralised finance has managed to flourish despite many earth-shattering events. DeFi was invented in 2018 by a group of Ethereum creators and entrepreneurs eager to liberate finance applications from existing infrastructure. And DeFi's blockchain-based technology turned out to be a lifesaver for many in these trying times, challenging the existing financial ecosystem. So how is DeFi revolutionizing the financial economy at the macro level? Decentralized finance is built on the peer-to-peer -peer principle which removes the need for middlemen in the system. And DeFi democratizes finance. They're replacing traditional centralized institutions like non-banking, financial companies, brokerages, and banks by relying on self-executing smart contracts on the blockchain network and peer-to-peer -peer philosophies. Smart contracts govern the transactions, which are almost instantaneous and nearly free. In addition, other financial organizations and banks impose fees for using their services, but DeFi eliminates them. And rather than keeping money at a bank, it is possible to retain it in a secure digital wallet. And anyone with an internet connection will be able to use it without the requirement for approval and funds will be transferred within seconds. DeFi aspires to establish a more fundamentally functional financial landscape powered by blockchain technology. Before stepping into the future, it's important to know how DeFi platforms in 2020 and 2021 worked. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic, among other factors, played a major role in the emergence of DeFi. Due to the severe financial conditions of millions of people around the world, many people were looking for other ways of making money. DeFi meets most consumer concerns in several ways, and moreover, DeFi does not require huge cash to get started and has very low entry criteria. Blockchain and smart contracts make it possible to retain a high level of secrecy while doing transactions and there's less danger of being misled. So in 2021, more people were getting into the digital asset sector due to the growing popularity of cryptocurrencies and blockchains. And on its road to becoming the next big thing in finance, DeFi is at a critical juncture and it must develop to suit its expansion and the demand of the outside world. What's next? The potential of DeFi is enormous. Given DeFi has very low entry criteria, it might enable the unbanked to participate in the economy, lower the cost of doing business, as well as open new investment opportunities for people worldwide. 
And if you do like this information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel. If you press that bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos by Kalkine. But for more articles like this, there's a website. It's kalkinemedia.com. And I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Hi there, Rose Jacobs here with you for Kalkine Media. Today we're exploring why businesses are moving out of Myanmar. Before we dive in, make sure you hit that bell icon at the bottom of your screen for all the latest updates. Since Feb of 21, a lot has been happening in Myanmar as the world collectively fights the COVID-19 pandemic. This third world country has another life-threatening war going on. Last year in February, the military took over the country, causing civil, economic and political unrest. The military junta took over Myanmar in Feb of 2021. And this political, economic and civil disruption is likely to be continued for years. The world power and international organizations are against this military takeover. Therefore, Myanmar is isolated amid the pandemic. The organized rival government, the National Unity Government, is fighting against the military and thankfully, it has the full support of the other ASEAN and Western countries. The business environment is at risk in Myanmar. The US has passed an act that legitimizes and supports NUG and stands against the military rule and the businesses running under it. Thus, the businesses functioning under military rule are now at risk. Additionally, international communities would impose penalties on businesses dealing with the military. There is a high propensity that the conflict will escalate in the coming months. So businesses are becoming more and more hesitant about continuing their services in the country. Now let's take a glance at Myanmar's economic monitor for January 2022 released by the World Bank. The World Bank released the Myanmar economic monitor report on 25th of January. The report summarizes that the civilians of Myanmar are being severely tested by the ongoing pandemic and the military takeover. The report projects growth of 1% in Myanmar in the current year till September of 2022. Additionally, the economy will continue to contract about 30% smaller than it would have been without the pandemic and the military clash. Sectors like finance, electricity, logistics and digital connections face significant issues. The country is also undergoing foreign exchange constraints. Conflicts are escalating in Myanmar, firstly because of humanitarian constraints and secondly because of a fall in economic activities. The supply and demand chain in the country is severely disrupted. However, output and employment seems to have stabilised in recent months. So the conclusion for now? Because of these problems, most firms in the country have gone through significant losses, mostly facing a financial crunch and cash flow shortages. Because of disruptions in the economic activities, businesses are moving out of Myanmar, which poses weak growth prospects for the country. So do continue to watch this space, but that's a wrap for now. Be sure to check out the website for more, kalkinemedia.com, and make sure that you do like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thank you again for joining me.
Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Wonderland scandal is rocking the crypto world right now. But who is Michael Patron and what's he accused of? Hey, thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields here reporting for Calcoin Media. For those out of the loop, Michael Patron is the chief financial officer behind the DeFi project Wonderland. Patron also happens to be the co-founder of the notorious Canadian crypto exchange Quadratica CX. And he, along with the founder Gerald Cotton, left many investors penniless after scamming them out of 190 million US dollars. The impact of this revelation was felt almost immediately as the Wonderland crypto, which is governed by its native token, Time, plummeted 33.71%. Twitter user Zach XBT shared a screenshot of the conversation between himself and Daniel Sestagali, the founder of Wonderland, discussing the identity of the mysterious Twitter user Ox Sifu, who was eventually revealed to be patron. Although Sestagali hinted that the allegations against Ox Sifu will circulate, and an individual's past doesn't necessarily determine his future. However, in a later statement, Sestagali pretty much confirmed it was true stating he felt that it would be right for Patreon to step down from his position as treasurer till a confirmation vote. The Wonderland's CFO's departure could all depend on how many votes he can garner to be reinstated into the team. Although the vote ended on the 29th of Jan, however, it's believed that Patreon has already prepared to leave the project. Informing the community about it on Wonderland's Discord channel, Patreon said he's not confident that the vote will pass and is heartbroken over leaving the Wonderland project. Although more disturbing still, prior to both Wonderland and Quadratica CX, he was also sentenced to 18 months in a US prison in connection with a case of identity theft via bank and credit card fraud in 2005 when he was just 22. He later pleaded guilty to separate charges of burglary and computer fraud. So all in all, the revelation has severely dented the investors' confidence in Wonderland which is visible with its massive decline in value. The coming few weeks will be critical for how this DeFi project is attempting to revive investor confidence to regain lost momentum. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge-watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no-buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. A teenager tracking Elon Musk's private jet has asked him for $50,000 to stop. Well, let's take a closer look. I'm Rachel Jones and this is Calkine Media. A 19-year-old student and aviation enthusiast from Florida in the US has caused a star with Tesla billionaire Elon Musk around the existence of a Twitter bot whose purpose it is to track Musk's Gulfstream private jet and post real-time updates of its location. Jack Sweeney is the creator of the bot at ElonJet, and it seems Musk is not too happy about it. After discovering the existence of the bot, Musk direct messaged Sweeney asking him 
to take the bot down as it poses a security risk to him. As the SpaceX founder put it, I don't love the idea of being shot by a nutcase. Following some back and forth between Musk and Sweeney, Musk offered the teenager $5,000 to take the bot down, to which Sweeney made a counter offer. He replied back, any chance to up that to 50K? It would be great supporting college and would possibly allow me to get a car, maybe even a Tesla Model 3. Now, Musk ultimately turned the offer down, saying he felt uneasy about paying to shut down a bot, which he sees as a threat to his security. Sweeney later released the private conversation through Twitter's direct message service to the public in the hope it would pull Musk back to reconsider the offer. Sweeney added that he'd worked hard on the project and that $5,000 was not sufficient compensation for the time and effort he'd put into the project. The Florida student later offered to delete the account if Musk gave him an internship at one of his companies. The eccentric billionaire and innovator is yet to respond. Now, if you like this video, you can like, share and comment on it. And you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for now. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Hi there, I'm Rose Jacobs here with you for Calkine Media. Now, before we dive in, make sure you do hit that bell icon at the bottom of your screen for all the hottest updates. Christophe de Berkeleyer, a Belgian Member of Parliament, recently announced on his blog post that he would be receiving his 2022 salary in Bitcoin, therefore making him the first European politician to do so. Berkeleyer earns nearly 5,500 euros per month, which he would now draw in Bitcoin. He also said it isn't too late for Brussels and Belgium to lead the cryptocurrency industry. Belgium already has some great companies in the field, but needs to position themselves clearly and create a real ecosystem. Recently, many politicians and celebs announced their plan to take salaries in Bitcoin and other currencies. Let's take a look at some famous names that draw salaries in Bitcoins. Eric Adams. Last year in November, the New York Mayor Eric Adams announced that he would take his first three months of salary in Bitcoin to make New York the center of Bitcoin. Adams decided to take the first three paychecks in Bitcoin after his Twitter exchange with Miami Mayor Francis Suarez, who said that he would receive his coming salary in Bitcoin also. Aaron Rodgers, an American football quarterback, also announced that he would be taking a portion of his salary in Bitcoin. He believes Bitcoin has a very bright future. Rodgers has collaborated with the Cash app for this initiative. And Francis Suarez, in November, the mayor of Miami said that he would also accept his salary, which is almost US $100,000 per year in Bitcoin. Suarez also said that he could visualize the possibility of building a tech hub in Miami. He said that he thought it would send a message to the world that their government is one of the most innovative governments globally. So watch this space. And that's a wrap for now, but please check out the website for more, calkinemedia.com, and make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thank you for joining me. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements. 
with Calkine TV. Known in the crypto world simply as CZ, Zhang Peng Zhao is a Chinese Canadian business executive who has a net worth of $68 billion. Zhao is best known for co founding the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, Binance. So let's take a closer look. I'm Rachel Jones, and this is Calkine Media. The power of crypto and its undue influence on the world is not lost on people, it's changed so many lives. One of the great examples of crypto taking someone from rags to riches is of Shang Peng Zhao. Recently, the Bloomberg Billionaires Index revealed that the CEO of the cryptocurrency exchange platform Binance has a net worth close to 100 billion US dollars. He's currently the richest crypto entrepreneur in the world and also the wealthiest Canadian. He was born in China's Jingzhou province. His family moved to Vancouver in Canada when he was 12. He took many different jobs to help support his family, even working at McDonald's. He now ranks as the 11th wealthiest person in the world now, just a little behind familiar names such as Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. Binance was found in China and was later banished from the country. The platform routinely facilitates as much trading as the four biggest exchanges combined. However, it's not without its controversies as it faces regulatory probes globally. Its heavy success highlights the vast scope the unshackled cryptoverse provides people with, but controversy has surrounded the firm nonetheless. In a recent 24-hour span, the platform completed $170 billion worth of transactions. For slower days, there are around $40 billion transactions. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon for notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Calcai Media. Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. A very good morning to you and welcome to the Morning Outlook Report. I'm Rachel Jones reporting live from Calkine TV Sydney Studios. Now the Australian share market is expected to begin the week on a muted note. According to the latest SPY futures, the ASX 200 may open 41 points or 0.6 percent lower. At the closing bell on Friday, the S&P SX200 was 0.6% higher at 7,120. And over the past week, it closed 1.9% or 131 points higher.
The best performing sector on Friday was industrials. They were up 1.2%. The worst performing sector was communication services, down 0.01%. The best performing stock on Friday was Liontown Resources. Their shares closed 6.2% higher at $1.46. The worst performing stock was Seek. Their shares closed 3.8% lower at $28.31. Moving on to some news from this morning now and fiber cement maker James Hardy are reporting global net sales are up 22 percent to 900 million U.S. dollars for their third quarter. The company raised its annual profit forecast for the fourth time this fiscal year, driven by a massive boom in the housing sector in North America. Now, new home sales in the U.S. make up 70 percent of the company's revenue, and they rose every month of the December quarter. They're expecting to be robust, despite the prospect of potential higher mortgage rates driving up demand for building materials. And the Simic Group's UGL has been named by Snowy Hydro as the principal contractor for the construction of a 660 megawatt power generation plant at the Hunter Power Project in Curry Curry in New South Wales. The contract will generate revenue to UGL of $185 million dollars over the next two years. And the board of Magellan Financial Group has reported that now after a period of intense pressure and also focus on both his professional and personal life, Hamish Douglas, Magellan's chairman and chief investment officer, has requested a period of medical leave to prioritize his health. Chris McKay will oversee the portfolio management of Magellan's global equity retail funds and also global equity institutional mandates. Well, now it's time for a very short break, but stay tuned for more news set to affect your trading day. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. And welcome back to the Morning Outlook Report. Let's look to America now and on Wall Street, the Dow Jones fell 0.05%. The S&P 500 closed up 0.5% and the Nasdaq stormed 1.6% higher. And investors took cues from the upbeat labor data and also Amazon.com Inc.'s strong fourth quarter results. U.S. non-farm payrolls increased by 467,000 in January and that does suggest an improvement in the labor market. Labor Department's latest report on Friday also also showed that the U.S. economy added 709,000 more jobs in November and December. Now looking to Europe and the stock's 50 fell 1.3 percent. The FTSE declined 0.2 percent. CAC dipped 0.8 percent and the DAX ended 1.8 percent lower. Gold futures surged 0.21 percent to 1,807 U.S. dollars an ounce. The silver futures increased by 0.42 percent to $22.46 an ounce, while copper futures jumped 0.66 percent. Brent oil futures increased by 2.11 percent to $93.03 a barrel. WTI crude futures were up by 2.05 percent to $92.12. Well, that's all for our Morning Outlook report here on Calkine TV. Have a great day trading and stay tuned for more market updates and economic news live throughout the day. This is Rachel signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches 
to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calkine. Boarding pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Jaskarin Cambo. Now Jaskarin is the founder and president at Spend the Bits. Spend the Bits is a cryptocurrency payment mobile app powered by XRP Ledger, a decentralized open source platform. Now here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Good day to you, Jessica, and how are you today? Hi, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Great to chat to you. Very excited to hear more about what you're working with at the moment. So, first of all, if you could start with just telling me a little bit more about Spend the Bits and just detail to us what you do. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to start with my introduction. My name is Jasper Campbell, and I'm based out of uh, Edmonton, um, Alberta, Canada. I'm the CEO and founder at Spend the Bits. Uh, I've been working in the you know, IT space from uh, past 10 years now. Uh, I've been engaged in crypto space from past three years. While you know involved in the crypto space, uh, I realized that there is a significant gap uh, or problem, you might say, you know, in sending and saving Bitcoin payment transaction. So uh, you know, I searched online for any possible solution and realized there's a big gap in this area. So I started to explore, you know, what can be done to solve this problem. So I spent many months researching this solution while you know figuring out the pressure resolution. I looked at the Lightning Network, you know, and compared that with the XRP Ledger, and then uh, I came to the conclusion that you know XRP Ledger had much more, uh, you know, uh, superiority, uh, superior technology to offer, and that really gave birth to the Spend the Bits. Uh, you know, I started Spend the Bits with the vision to you know make Bitcoin and crypto everyday currency for a common user by utilizing the you know XRP Ledger technology. Well, it's definitely a very exciting space to be in. Um, although when it does come to cryptocurrency, obviously security is a huge factor. Now, how do you help to ensure that all transactions taking place at Spend the Bits are optimally secured? 
yeah ex excellent question uh, Rachel. so you know uh, every time uh, you know when user initiate a transaction from spend the bits app you know the transaction take place on the xrp ledger mainnet itself right and the xrp ledger uses proof of consensus mechanism to settle the transaction versus a proof of work or proof of stake which is you know uh, heavily dependent on the network uh, activities and the user you know secret keys are stored locally on their devices each time they you know perform that transaction within the app that makes it more secure to transact and to you know further add on to it you know we are a non custodial defi wallet that means you know we don't save your secret keys information in our database that that makes you know spend the bits a optimally secured platform now we've had a few strange years obviously with the pandemic but we have seen a lot of people turning to trading and cryptocurrency how do you believe that 2021 has influenced the course of cryptocurrency across the world yeah, I think uh, 2021 was a great year for cryptocurrency across the you know countries. As we saw many dynamics you know into the crypto ecosystem. Some of the major highlights were you know El Salvador made Bitcoin as a legal tender. You know uh, Facebook is now Meta, and then CBDs are a hot topic globally. Even in India announced you know launching their digital rupee in upcoming years. I think these these are you know these were the you know huge accomplishment and opportunity in the crypto ecosystem. And on that note, we'd love to know what your future predictions are for cryptos in 2022. Yeah, so over the you know last few months, we have seen a huge spike in demand for digital asset space. As we saw, you know, a lot of South American and Asian countries legalizing the cryptocurrencies, and many other current uh, countries have proposed this, you know, as a future prospect. And this will be, you know, absolute pleasure for us to bring all these people, uh, you know, into the uh, world of digital finance. So my prediction for crypto in 2022 to see uh, mainstream adoption for crypto and then see this ecosystem even expand further. And just lastly, we'd love to know what um, lies ahead in your near term pipeline at Spend the Bits. Yeah, so for Spend the Bits, you know, we are a P2P payment system right now. And then, uh, you know, our near future, we are planning to roll out the Spanish version of the app in El Salvador, which is next in our milestone. Uh, followed by the launching merchant portal apple uh, merchant portal app where user will be able to you know pay for goods and services using the stb app and merchant around the world will be able to accept cryptocurrency using the stb merchant portal well it's been very interesting chatting to you today jay thank you so much for your time thank you so much rachel for having me on the show thank you and have a good day and with that I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. It's likely Australians could be paying more for tap beer if a new tax increase is passed on to the drinker. From the 1st of February 2022, the Australian Tax Office increased the excise duty rate per litre of alcohol by a factor of 1.021 to keep up with inflation. The Australian Hotels Association, Clubs Australia and the Brewers Association have launched a national campaign to cut the twice yearly tax hike on draft beer, which comes into effect today. Australian tax office figures for draft beer sales in the first quarter, that's July to September of the 2021 to 2022 tax year, have shown the true devastating impact of the pandemic on Australia's hospitality sector. 
The figures show that pubs and clubs sold 40 million fewer pints of beer in July to September 2021 than they did for the same period in 2019, before the pandemic hit. That's a massive drop of over 50% in beer sales for struggling venues. After a horror year in 2020, where pubs and clubs lost over $1 billion in beer sales, Due to lockdowns and other restrictions, these latest figures from the ATO show that losses for 2021 could well exceed this. The ATO recorded 903,982 litres of alcohol as having been served in beers over the counter in July to September 2021, compared to 1,993,027 litres during the same period in 2019. Commenting on the analysis, Chief Executive of the Brewers Association of Australia, John Preston, is calling for the federal government to use the forthcoming federal budget to reduce Australia's fourth highest beer tax in the world to give pubs and clubs a fighting chance. He says they're very concerned that on the 1st of February, the Australian government will hit Australian beer drinkers with one of the biggest beer tax increases in more than a decade and that it's not right and it's not sustainable. Other countries are reducing their tax on draft beer to give pubs and beer drinkers a break. It's hoped the beer tax can be reduced to help reduce the suffering of the hospitality industry. Now, if you like this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Kalkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Hello and welcome to Expert Talks on Calcan TV. I'm your host, Rose Jacobs. This is a show where we meet experts and industry leaders from right across the globe to share their knowledge, advice and insights, helping you build your own success and businesses and investments. Today, we're looking at why airspace is going to be the big real estate trend of this decade. Australia is poised to admit large numbers of immigrants to kickstart the post-COVID economy. And this begs a very obvious question, where will all these people live? One answer might be to take advantage of a growing trend called airspace development. I'm pleased to introduce our guest today, Warren Livesey, founder of Buy Airspace and a strut out property development specialist. Warren, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Now, this is quite fascinating. Australia is poised, as, as we've said, to admit large numbers of immigrants, and this is kick-starting the post-COVID economy. So where do you propose all of these people could potentially live? Uh, well, there's two options. One, either within our existing um, infrastructure that we have at the present moment, or obviously stretching and, and making the, the city that much wider. So my main uh, suggestion to us is that we use the existing infrastructure being the um, the roof space above apartment buildings now of course we're talking about a roof space that may or may not already exist so can you talk us through uh first of all the growing real estate trend called airspace development what exactly does this entail well ultimately airspace is from where the building kind of finishes the roof space until where you permit it to go to with council regulations. So when you actually buy a, a plot of land, and maybe that is, um, you know, maybe 300 square meters, you actually own all that airspace from the ground all the way up until where council allow you to build. So that airspace is either built at the present moment, which you would obviously cap off, 
But what, what we're quite interested in is from the roof space up to the uh, additional uh, head space that you can actually build too. So would you say that there are many people um, currently living in their, in their place and they're unaware of the fact that, that they have some um, budding real estate sitting right there above their heads? Uh, Rosie, I'd say pretty much everyone I've really ever spoken to. Um, people do when they buy a top floor apartment, they uh, generally do so with the understanding that they may extend into the roof. Um, but this generally is kind of a small uh, attic space or, or um, a small addition to their existing property where we're actually suggesting putting a new uh, apartment or two up in that roof space. Um, because pre presently all the roof spaces, as, as you can well imagine, is this A-frame uh, type space that um, we, we actually don't need along the coast line of Australia because we don't get snow. We don't need the snow to kind of sit on the roof and then fall away. We can actually get away with flat roofs. Um, so yeah, so hopefully just using that idle space that's not being used to try and get more people into a closer proximity of schools, hospitals and police and the likes. It sounds like a bit of a no-brainer, really, when you think of it that way. Now, I'm curious as to how the council determines how much space can be accessed above buildings. Is that to do with not blocking out neighbours' views, or is there more to it than that? Uh, when council started to put down the various different zonings, the, most of the buildings were already built, uh, to be honest. So. You may be looking at a certain area which would be a low density area, uh, be it around the beach side, but you'll see a lot of apartment blocks being built. So they won't, if they were to knock them down and rebuild them, they wouldn't be able to do that. So what we're trying to do is just what they call using the existing space more efficiently um, and ultimately trying to put an additional apartment above in that space. So um, the main, the main um, point of this is really to um, use those particular area to house somebody else and then we can sell that particular space to an investor or the group of owners um, and then that amount of money can be used to fix up the building because majority of the buildings along the, the east and west coast um, of Australia are lacking funds. They just don't have any money in the sinking fund to fix up their buildings and they've been corroded away with the ocean and the likes. This is a way that we can actually then fund the, the sustainability upgrades to all these apartments that are so desperately in need of work. So there are really um, quite a few win-wins out of this scenario. I mean, strata owners can be gaining a huge amount of extra value and it's a benefit for the buildings as well. Absolutely. Look, uh, in um, Australia, it's possibly the, the largest housing sector we have is uh, within apartment blocks. They are insured up to about $1.1 to $1.2 trillion. That's with a T. Uh, and on estimates, uh, the unused space within apartment blocks ranges from about 10 to 15%. So there is a potential of, of recapping uh, between 110 to $150 billion worth of real estate that is presently just sitting there in idle. It's interesting that, uh, that there aren't more organisations or companies out there that have been onto this for, for some time already. Is it just a no-brainer for you? Uh, it's very common in Europe, uh, the US, the UK. Um, they literally put modular homes on top of roofs. It is quite um, a part. Uh, in the UK, they are automatically um, guaranteeing that people can go and go up another level. It just hasn't been needed in Australia. Australia has so much land and you have 28 million people in around. We've been able to fit in, uh, um, in amongst that, but when we start looking at growing the population by, you know, five, ten percent. Where are we going to be able to put these people? Um, as well as, you know, we have the hospitals and the schools and already set up in these particular areas. So if we are to stretch out the, 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 um, the town in order to facilitate for these new people, then we're going to have to build all those facilities as well, which is going to be very, very expensive. I've also um, heard that penthouses or very brand new top level apartments here can be typically a lot cheaper to build than to start from scratch with a new build. Is that right? Absolutely. The, the, the joys of the apartment blocks is that you've got the foundations already there. Um, your electricity, water and gas are already plugged in. So you are constructing up in the roof space is primarily wood and, and glazing glass work that can be done by predominantly um, uh, carpenters. 
So it's the cheapest form of construction um, and obviously the most affordable to reach for the maximum amount of, of uh, return because obviously up in the roof space you have a large amount of light and privacy and obviously um, uh, space for those issues. It really is a win-win and I guess as well, you know, any extra income that comes from building these new bills and the strata owners can then use the proceeds from the sale of these new spaces uh, to potentially pay for repairs or maintenance of the existing building. That's absolutely right. Um, really, it, it's where um, a lot of people along the, the coast, they've, they've, they've spent their last dollar trying to get into this property market, which is going absolutely through the roof, uh, pardon the pun, but um, you know they, they don't actually have the additional funds that are needed to fix a building. So this may be plumbing, fire upgrades, electrical, you know, outer skin starting to need be replacement and they sit there going, you know, am I going to have to sell this apartment in order to be able to fund this? And um, th this is just a, a, a method or a way to actually find the funds for the building in order for them to actually um, stay in their residence and obviously make some money because where a top floor apartment may be worth um, say two to three uh, million odd dollars once it's been built um, and most of that say two million of that can go back to the apartment owners and they can use a million dollars to fix up their building and make it more sustainable you know get us more off the grid but then obviously there's a million left over which can actually be divided equally amongst the owners uh, based on their unit entitlement and if that space is on their own personal name, as in they own their apartment, it's a, it's a tax-free. So it's not just a win-win where on one side, people see it as a huge expense of fixing the building. This is actually a way of making money and making their building more sustainable, which I think we need to do with climate change happening around the corner. Indeed, a very valid point there. I can't imagine why anyone would say no to such a proposal. So I'd like to know, you know, is, is it quite a difficult process for strata owners to gain the approval? Uh, what's involved in, in that process? Uh, it's, it, it's incredible. Uh, because you, you're looking at fractional ownership, uh, you know, so many people owning, everyone has their own financial goals, settings, uh, your neighbor's possibly not the first person you would consider going uh, into a financial relationship with. Um, but in, in saying all that, you know, we are all uh, apartment blocks are having this 10 year kind of um, what they call capital works plan of how they're going to fund fixing their building. Um, and a lot of them are at a loss of how they're going to do it. They ultimately are either increasing their quarterly um, levies or they do a, uh, a once off payment that ultimately getting funds into the strata from the owners to then fix it up. So what we're trying to do is, is that the, the, the process kind of generally falls over with the owners doing it themselves because there's so many approval stages. So the, the suggestion that I have after doing 75 developments and spe speaking to over a thousand apartments is, is to try and, and um, get the, um, the owners out of the decision-making process sooner than later. And the fact that if they are comfortable with selling that particular roof space for a million dollars or a million and a half, then the investor or the group of owners can then take that particular space and design it accordingly uh, without it through all the various levels of uh, approvals, which generally stop and, and get everyone into this death roll, sadly. It sounds like it's quite vital to have somebody like you involved in that process, that's for sure. So if people are actually interested in finding out more about this, um, what's the best way for people to learn more? Uh, I have general inf uh, information on my website, uh, buyerspace.com.au. Um, and of course, just getting um, calling me and getting some general information, um, because it is an amazing opportunity that I honestly think can help us you know, not only um, help those particular owners that don't have the additional funds, but also this huge need to make buildings sustainable. So reusing the, the rainwater and, and solar power to, to, to um, charge batteries that you, you know, ultimately use for the building consumption. So everything that can get us off the grid and make us more uh, climate uh, efficient in regards to intelligent lighting and windows and airflow um, is just what we're going to have to be thinking of doing because every degree or two degrees uh, change here in the coast, it changes five, six, seven degrees uh, in the inland. So certain areas are going to be uninhabitable in the next 15 to 20 odd years, potentially, if nothing's done at the present moment. 
Well, it, sounds like, it certainly sounds like it's a very exciting time in terms of uh, real estate and, and where we're going over the next decade or so. And it certainly sounds like you're the man for the job. Warren Livesey, founder of Buy Airspace and Strata Development Specialist, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank you, Rosie. appreciate the opportunity. And that's it for Expert Talks for today, but stay tuned for plenty more content coming your way. And in the meantime, as we say here, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine TV. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thanks for joining us. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Joe Foster. Now Joe is the CEO of Close the Loop. Close the Loop is the first company to list on the ASX that provides full circular economy solutions. That's from design, manufacture, collection and reuse or recycling. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Good to speak with you today. Now, you. Close the Loop is one of over 150 companies to IPO on the ASX this year, but it's one of only a handful of ASX companies in the sustainable packaging space. Now you did raise $12 million at 20 cents per share and closed 50% higher on your first day. So how That's was right. the IPO experience for Close the Loop? Oh, very exciting, Rachel. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly the first few days uh, showed a lot of progress, uh, a lot of interest in our business. Um, the nice thing about it is that people really want to engage with Close the Loop Group because we do offer the full end-to-end -end solution within the circular economy. And the nice thing about it is that really it's uh, the, the message we're putting out there is really about merging two individual companies together. One is Close the Loop and the other one is OF Packaging, uh, which really then allows us to be fully integrated within the circular economy. Now, where do you intend for the funds to be utilised? Yes, in fact, uh, what we've already done since we raised the funds last week is that uh, we purchased a, a company, a specialised packaging company within the seafood industry that actually happened uh, within the last few days. These, this company specialises within the seafood side of it, uh, based in North Queensland. And uh, that's number one. Number two is that we are looking at setting up a, a dedicated washing and separating facility to concentrate particularly on e-waste. And we see a great opportunity here in Australia to actually uh, separate uh, metals and plastics from e-waste, uh, break it down and then supply that plastic back to the OEMs, which is really the original equipment manufacturers, which will allow them to turn this plastic back into cartridges or back into mainstream electronic products again. Sounds fascinating. Now, yes, you mentioned their sustainable packaging company, OF Packaging. What can you tell our viewers about OF and their relationship with Close the Loop? Yes, in fact, OF Packaging engaged with Close the Loop quite some time ago, looking to try and find a solution within the circular economy. As you may know, Rachel, in Australia currently, there's not really an option for curbside recycling of soft plastics. Uh, OF Packaging have been very innovative in the way they've found solutions to actually get soft plastic, soft flexible packaging pa plastic material into a curbside recycling option. Working alongside with Close the Loop, we're looking to try and find what we believe is really the holy grail of packaging to packaging, which will allow us to try and get packaging back into the circular economy again. And obviously now people do have a greater awareness of the environmental damage caused by landfill waste. How does this growth in awareness help close the loop? Well, I think it helps us quite a lot because first of all, we uh, were, were pretty much 
involved in industry, educating industry to try and uh, try and get the consumer to understand what solutions are out there. You're probably aware the, the targets that have been set by the Australian government, certainly in line with APCO, that all packaging must be recyclable, reusable or compostable by 2025. And in fact, uh, all packaging should be actually containing over 50% recycled content. So we're saying that as a group, Closed Loop Group, uh, which is the two companies, we believe that we can be a pretty strong mouthpiece in the marketplace and try and drive that change forward. I think change has got to be driven by industries and companies like ourselves, rather than waiting for the actual industry to change. We want to actually try and drive the change from our side, Rachel. And Joe, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about the acquisition of the Queensland-based seafood packaging group, Oceanic Agencies? What can you tell me about the importance of that acquisition? Uh, well, thank you, Rachel. Yes, we actually identified this company about six or seven months ago. We thought that this business would fit right into the existing OF packaging business. OF packaging supplies uh, soft, flexible packaging to a number of, of markets in, in Australia and around the world, in fact. And seafood packaging is, is our number two or number three market, not just here in Australia, but around the world. So we see this strategic alliance between Oceanic Agency and, and OF, OF packaging, which will allow us to actually deliver a bigger, uh, a, a bigger arrangement of packaging to the specialized seafood industry. Oceanic Agency have actually been specializing in that area for quite some time, particularly with, with uh, local uh, aquaculture seafood products, which is very uh, prominent in North Queensland. It definitely sounds like a very good marriage you have there. Now, mm -hmm. lastly, Joe, what is a Close the Loop strategy going forward in the future? Well, Close the Loop is, um, is looking to try and expand their base in terms of working with what we believe is complex uh, consumable products. Close the Loop have got a very good interesting system in place whereby they've got over 260,000 collection sites, not just here in Australia, but in America and Europe. And we want to leverage against the existing infrastructure and work with our customers on specialized take back programs for difficult to recycle consumable products. Not just the flexible packaging materials that we make here at OF Packaging, but also look at looking at other products like cosmetics, glasses, mobile phone covers, power tools, e-waste and so forth. We want to become the leaders in that market where other, other companies are not willing to look at recycling these products. We actually want to take these challenges on and put them through our, our existing infrastructure and be really the leaders in that area. And as I said, we do see, we do see ourselves really as the most advanced uh, in this particular space here in Australia and particularly listed on the ASX. So it's been a great journey and it's very exciting to say the least, you know. And lots more to come, no doubt. Well, it's been great Absolutely. to chat with you today, Joe. Congratulations on your IPO and your recent acquisition. And with that, I will sign off. Thank you, Rachel, very much. Thank you very much. But watch Thank the you. space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV.
Welcome to Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Mr. Jonathan de Cateret, CEO of Bumper. And to give you some background, Bumper protects the value of their clients' crypto holdings using an innovative DeFi or decentralized finance protocol. So clients set the price they want to protect at, and if the market crashes, their assets will never fall below that price. Now importantly, if the market pumps, the asset rises too. Sounds very interesting, especially in the current market conditions that we're witnessing. So keep watching to find out more. Today's show should be very interesting. Bringing you live today, I'm excited to have Mr. Jonathan de Cateré, CEO of Bumper, a dynamic and entrepreneurial business leader. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Hi, Sage. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for making time to join us today, Jonathan. With your significant expertise in driving fast growth digital disruptor brands, we're keen to share your insights on the show today. So DeFi, Jonathan, has been expanding rapidly. Could you share your take on the evolution and development of the DeFi market? And in your opinion, which DeFi protocols are going to have a significant impact on the future of finance in the coming months, please? Yes, of course. Well, I think for some of your listeners out there who aren't familiar with DeFi, it stands for decentralized finance. Now, if you consider that uh, Bitcoin was created nearly uh, in 2008, so we're well over a decade there. Now, just imagine how quickly technology um, rapidly moves on in, in 10 years. And DeFi is really the cutting edge of where cryptocurrency, blockchain and Austrian economics really collide to produce a really brand new financial system. Now, to kind of put that into context, when we first, first started looking at DeFi back in 2017, it was worth uh, about 15 million USD. We are now within that, that, that space of time up to nearly quarter of a trillion dollars locked in DeFi protocols. And I think what, what your uh, listeners probably need to, to kind of really understand is what DeFi really represents is a total change of the underlying plumbing of how finance can work. It's digitally native, it's programmable, it has low latency, it has high frequency. It means money can fly around the ecosystem um, freely and at pace. And that gives rise to all types of financial instruments and structured products that we've never even conceived of in traditional finance. And to, to give you an example of that, what DeFi allows you to do is to take a stable coin, say USD, C, which is pegged to the US dollar, so it's not volatile. And you can use a service that will deposit that into a savings account. And that digital dollar that you have will start accruing interest, but it will be constantly scanning around for other savings accounts that are offering improved interest rates. And if one of them comes online, it will instantly move itself across. And it may do that a few hundred times a day. And so what we are really seeing is um, for the first time is what happens when you make money digitally digital what happens when you can make it programmable and what's the next kind of epoch that we believe is going to happen is that central banks will start to release their own digital currencies we know that china is leading the furor there with the digital yuan um, we are quite certain that other countries will um, follow close behind and what that will lead to is all that um, that digital money and traditional finance will then just be sucked in to DeFi because it is just quite frankly just more efficient and optimized and a better system um, to manage the econo the uh, the financial global economic systems. Sounds great. Uh, thank you so much for putting that in a nutshell for us. And theoretically, um, it does sound fantastic, and it's finding the utility for this type of system and, and how it can work across industries, I think that's going to be really exciting and the next few years should really prove to be a window of opportunity for many businesses. So thanks Jonathan for that uh, insight. Now the year 2022 will observe the emergence of regulated DeFi is what we're noticing. So what exactly is it and how will it impact the current flow of the crypto world in your opinion please? Mm. Regulation and DeFi do not go hand in hand very well. Um, but the reason why DeFi works really well is because it is permissionless, which means um, that anybody can have a digital wallet and start interacting 
with it. And, and it's that property of DeFi that allows that high velocity, low latency property that I, I, I kind of mentioned earlier, which is the kind of key property that allows the whole thing to, to kind of operate um, so efficiently. And, and where FATF, which is the global regulatory body that advises other uh, individual country regulators, they have recent gui- released some guidelines uh, a few weeks ago. But reading between the lines, you can tell that it, they are finding it extremely difficult on how to regulate um, these individual protocols. And I'll give you, for instance, um, there are protocols out there which um, are launched by founders. Some of those founders are anonymous, so all you will have is a, a Twitter tag. Those protocols then um, see success. They grow their TVLs, which is the, the amount of money that's locked into the protocol, into the billions of dollars. And they then move across to something called a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. And a DAO is really a community run protocol. So there's no longer a board of directors, there is no entity, there is no country, it is domiciled in. And that makes it virtually impossible for regulators to make those protocols accountable and to essentially kind of use their their regulatory tools and instruments that they would normally um, dispatch. So we feel that really that where regulators are starting to kind of concentrate on is how can they regulate the um, the money that's flowing in to crypto. So that gateway between what we call fiat, which is like just your normal dollar or yen or sterling, and when that is then transferred into cryptocurrency, that is where the regulation is coalescing because there there can be um, you know, your customer checks and anti-money laundering checks. But once it's actually within DeFi, um, we are at a bit of a loss about how regulators can meaningfully regulate that in a way that you know stops nefarious actors from participating. Exactly, exactly. I think that's what the, the regulators really have at the forefront of their minds, how they can protect the consumers. Um, thank you for your insights on, on DeFi regulations. So how was the impact of the pandemic and the emergence of new variants in particular um, affecting the crypto market? Interestingly, remote work seems to work uh, well with crypto businesses and DAOs, which is the way we seem to be evolving. Um, Also, how do tools like your bumper help in such drastic scenarios like we're seeing at the moment? Mm. Well, the pandemic, you know, you can kind of look back now and see a little bit of hindsight of, you know, what the the consequences were. I think the first thing was that by, by its very nature, by its very design, cryptocurrency is distributed right it's like a kind of um, an underlying principle of cryptocurrency so there's no single point of failure and and, and as a company a cryptocurrency that's been operating um you know for before the pandemic it, it did not affect us in any way because our, our workforce do work remotely they are globalized um, we have all the tools and um software mechanisms that, are, that allow those people to you know work wherever they are so that there was there was there was very little disruptive impact in terms of you know compared to more centralized financial and and other companies around the world the second point i think is that the pandemic really um obviously forced money printing around the world by central banks to rapidly increase i think people were then stuck at home thinking about what to do with extra income that was coming in or house prices that were going up and stocks and shares that were increasing. And crypto really found a niche there within retail. And I think for the first time, it, it truly became mass market. I don't think anybody can kind of um, um, dissuade that viewpoint now. And, and I think what, what that really also did then is there was, it kind of led to a huge influx of finance, which came into crypto. and there was already a hardcore of what I would consider some of the smartest people I've ever encountered in my life already working in crypto who were then given um, the financial clout to really make good on their ideas. And what we've seen is the emergence of um, an absolute revolution in finance. And there are protocols that are emerging every day that are really pushing the envelope of what finance can do. So 
um, what we're seeing is the emergence of what we call like the FANG of DeFi protocols. Um, so these are the, the they're traditionally um, companies like Compound and Aave and Maker, which are all lending and borrowing sites, but they're just pieces of software. There are no buildings, there are no, you know, very little employees. These co companies or entities typically have in the region of between 10 and 15 billion dollars locked inside them. We've seen the emergence of new types of chains that can compete with Ethereum, that are cheaper, that are faster, that are more easily accessible. Um, and you know something like Near Protocol, I think, is one to kind of keep an eye on at the moment. I know a lot of developers are really super um, excited about that. And we're seeing the emergence of, of really clever protocols like Olympus DAO, which is becoming the Federal Reserve of liquidity for DeFi protocols. So I suppose the impact really of the pandemic was one that led to negligible levels of disruption, huge influxes of cash and talent that has now resulted in what we're kind of seeing as a, as a revolution in finance. Thank you so much for those tips there. Yes, new protocol, Olympus DAO, definitely ones that prick your ears up. Now, your own innovation, Bumper, sounds like a godsend, especially in times like this when there's high volatility in price. And price volatility is um, undoubtedly a hurdle with cryptos. So, in your opinion, how does Bumper fit into the whole infrastructure of these DeFi um, competitors? Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Is it a liquidity pool? In part, yes. Yeah, I think just to kind of just take a step back for a moment. Um, in traditional finance, when you consider the, the range of instruments that you can use to, to kind of protect yourself from volatility, it, it really only comes down to two tools. One is a stop loss, right, which will just kind of trade you out if the market drops at a certain point that you dictate. And that's kind of like a circuit breaker. It means if the market pumps back up again, we, you've lost out on that subsequent pump. A more sophisticated tool is an options desk, which is used widely by traditional finance. Now, let's put an options desk into context. It was developed 50 years ago. So we're talking about a 50 year old piece of technology that is still being brought out today to protect against volatility. And it is complex. And they have these fixed expiry windows and uh, contracts, and, and they are really inflexible as a mechanism. Now, what we did at Bumper was to look at all the innovation that's happening in DeFi and to really ask the question, can that solve the holy grail problem of volatility? And um, Bumper takes uh, just a radically innovative approach. And to give you a, a very top level view of how that kind of works is that, let's say you own a Bitcoin and you saw Bitcoin go up to its all time high a few months ago, which was about, I think about 69,000 USD. And let's say at that point you had the thesis, well, I think it's going to come down. I think it's, it's a bit it's a bit frothy. So let's say you protected the price of your Bitcoin at say 65,000 USD. If you then use Bumper to protect that, as the price comes down and hits that $65,000 mark, Bumper would essentially swap you into a stable coin. So that means if the price goes down, your price, your asset is, is, is kind of preserved at $65,000. But it also means if the price pumps back up again, we swap you back into Bitcoin so that if the price surges, you get all that benefit. Now, that approach gives you both benefits. It protects you from the downside, but it also allows you to benefit from any subsequent pump. Now, that's a, an oversimplified version of how Bumper works because that, that, that simplified version just doesn't work in reality because of something called slippage. Um, and, and at the heart of Bumper, is we developed a near zero slippage engine that allows us to give that same level of protection. And when, when we really conceived that notion, we then took it a step further. And when you protected your Bitcoin at $65,000, we then give you a fungible token, which we call bumpered Bitcoin. Now that's a kind of slightly magical Bitcoin because it's a Bitcoin that will go up in price but it will never go below $65,000. And you can use that to borrow um, other assets. You can use that leverage longs. Um, the, the, the array of use cases of where bumpered assets can be deployed in DeFi is something we've only just begun to understand, but it's, we think it's going to become a fundamental building block within the, uh, the DeFi ecosystem.
That's fantastic to hear. Um, thanks so much for sharing that. And uh, just wondering about your clients who are getting involved at the moment. Do you find that they are the true Austro-Libertarian economists who want to really make something out of this DeFi revolution that we're seeing? Or are they just your everyday folk, retail investors who are curious about what you do? Mm. There's, a, there's a real spread. I mean, the charge was led, I think, by um, the more kind of egalitarian retail market you know these are the early adopters these are the, the 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 people who were kind of on the edge of the tech who you kind of really kind of started to understand kind of bonded curves and where this whole technology could go um obviously as as as, as with anything that, that kind of reaches a critical mass that then started to get the attention of the the larger players in traditional finance you know the big institutions the banks the hedge funds and they have started to, um, to to pile in now. We can see finally that institutional money is now coming into crypto and it's particularly coming into DeFi because it kind of speaks their world of, of kind of yields and uh, ROI and APYs and APRs. And I think where where this will, where, where this will go, I think, is um, one of two ways, really. I think it will either be that DeFi will just eat traditional finance from the inside out, which is a thesis that I personally believe is where it will go. Or we will see the banks understanding that there is a threat and there's a risk to their current paradigm and they will buy their way in to DeFi protocols or indeed set up their own versions of it, which again, could, could, could kind of, you can kind of understand how that could kind of lead to them kind of becoming very prominent in the space. It sounds like there's going to be many opportunities opening up and it's interesting to see how crypto uh, infrastructure is actually influencing people's behaviour and it seems to be more inclusive uh, rather than exclusive as how traditional fiat and the finance world can be mm. at times and I, I like the expansive thinking that seems to surround and the ideation that's involved with the crypto native businesses that we're seeing at the moment. So very interesting discussion. Thank you so much for sharing your, your insights with us today, Jonathan. Pleasure. Good to see you. Enjoy your day. And if you just joined us, we had a great show. Mr. Jonathan Descartes featured today, the CEO of Bumper, an innovative crypto business on Expert Talks. Please check out the full interview on YouTube via Calkine Media. And keep watching for more Expert Talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and this is Calkine's Breaking Business News. Now, the board of Magellan Financial Group reports that after a period of intense pressure and focus on his personal and professional life, Hamish Douglas, Magellan's chairman and chief investment officer, has requested a period of medical leave to prioritize his health. Hamish McLennan, previously Magellan's deputy chairman, has been appointed as Magellan's independent non-executive chairman in place of Mr. Douglas. He says the board wholeheartedly supports Hamish's decision to prioritize his health and Magellan is committed to providing him the time and support he requires. Robert Fraser has been appointed as Deputy Chairman of Magellan in place of Mr. McLennan. Mr. Fraser will continue as the independent non-executive chairman of Magellan Asset Management. That's Magellan's responsible entity and main operating subsidiary. Chris McKay will oversee the portfolio management of Magellan's global equity retail funds and global equity institutional mandates. Mr. McKay was Magellan's inaugural chairman and Magellan's chief investment officer from inception in 2006 to 2012. He co-founded Magellan and continues as a managing director and portfolio manager of the ASX-listed MFF Capital Investments. Now, MFF shares offices with Magellan and Mr. McKay has a long-standing and constructive working relationship with Magellan's investment and support teams, which provide administrative business support and research services to MMF. Now, over the last few months, Hamish McDouglas, sorry, Hamish Douglas has confirmed a split from his wife. He's dealt with the abrupt departure of Magellan's CEO, Brett Cairns. 
and overseen a dip in Magellan's share price and also the loss of a $23 billion institutional mandate. Kalkine wishes him the best. Now stay tuned to Kalkine for all the business news that matters. I'm Rachel signing off for now. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. is Kadena blockchain and KDA crypto price prediction. Multiple blockchain networks were competing in 2021 to help developers build decentralized apps. The competition may further heat up in 2022. Solana emerged as the most significant rival to Ethereum last year, making Solana sole crypto one of the best performing assets. While Cardano, Polkadot and other high market cap blockchain networks usually make the news headlines, it's time to look beyond that. And one blockchain network, Cardena is claiming to be like no other. Let's find out more about this protocol. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Kalkai Media. So what is Cardena? Well, Cadena allows developers to build smart contracts and other blockchain-based solutions like NFTs. They launched the platform in 2016, claiming to provide virtually free transactions. Cadena boasts of its clever contract language, Pact, which it claims can weed out bugs. Developers can use Pact in their early blockchain projects as the language is easy to adopt. Cardena Crypto. Cardena has the native KDA crypto acting as the native token and KDA does for Cardena blockchain what Ether does for Ethereum's network. Users must pay their transaction fees in KDA token, the total supply of which is fixed at 1 billion. Cardena claims that they would mine KDA tokens over 120 years. KDA Crypto's price. KDA has a high market cap of nearly 930 million US dollars, which makes it one of the top 100 cryptos by market cap. The price of the KDA token is approximately $5.50 after having plunged over 10%. KDA's crypto price prediction. Solana, a major Ethereum rival, rose substantially in 2021 and developers are using the network to build dApps. If Kadena's blockchain can show similar promise, KDA crypto may have a fair chance to rise in the near to medium term. Kadena crypto's experienced a sharp rally in November 2021, along with many other cryptos on the market, and the price peaked at almost 25 US dollars. In 2022, so far, Kadena has continuously lost value the price might enter a double digit trajectory by the end of the first quarter, but for a sustained rally, the Kadena blockchain will have to be adopted by more developers. The bottom line, Ethereum's dominance in blockchain and as the leading provider of dApp services is under threat. Like Ethereum, all other networks have a native token used for fee payment. It is claimed that the gas fees in Ethereum is relatively high and Kadena is one of the networks claiming to be very affordable in comparison. KDA's coin has usage within Kadena and the price movement will essentially be a product of demand. If you like this information, please let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel. If you do press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos by Kalkine. For more articles like this, please head to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. 
whether it's about market movements or the currency graph, sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. What is a Titano Crypto? Well, recently the price of Titano, that's T-I-T-A-N-O, cryptocurrency surged about 8% and was trading at US $0.1298 per token. The surge in price could be due to the announcement on Twitter that the combined value for winners of Titano, P-L-A-Y, was US $96,529.68. Notably, this amount will be distributed among 10 winners and the prize value would then be 19,652 and 96 cents. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Let's find out more. So what is Titano cryptocurrency? Titano Finance is a decentralized finance protocol and claims to have the potential to lead a revolution in the DeFi space. The network's white paper suggests that its Titano auto staking protocol makes staking easier and allows Titano crypto holders to get high stable returns. Titano mentioned in its white paper that TAP or TAP gives automatic staking and compounding features to the Titano token. The Titano crypto is a BEP20 token and is a native cryptocurrency of Titano Finance. It has an elastic supply and rewards its holders with a positive rebase formula. Due to the rebase formula, Titano Finance can create auto staking and auto compounding tokens. Price performance. DeFi is becoming increasingly popular and is expected to lead a revolution in the finance industry. Titano Finance is a developer of DeFi 2.0 protocols and in December 2021 it had launched the Titano staking token. As of December there were 4,500 Titano holders last year and the protocol recorded 38,000 transfers. Titano Finance launched Titano PLAY or PLAY, a tap based project that allows more rewards awards and different use cases. So back on January the 8th, the Titano crypto had clocked an all-time high of US $0.2122 per token and it has a total supply of 835.2 Titano tokens. Meanwhile, Titano crypto had a circulating supply of 430.4 million tokens. Thanks for joining us in the report and if you do like the info, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel and press that bell icon. You'll be notified of the latest videos by Calkine. For more articles like this, there is a website. It's calkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks exclusive to Kalkine TV. In this episode, I'll be shining a light on Pledger Giving. Pledger is a social impact platform that allows for e-commerce brands to fundraise for charities and to talk us through how it all works, Weston McIntosh, the CMO of Pledger, joins me live now. Weston, great to have you here with us on Kalkine. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Now, great to have you here, Weston. First and foremost, how exactly does Pledger work? Um, so what we are is we are a social impact as a service tool. So there's a thing called social impact. Basically what it is is trying to make a difference in your community. So this is up to you. It can be your household, your local town, your city, or the world. So what we do is we try and help online retailers take the community they choose, make them. So this can be environmental, like trees, or plastic, or it can be helping clean us off the streets, really get to choose what yeah, wonderful. Now, there's obviously things as well, such as GoFundMe, Donor, Crowdfunder. How does Pledger differ from those platforms, though, for people who might not be 100% across it? So, so, awesome. There's a lot of very cool platforms out there for this. What we're trying to do with Pledger is make the impact well-known and make it a long-term 
system. So the big thing we see with these is that you want to have an authentic partnership. Mm. You're going to see a lot of people do short-term campaigns on GoFundMe for specific causes, which are cool. They're, some of them are fantastic. Um, but you often can't track exactly where the money is going or you don't necessarily know. So with Pledger, a big thing for us is impact. So track the number of meals you provide to homeless, whatever the cause may be. Um, so what we're doing is we're providing the impact, but we're also trying to provide authentic partnerships, which is the big thing. So you probably see every month a lot of major corporations will change the color of their logo to sort of meet whatever's going on that month. Mm. Um, we're trying to marketing, the benefits of social impact, but people actually do see through that, and there's a lot of you know, virtue signaling that goes with this. So what we're trying to do is make sure that when you're working with Pledger and when you're working with charity, it's an authentic partnership. It's trackable, and it actually makes sense for both you and the team. And talking there about authentic partnerships, something a bit more long-term, what would be one of the good examples from 2021 of a brand that you worked with? So we have a number of brands um, that are onboarded, a lot of small ones. So I've got a couple of personal favorites that are very minor. Some are niche rescuing turtle doves in the UK. Um, there's an all-women anti-Bojan squad in Africa. So there's a lot of really cool ones there. How's that? Um, but the biggest one we're seeing, obviously, is, is tree plant. So it's simple, it's trackable, and, you know, obviously, if you, you know, feel the temperatures, I'm sure Australia's pretty hot right now. Um, but if you feel the temperatures, you know, global warming is a thing, climate change is a thing, so people are trying to help and act on that. So it's not very exciting, but it's trackable. So tree planting is probably the biggest one. Mm. Cool. Well, so how can e-commerce brands then incorporate sort of meaningful social impact into their business? And then in turn, they can help grow through giving. Is that kind of the, the goal here of Pledger is to have those perfect alignments between uh, a cause that a company and its consumers would probably be quite interested in and then that, that will help them grow further in that sense because there's sort of that, I suppose, connection, that deep embeddedness where it's a case of, you know, yes, we, we believe in the vision of this company. We like the fact that they've aligned themselves with this brand. Is that sort of how you see Pledger helping businesses grow? Absolutely. So I like, I love... Love See, he would take money. Well, RIP, but he would have taken money from anybody to help conserve the environment. Like, if you want to plant twenty thousand trees at the end of the year, I support you. Plant trees, I'm in for that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not authentic, and people see through that. So the thing with social impact is that when you have it as part of your brand, part of your purpose, the consumer knows they were this. They're going to buy more from your site. They're going to come back more frequently, and that's why people pretend and sort of do this for yourself. So there's a couple simple rules that work. Um, try and have something that's consistent with what your company is selling. So if you're selling mugs and you're saving bees, great, that's awesome. But <laughs> it won't necessarily draw that connection um, versus if you're selling, say, bike helmets or bike parts and you're supporting the whole price of the relief, that connection can be drawn with the connection. See what's going on. So that's wonderful, that's great. If you're a smaller retailer and maybe you don't want to give donations yourself, you know, it's just pleasure that your customers donate. Or I hope a local charity. There's you know, tons of big charities that are fundraising for us. We're great, support them. But there's a lot of small charities that come in that maybe even have a couple hundred pounds a year or a few thousand dollars a year. It goes really far, and the story you can have there is good. Um, they will promote you as well. You promote them. You can talk about them. In your real, people know that, and they will reward you. Now, as part of the, um, the Shopify function within Pledger, uh, what I want to break down is, for example, if someone buys, say, a $20 shirt, for example, how much will be then given across to the charity that they're affiliated with? Is there a way that you can adjust the parameters to say, hey, 5% of every sale goes to this, or is it 1%, is it 10%? How does that work? It's up to the retailer in terms of what they want to do. So you've got some larger companies that are giving, say, a half percent, but they're, you know, maybe selling ovens and stuff where they can't afford. The margins are a little bit thinner for a lot of projects, for a lot of mm -hmm. products. Um, so we'll get a half percent or we'll give a few pounds per, per order. Um, but we have some really cool companies that are straight up giving the 20, 30 percent of the revenue to niche charities. Wow. Um, it's almost like they don't want to make money. They really just want to help. And you see with the, talk about, talk about authentic partnerships, but... A lot of these uh, these founders have personal experience with the charities, whether it's cancer research or who may have benefited from these charities in the past, and they truly just want to give back. And what we see, because we track all the orders, they perform very well. Like they're trying to give their money away, but it's coming back with people love them. They're, they're great people. So you can give one percent, give five percent, or you can ask your consumers to go. 
Now, you're also talking just a little while ago about smaller retailers being involved as well. Is there a minimum size that there needs to be to get involved with Pledger, or can any company theoretically do it? Um, any company can do it. We don't want to gatekeep it. We, you know, we see companies like Amazon and the Climate Pledge where they're giving billion dollars to you know, fight the good fight. But we know where the money comes from, obviously. If a small brand wants to come in and you know, donate one pound a month because they're selling and mugs to support bees, we're all for that. And we want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to do that. I think a big thing for me and many others is that I'm only comfortable giving if I know where my money is actually going to go to. Uh, so with that in mind, how does Pledge actually keep things transparent and, and I suppose simple so it's easy to follow the entire process? So when it comes to, say, the customer journey, um, you can see the money's going somewhere. That's cool. Or are they telling the truth? Are they lying? You don't know. So what we do with our purchases is that when you make your purchase through Pledger, um, you get a few different options. So the consumer can actually pick which charity they want to support. Um, so if you have a few that you love, tree planting, bees, once again, because I'm all that stuff in my head right now, and homeless, um, you give your consumer's option to pick. What we try and do with as many of these charities Part impact with money. So if you know buying that twenty dollar t shirt, uh, two pounds or two dollars is going to be for charity, you know that's going to be two trees planted. You know that's going to be half a meal, whatever that equates out to. It's really tracking. It's, if you can show what the impact is, that's what we try to be transparent. Well, Weston, what's in the pipeline for Pledger in twenty twenty two? Um, we've got some pretty cool partnerships that are opening up. So as we've been sort of growing and developing, a lot of our charity onboarding is coming through, through shops. People come in and we have our sort of our favorite charities, our the charities that we started with, a pleasure, which we find things to be ones. Um, we're trying to onboard tens of thousands of charities at once because anytime a new store comes on, we want to find new charities, but they want to support specific ones. So we're trying to really grow and develop that. Um, and we're also adding a lot of some of the impact tracking features. What you're seeing in a lot of countries, especially the UK, where the companies based in Germany, um, ESG reporting is not, not just so quick anymore. You have to do it. Um, there's legal obligations that are coming in the pipeline. Like you have to be showing hmm. your environmental impacts, but uh, you track your social impact as well. So, what we're trying to do is provide all the information, all the tools to make this easier for others. I did this for years. It was the most soul job and numbers and data to governments. It's not fun. I don't want anybody to have to do it if they don't have to. So we're trying to give people all the tools and all the resources to, to, to do it for us. Hey, wonderful. And just before I let you go, Weston, how can we find Pledger, whether you be a business looking to get involved or a consumer who wants to find who is actually being supported with Pledger's uh, application? How, how can we find you? Well, I'm sure there's going to be a link here, 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 here. Um, <laughs> Or if not, um, if you go to Shopify and just search charity, we're the first company that comes up, because we're just the best. Um, or if you just search Pledger on Google, um, you're probably going to find us. So search um, or the product that works to help social impacts, go for it, do whatever it takes. Perfect. Well, Weston, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, that's Weston McIntosh, the CMO of Pledger. And if you missed any part of that interview, you can catch the entire chat on our YouTube channel, Kalkai Media, so make sure to subscribe. That's all for today, though. I'm James Preston reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. 
And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Hello everyone, welcome to the Smart Market Insights here on Calkine TV, I'm Sage. And today we'll be shining some light on the impact the crypto market is having on the economy. Many are saying crypto is currently in a bear market and to be fair, it's hard to tell with crypto. The inherent volatility of digital assets means that the direction of the market can change very quickly. And having said that, the crypto market has been in decline for close to three months now, led by Bitcoin, which in November reached a new all-time high of 68,500 US dollars. Today, it's worth around US $42,000. Now, meanwhile, countries around the world are grappling with the potential impact crypto will have on their wider economies. Some look upon this more favourably, while others see it as a threat to economic stability. And at a time when the global economy is dealing with the fallout of the pandemic, which has caused lockdowns all over the world throughout the past two years, never has the determination of crypto's impact on the wider economy been more important. In Russia's blanket ban on cryptocurrency, just recently, the Russian media reported the Deputy Prime Minister Dmitry Chinoshenko had signed a roadmap to regulate crypto operations in Russia. And this followed a report by Russia's central bank, which proposed a blanket ban on crypto-related activity in the country. The paper, titled Cryptocurrencies, Trends, Risks and Regulation, argues the adoption of cryptocurrencies poses sizable risks for the Russian financial market and particularly to the well-being of the Russian citizens due to market volatility, scams and cyber attacks, which they believe will lead to a loss of investment in traditional assets threat to central banks. Several countries have expressed their concerns regarding the threat posed to central banks by decentralized digital currencies. And China is another country which throughout 2021 put a blanket ban on both the trading as well as mining of digital currencies. 
Migration of Bitcoin mining. And before China imposed a ban on crypto mining, the majority of the world's Bitcoin occurred there. And this meant that following the ban, miners were forced to find other venues to execute the mining of various crypto coins. And those miners headed to places like Kazakhstan, where electricity is cheap. And bear in mind, the mining of Bitcoin alone has been reported to use as much electricity on an annual basis than smaller countries like Sweden, Malaysia and Egypt. The migration of miners to Kazakhstan has put pressure on the nation's power grid, causing regular power outages resulting in authorities being forced to ration electricity away from crypto miners, which consequently has forced those miners to migrate again to more electronically fruitful locations. And this loss of economic activity has reportedly resulted in losses of around 1.5 billion US dollars times Kazakhstan's economy. Policy and levels of regulation in Australia. Australia is one of the more friendly destinations and believes its economy will benefit from crypto in the long run, provided there is proper regulation put in place. A report published in October by the Senate Select Committee on Australia proposes licenses for crypto exchanges as well as streamlined taxation legislation. Australia has conveyed a relatively optimistic attitude to the future that decentralised digital currencies and blockchain technology can provide. So the bottom line, cryptocurrency is still a relatively new asset class. Its popularity, which has accelerated its status to the point where governments are now scrambling to either incorporate or reject it from participating within their larger economies, is even more recent. And for those countries like Australia who have chosen to incorporate rather than reject crypto assets, its effect on the wider economy remains to be seen. And thanks for your company on that report. And that's all for now. We will be back again with the exclusive Smart Market Insights show. But till then, keep watching Calcane TV for the latest market updates and related insights. Sage here, signing off for now. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next what the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calcine TV. Sabre Crypto. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields reporting for Kalkai Media. Sabre is a decentralized exchange primarily built on the Solana blockchain network, and it aims to be one of the critical liquidity foundations for stable coins. It claims to provide swapping opportunities for more than 30 cryptos with a swap pair of USDT and USDC. Let's find out what makes Sabre tick. Well, one of the advantages of this crypto is its ability to offer services at a low transaction fee and faster transaction speed as well. Sabre can do this thanks to Solana's faster throughput ability, which offers low transaction costs as against the likes of Ethereum. Recently, Sabre completed the integration with Clover Finance Wallet to expand its vision to create a multi-chain ecosystem, which aims to accelerate and to improve the DeFi experience. So how does Sabre work exactly? Well, one of the key components of Sabre's functionality is its ability to work as an automated market maker. Traditionally, all AMM-based exchanges are not trader dependent on completing a particular transaction. The liquidity pool provides managers with flows of funds and they are in turn given a portion of the transaction fees. So investors can execute their respective transactions without waiting for trader availability meaning you can complete the transaction against the pool as you're not dependent on the coin's availability. Sabre is governed by the native token SBR and it's ranked number 3,191 on CoinMarketCap. The crypto has been on a bearish trend of late and hasn't seen much of a positive run, although the overall market is seeing significant lows where SBR token was down by over 41% over the past week. But some investors believe that they'll see a positive rally in Solana's price once the market revives. So what's your take on Sabre? Let us know in the comments and as always check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. This has been Holly Shields for Calcine Media.
Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Benjamin Lai. Now Ben is Savvy SME's top influencer in sales strategy. He's also the founder of Sales Ethos. And there's online business marketplace bringing really good ideas and tools and we'll find out more shortly. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Welcome to you today, Ben. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, first of all, could you just explain for our viewers what you do and help, how you help businesses and entrepreneurs? Absolutely. Um, I'm a sales trainer and coach. Uh, in short, I help clients to convert more conversations into clients. Excellent. And you work extensively with emotional communication methods. Can you tell us how businesses can use emotional intelligence to help boost new sales? Absolutely. Look, I, th I think with the, the way that the market is moving at the moment, we are more moving towards a human side of business. So people generally want to build relationships before they do business with you. So a, a very important part of sales and uh, understanding emotional intelligence is understanding our nature but also the nature of other people and one of those fundamental things is that people make decisions emotionally and then they justify it with logic and if you ever uh, question this uh, think of an example of when you've received a telemarketing call uh, usually when they, they start their sales pitch it almost doesn't matter how good their product or service is because of the way that they approach you, they've triggered certain fight or flight responses and we immediately decide not to trust this person before we even get them, give them a chance to speak. So we have to take the emotional aspect, uh, uh, it, we have to account for that in all of our sales and marketing interactions. Absolutely. And how do you feel people who run their business in the service sector, how can they stand out and promote their services? Absolutely. Um, that's a great question, by the way. I've uh, heard it uh, quite a few times in, in the past. And um, one of the interesting things about selling uh, so-called intangible services is that every sale and every product is selling something intangible. Let's just take, for example, a, a drill. Okay, That's a fairly tangible sort of object. When a person buys a drill, they're not actually just trying to buy a drill. They, they're buying the drill because they want to make a hole in the wall or they want to do some home repairs and they want to feel like they've done something to improve their living circumstances, uh, even if it's just hanging up a picture of the family on the wall. Uh, similarly, for those uh, that are selling intangible services, what you need to do is to really find out what is it that people care about? What is it that they value? What is it they're really looking for? Uh, to give you my, my personal example, so I provide sales training and coaching, but is it really just lessons that people want? And the answer is no. What people are really looking for is the ability to grow their incomes, to convert more conversations, but they want to do it in a way that really resonates with their personal values and their personality. So whatever it is that you're selling, whether it's tangible or intangible, figure out what, how it makes your clients feel and sell to that particular aspect. And in your opinion, Ben, what makes a sales team successful? That's that's also a really good question. Look, a sales teams is is like running, starting and running one is really challenging. And um, I've spoken to a lot of experts about this. I've done a lot of research into this. Um, I think it starts uh, with a strong purpose. Uh, if if your team is really behind the, the the purpose of the company and the product they really believe in it they're going to sell with all of their strength with all of their energy and efforts um, so you start off with a really strong purpose then you develop the culture and the kpis to support that purpose um, uh, next you need to have the right people on board you need people who resonate with the purpose and with those values because if you get the wrong people they're going to be toxic towards the culture and it's, it's going to spoil it for everyone. Um, on the more superficial level, it's very important to have sales systems. Uh, so what I mean by that is 
having step-by-step -step processes for them to follow uh, and the skills development to back that up. Um, so all of these things, strong purpose, culture and KPIs, the right people, the right sales system, and then the skills development, all of these things contribute towards having a successful sales team. Absolutely. And how can entrepreneurs work on their communication and also their networking skills to boost their business? Great question. Um, yeah, look, we're busier than we ever have been before. I, I constantly talk to entrepreneurs who are working, you know, 12 hour days. And then so they wonder, how am I supposed to spend time networking and, and developing myself? Well, my question is, if you're going to be working that long, how can you afford not to spend time developing and working on yourself? Um, when it comes to communication and networking specifically, look, you, you really do have to uh, pay the price in terms, either in terms of time or investment. Uh, if, if you wanted to shortcut uh, this process, what I would probably suggest here is to find the times in the day, in your daily routine, where your hands are busy, but your mind isn't. So I personally like to listen to audiobooks and while I'm driving or while I'm washing the dishes, while I'm vacuuming the house, those are perfect times to listen to uh, educational material and improve my skills. Uh, I'll tell you, like when I first started this business, it was based on somewhere around 10 years of just listening to and learning all of these things in my spare time. And so the, the emphasis here is to look for ways to incrementally improve yourself day by day. Don't look for massive change in short amount of time. But however, if you do want to implement uh, a bigger change, you certainly can fast track your progress by attending uh, professional courses or finding a coach uh, like myself or, or someone in your local area uh, that can teach you so that you can pretty much bypass all of those hours uh, and condense it into a very short amount of time. And lastly, Ben, what would be the key advice you'd like to give to small business owners or startups for them to grab a strong foothold in the market? That's a great question. Um, I think if I were to just give one piece of advice, it would be to become excellent at articulating your differences and articulating your value to your clients. Unfortunately, the race doesn't always go to the best service provider or the best product. It goes to those who are best at marketing and communicating and selling their products. There are lots of products out there that, you know, seemingly not, not very good. Lots of services, the same thing. The, the, the service is not very good, but because they're so good at marketing, they become very successful. So part of my goal and my mission is to empower those who really care about the, the quality of the product and service that they're providing and to help them to articulate that really well so that they can become successful and reach the top of their, um, their dreams and their business. There's such valuable advice and information there, Ben. Thank you so much for chatting with us today. My pleasure. It was a pleasure being here. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. I'm Rachel Jones and this is Calkine's breaking business news. Fibre cement maker James Hardy report global net sales are up 22% to 900 million US dollars for the third quarter. Now the company has raised its annual profit forecast for the fourth time this fiscal year, driven by a boom in the housing sector in North America. New home sales in the US make up 70% of the company's revenue and rose in every month of the December quarter and are expected to be robust despite the prospect of higher mortgage rates driving up demand for building materials. The company's third quarter North America fiber cement segment net sales increased 24% to 644.9 million US dollars, while European building product segment, their net sales rose 14% to 97.6 million euros. 
Asia-Pacific fiber cement segment net sales rose 192, 196.5 million. That's an increase of 20%. Now, the company has raised its fiscal year 2022 adjusted net income guidance range to 600 and 20 million US dollars and 630 million dollars and that's from 605 million and 625 million US dollars. James Hoddy interim CEO Harold Ween says the team's success in delivering high value products which underpins price and mix is the result of enabling customers to sell more to make more money by selling more James Hardy products and also marketing directly to the homeowners to create demand of their high value products through their customers. That's all from me for now, but stay tuned to Calkine for all the business news that matters. I'm Rachel signing off for now. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Calkine TV and today's guest is Mr. Eric Sutphin, top influencer for online business at Savvy SME. And Savvy SME is an online business marketplace that brings the best ideas and tools to thousands of businesses who've transformed into the digital mode. Establishing and succeeding a business in the digital world is tricky. So to help us understand the key strategies and planning needed in the area, we can employ businesses like Savvy SME and Mr. Eric Sutphin is a specialist on the subject and he'll guide us more. So bringing you live today we have Mr. Eric Sutphin, the top influencer for online businesses. Welcome to the show Eric. Thank you for having me. Well Glad we may as well make the most of our time together today and get started. So while strategizing for online business how do you maintain the brand's unique identity and objectives? It's obviously not a cut and paste strategy that's used by SME. No, it is a blend of an art and a science and really it comes down to being able and the personality of the brand that you're wanting to represent. Just like our own character, we all are able to come across uh, in different mechanisms to our friends, family, and, and those voices uh, are able to translate through a brand as well. So understanding the goals and the personality we can back into how can you convey that message and meet each audience where they're at? And that's the simple premise of marketing. Meet your customers where they're at and with a message that is going to resonate and identify with them. Fantastic. Thank you for breaking that down in a nutshell for us. So in your opinion, Eric, what are the most optimum strategies for hotel marketing? We're seeing the reopening of many uh, businesses in the travel sector. So this is obviously trending. Yeah, globally, you know, some are opening, others are shutting down. It is a very dynamic marketplace right now. But regardless of where you're at in that business cycle, the uh, important on your customer base that you've already garnered influence, you've already gained loyalty and trust with is going to be critical. So social media, email, how do you provide offers and incentives to bring them in and influence uh, a longer stay or bringing others with them um, to be able to increase their influence. So social media and, and leverage can be a great way to be able to have evergreen content and even use your customers as advocates to curate that on your behalf uh, and further deepen that with their audience and their network. Thank you um, for sharing your information there. So there are active and passive marketing strategies. How do they differ and how should brands employ these please? Sure, so we see these in our everyday life. Uh, Active being a push and passive being more of a pull strategy. You, from media, um, these are 
paid ads that are following you around. These are push targeting. They want uh, exposure and visibility to garner your attention. Really then more passive and, and reactive SEO where people are searching for content and actively seeking, seeking you out. That could also be a product, say on uh, Amazon or any e-commerce outlet. These are more poll influences. You're using content to be able to, to then attract the customer on your behalf and create a dialogue, create an engagement with them. So both are needed and uh, need to complement one another, but it is really understanding again, your audience and how to leverage and meet them at each one of those customer touch points to influence and deepen that engagement. And are you finding those big household brands are having to work just as hard to create that brand image as the smaller businesses, especially in the hotel industry that you mentioned before? Yeah, they are undoubtedly having to adapt, um, given not just kind of the policies and the healthcare considerations, customer demands have changed as well. We're seeing the need for uh, extended stays and remote working and how do you have the accommodations and accessibility to serve this extended traveler like Airbnb, the first quarter of 2021, 26%. So over a quarter of their bookings were for four weeks or more. So the buying habits, people are wanting this type of uh, experience to be able to travel still with others. And the hospitality industry is going to have to cater and tailor to that. So really understanding your customer, meeting them where they're at, not just online, but offline and facilitating experiences uh, is where we're seeing the hospitality industry having to react to be proactive about sustainability measures and how do they uh, communicate regional policies and information about uh, healthcare. So the, the industry is being a little more forward uh, thinking than I think it was pre-COVID, a little less reactive, which is nice. Yes, I think those big uh, hotel chains are kind of having to um, capitalize on their community and building those memberships and club class VIP treatment sort of um, mm -hmm. packages to inv invite and entice customers to their um, establishments. Do you have anything to add on that type of marketing? Yeah, th that's the direction these brands are going. It's this cause marketing and influence where the values that the brand stands for, the community influence and philanthropies that they are supporting uh, aligns with the values and where I want to be putting my time and energy and money behind a brand. So from Patagonia to REI, you know, taking Fridays off for um, Black Friday and the holiday, uh, actually being an advocate for their employee and go adventure. You're seeing Lululemon and a bunch of companies follow suit in how do they align with a mission uh, that complements that of their customer base. And so hotels undoubtedly having to do the same. And there's a lot of ways that in the hospitality and tourism industry, they can do that. They can you know, align with local cleanup causes or education. Um, there's really cool sustainable developments um, around agriculture that are going on to permeate into the rest of the community where they can give back. So we're seeing uh, some really positive impacts actually as a, a result of COVID where the, these bigger hotels are having to curate that community in uh, more local and concentric ways. Wow, thanks so much for sharing that. And funny you mentioned the Black Friday um, sales because they can present to be a, a great opportunity for a, a shopping um, safari, for example, where people who live maybe far away from the, the city centers where all the discounted shops are, the best quality clothes, etc., they may all flock on a bus to together to stay, stay in a hotel together to share the experience to then go shopping together on, on their bus expeditions. That, that would be a great uh, way to um, aggressively almost uh, get a few businesses involved with the Black Friday sales. Have you seen that uh, Absolutely. happen at all in your experience? Uh, you know, I think right now with COVID, the implications, you know, every community is reacting to the situation differently. I think right now I'm seeing more uh, businesses lean into technology and how they can be able to drive online sales and curate online community. We're finding even in the travel space, um, you're watching smart luggage companies look at launching a community where they are able to have active conversations amongst their travelers, you know, so uh, you're seeing seeing this of 
bringing community together online, I'm excited to see how they do start to translate. How do they now bring that offline? Um, Zeal Remote is a company that we're watching evolve the remote working space that is looking to curate that online community and facilitate that, you know, in destination experience amongst travelers as well, which will be fun to watch evolve. Awesome, thanks, we'll watch, we'll watch this space as well. So please talk about the marketing trends that you've observed in 2021. What will shape the future of the marketing industry in your opinion? So technology it has taken leaps and bounds over the last year. Uh, the metaverse and what Facebook is launching, um, augmented reality and virtual reality now far transcend just the QR code and being able to pull up a menu and order food. We can have interactive experiences where walking around will use a hotel. You could be able to use your phone and not just a QR code, but an icon or a logo that would populate a call to action, a video, um, a menu, uh, a booking of an activity. You could be able to reserve, you know, a timer or, or something like a cooking class. And that is gonna be able to happen in real time. And so we're seeing not just that uh, ability, but through Oculus and virtual reality, the ability for companies to employ um, really proactive engagement in the metaverse to show what an experience will be like, not only in the destination, but perhaps the suite that they're gonna be looking to book. Um, and you'll be able to, at home, see the landscape of, where you're going and have it uh, be like a 360 environment for you to be able to then know where you're going and, and have a more seamless experience um, with the staff and with the destination uh, when you arrive. You know what, the metaverse really does excite me. I think about 10 to 12 years ago, the prospect of smell vision or interactive television sort of came up. But the metaverse, that's try before you buy, you know, put to the limit basically. So that, that's going to be very exciting. So Eric, lastly, what are the strategic, technical and creative avenues that businesses should focus on while they transform? Well, one of the things we've been talking about, the, un, the undermine uh, of all this is an experience, right? Whether online or offline, brands are needing to lean into how do they create not only experiences for their customers, but for their employees. Uh, Undoubtedly, COVID has created a lot of uh, impact in the workspace as well, and not just this hybrid environment of in office and at home, but uh, how are you facilitating a deeper engagement on both sides of that, that um, commercial landscape? So undoubtedly, we're seeing businesses take a step back in COVID and really re-engineer their marketing strategies and tactics. We're seeing them really uh, be competitive and collaborate across the industry to find innovative solutions where they can really serve and put the customers and their employees first. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing your passion for what you do with us today and also your insights. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you for having me. You can <laughs> find us on Savvy SME and yes. we'll find you there. Savvy SME is your website? Savvy SME is uh, the content uh, provider here for the conversation around hospitality. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And if you just joined us, we just had a very interesting in, in discussion with Mr. Um, Eric Sutfin, the top influencer for online business at Savvy SME. And the full interview can be watched today at YouTube via Kalkine Media, so please check it out. But keep watching Kalkine for more expert talks, live market updates, and as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Hello everyone, this is Rachel live from Calkine Studios in Sydney and you're watching The Early Trades. Now the Australian share market did open lower, weighed by losses from Magellan and the ANZ. The S&P SX200 index was down 0.7%. Magellan Financial Group was down 7.1% and that was after Chairman Hamish Douglas announced he was taking a medical leave of absence. 
ANZ shares were trading 4% lower. And that was after they unveiled weaker margins in their quarterly update. Unibail Rodemco Westfield, their shares were down 4.8% so far this morning. Grain Corp was trading at 12.6% higher, and that was after providing strong earnings guidance. James Hardy Industries, their shares are currently up 6.4%. After they upgraded their guidance and reported a strong third quarter result, Simic Group's UGL has been named as the principal contractor by Snowy Hydro for the construction of a 660 megawatt power generation plant at the Hunter Power Project in Kerry Curry in New South Wales. The contract will generate revenue to UGL of $185 million over a two-year period. The power generation plant will consist of two heavy-duty F-class gas turbine generators and the related auxiliaries which operate using dual fuel sources, including provision to operate on a hydrogen fuel mix. Moving on, in the Star Entertainment Group will release its first half of financial year 2022 results on the 17th of February. As previously disclosed, first half financial year 2022 earnings have been materially impacted by COVID-19 related property shutdowns, also operating restrictions and of course border closures. The Star Sydney, which was closed from the start of the period to the 11th of October 2021, recorded strong revenue growth upon reopening, with revenue up 29% on the prior corresponding period from the 11th of October to the 31st of December 2021. Queensland Casino's total revenue was stable despite border closures and COVID-19 related operating restrictions. Moving on, an ANZ a banking group suffered a group net interest margin deterioration of eight basis points over the first quarter, or five basis points on an underlying basis. The bank attributed the decline to a lower exit rate at the full year and also a continuation of the structural headwinds impacting the sector. Over the second quarter, ANZ expects these headwinds to be moderate, specifically the result of rising interest rates in New Zealand and changes in deposit pricing. And Grain Corp expects to report financial year 2022 underlying EBITDA in the range of 480 to 540 million dollars and financial year 2022 underlying MPAT of 235 to 280 million dollars. Grain Corp's earnings guidance is subject to several market variables as outlined in the conclusions. Silver Lake Resources has announced the board has approved an on-market share buyback for up to 10% of Silver Lake's ordinary shares over the next 12 months. Silver Lake's strong organically generated balance sheet and forecast-free cash flow generation provides a flexibility to consider value accretion, capital management initiatives. Under Silver Lake's capital allocation framework, the company considers capital management and uses for excess capital after allocating and reserving funds to sustain operations through the gold price cycle and internally fund investment in projects and exploration to maximize the value of its existing operations, projects and tenement holdings. Well, that's all from me for the early trades, but stay tuned to Calkine TV. We've got many more shows lined up for you across the economy, markets and sectors. This is Rachel signing off for now. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks exclusive to Kalkine TV. The demands of modern life have led to many more investors entering the market. A common trend for many of these new investors though is that they are time poor and approach investing from an emotional standpoint. 
James is a financial services technology that aims to address these issues head on, utilizing artificial intelligence to successfully manage a portfolio to maximize profit and minimize emotional biases. The founder and CEO of James is Tui Eduara, and he joins me live now on Kalkine. Tui, a very good afternoon to you. Hi, James. Thanks for having me. Well, Tui, great to have you here. Can you let our audience know exactly how James functions and what was the motivation behind creating the company in the first place? Sure. So James is an automated AI investing app and we're built for the everyday investors. So the backstory is that um, we've created, we've developed our own technology that the large institutional banks have been using for many years. But for the first time, we've enabled it for the everyday investor on a subscription basis. So it's giving the everyday investor a uh, fighting a chance against institutional banks. So we like to hear taking a bit of power away from those big boys, that's for sure. Now, a key tagline for James is removing the emotion from trading. How important would you say that is when dealing with stocks and, and how does James help to remove those behavioural biases? Yeah, definitely. So look, that, that is the biggest challenge that every investor has is the emotional control and understanding, removing your bias from making your investing decisions. So, you know, even the most experienced investors that work for large banks for over 30 years, their biggest challenge is the emotional control, when to execute, when not to execute, mm. but also removing their personal bias that they might have towards a particular industry, stock or um, particular sector. So what that, that's probably one of the biggest human flaws that we have is that we have this bias to towards things that we see a lot or are involved. So using technology, um, our AI technology isn't biased to anything because obviously it's technology, it's not a human being. So with our technology, it's just purely looking at data and making an informed decision from the data it has and then obviously executing when it thinks it's appropriate, again, based off key metrics and data. No, it's great. It's very much a case of Gordon Gecko as opposed to your local tree hugger. So I think that's definitely quite <laughs> useful moving forward for people that are trying to get into the space and perhaps don't have the greatest financial IQ, for example. I, I think yeah, another yeah. big movement that's happened in the last few years, and you've mentioned this as well, talking about big banks just a little while ago, I think especially with the gradual mainstreaming of cryptocurrencies, it's been the concept of decentralization. Would, would you say it's fair to say that the technology James utilizes was traditionally out of reach for most people in, in years gone by? Yeah, definitely. And that's because of the sheer cost to operate the technology. So um, obviously institutions, they're dealing with large volumes of money. So naturally their commissions and their earnings are much larger than say, you know, your smaller company. So this technology isn't uh, cheap by any means to develop or operate because you are using sophisticated um, artificial intelligence technology. And I can tell you that behind the scenes, there's a lot of development and maintenance required to keep that technology running. So from our point of view, what we've done is that we've developed, we've done the hard yards and obviously incurred the cost to develop the technology. Um, and now it's about obviously mass adoption because the more people adopt, obviously we can offer our technology cheaper over time as well. So it's sort of a, a different approach, but um, what, what it means is that the everyday investor, like that person who might have five, 10, 20, $50,000 who they want to get invested in, in equities, they can access, you know, really sophisticated and market leading technology mm. that just wasn't really accessible to, to them prior to us coming along. And we know often with, uh, I suppose, the, um, the older generations, there's a bit of a hesitancy to get involved in these kind of new technologies when traditionally you can go down the path of, say, a, a traditional portfolio manager. Is that where you're seeing a bit of a hesitancy with adopting something like James? Is it more young investors coming to use the platform or is it a bit of a mix of both? Uh, it's a mix of both. So, you know, I think you've just you've pointed out an interesting topic. You know, there's a big transition happening now in, in investing. Um, it's this it's this battle between talent and technology. Mm. Um, so obviously the traditional fund asset manager, very much based on talent and firms with hire really talented people that can understand markets. And then now you've got this emergence of technology, which is automating functions. And obviously, you know, being very competitive, especially in financial markets, what we're doing against that individual as, as a talent. So there's this big trend, this big you know, crossover happening at the moment of talent versus technology. And I think that that comes down to the everyday person as well. So um, obviously we, I think humanly, we tend to 
fight against technology because naturally <laughs> we don't think something's better than us. But what, what happens over time is that you learn to adopt that part of, as part of your life. So, you know, the biggest thing that I've seen probably in the last three or four years is really the adoption of Siri um, and Alexa and those voice devices. And I'm actually even seeing like huge adoption um, with kids, um, obviously starting young. So this adoption's uh, ha happening naturally. And obviously through our technology, we do have a lot of uptake from that younger generation, um, under 35, etc. However, um, we are now starting to see older people come on board and start to understand the technology. So they don't really, um, they always take a little bit longer and they want to know more about the technology we're developing, which is completely understanding, understandable. So it's all about, you know, education and, you know, making people aware that, hey, don't be scared of this technology. This is something that we should be embracing because it's going to help us. It's not going to hinder us. I think you might have hit the nail on the head there, though. I mean, when we're talking about some of these older investors, just remember the first Terminator movie came out in the 80s, mate. That is well more than 40 years old. We've also got Terminator 2 in the early 90s. There is still Skynet fears there. I, I can kind of understand it from their perspective. But let's focus on the, uh, the young investors themselves. Now, in 2022, there is obviously quite a few dilemmas that younger people are facing at the moment. They're looking to get ahead, and that's in the backdrop of a housing crisis. Of course, we've had the pandemic. There's rising inflation. And then by the same token, you've got them working longer hours for less pay, and ultimately, they're just quite time poor. Would you say that James, as a result, is a viable solution for someone facing that scenario? Yeah, uh, definitely, and I think that we're we're seeing, um, especially in Australia, we're getting a lot of people fed up with the housing market. Um, you know, the last two years, I think we had twenty five percent growth in property last year, and prior to that, it was like ten or twelve. So mm. we've had you know, massive growth in property prices, and you know, people in their late twenties, early thirties, especially in the capital cities. It's so hard to get into the property market, um, and so and your deposits are now getting larger. Um, you know, there's discussion now that you know 10% might not be enough because obviously we've got some interest rate rises, and they might be moving the LVR up to like 80%, so a 20% deposit. So it's just making it so much harder for people to get into the property market, and that's why I think you're seeing adoption or take up in cryptocurrencies from that generation uh, as well as other means to invest their money because you know you're coming to a, a place in your life that you know you what you might have saved two hundred thousand dollars but what can you buy property wise to with mm. that deposit it's really difficult so people are now looking at alternative assets to grow their wealth um, and obviously you're seeing cryptocurrencies have a huge take up but also we're sort of seeing take up now that people want to think well I'm not going to earn anything in the bank with my money. I'm not going to buy a house anytime soon. Um, I've got to get this money working for me. So um, technology like ours is really accessible. They can go online. They can learn about it. And, you know, you can get your money working for you very quickly. And I think that's one of the strengths of James as well. So you can dial up and down how much money you want working on the algorithm. So say if you have 200000 and you can have that fully deployed, and then say if an opportunity comes up where you know you might move or you might go on a holiday and you need that capital, you can just wind that down really quickly, withdraw that funds and obviously use that for whatever need you have. So um, you're definitely seeing this change and we're sort of seeing really a lot of adoption in that bracket, especially in capital cities with people who are just fed up with the, with the housing market. Well, you mentioned there that you can sort of wind it up and down, but how frequently does it trade on your behalf? Is it always looking to make those little incre incremental trades to try and gain, uh, I suppose, a fraction of a percent here and there, or is it more uh, a calculated, spaced out process from the AI? Yeah, so it's more, it's definitely um, not high frequency or um, like a frequency trading platform. Uh, it's definitely a bit more longer term, but it's not what we class as medium term. So it's definitely really short to medium term. Our average hold time is anywhere between 16 and 20 days. Uh, but in saying that, you know, we might hold a trade for three days and then close it, or we might hold a trade for 100 days. So it's just depending on what the algorithm is picking up in the market in, in the way of sentiment. Um, but we do know that it does strong perform strongly, definitely around those earnings periods, because the algorithm is able to pick up the sentiment in the market for mm. particular stocks coming into earning period, and then obviously places trades, and you see a lot of short-term trading where 
Um, it, it might come in five or six days prior to the earnings call. The earnings will come up, the stock will pump 10, 15%, and then you, the, you have a nice gain just in you know, five or six day trade period. Now look, without revealing your trade secrets, because that's not what we're about here at all, but how much data is getting pulled into this algorithm? Is it looking at things 20, 30 years in the past to try and see like a long-term trend forming, or is it more focusing on say a year or the past two or three years? How does it work? Um, so it, it, we do use historical data, um, but it's really what's happening in the moment. So um, we obviously the algorithm we digest around about 10 million pieces of data per day. Um, and that's from social media, uh, various news sources, um, analyst reports, um, down to even when a CEO of a company will make an announcement. And then we digest that data to understand um, the sentiment at that time. And then we obviously benchmark those scores against our historic scores as well. Um, and then we obviously analyze stocks based on a fundamental basis and, and you know all those other things. So what our algorithm does, it combines all these types of analysis um, to determine the, the buy and sell rating at that time. So um, the thing with our technology is that it's very difficult to back test. So the reason you know we do get some questions about back testing and we do have um, results back to 2017. Um, however, because we capture news and social in real time, you can't backtest capturing that data. Mm. Um, and that's, that's the key. So that's why we say we analyze in real time because um, you just, we can't access historical social feeds as an example and, and news. Well, just focusing on the social feed and, and that metric in terms of pulling it in for data usage and also you made mention of cryptocurrencies. Now, obviously, that's quite a volatile asset class. And one thing that does seem to be driving a lot of the movement in that space is, in fact, social media usage, whether it be Elon Musk on Twitter showing a picture of a grape and then all of a sudden grape coin goes 10,000 percent up. Uh, do you have any plans to, to go into the space of cryptocurrency trading? And, and how much do you think a social media feed, for example, would you be able to get enough data from that alone to try and predict movements within the space? Um, the answer is yes. So if, if you wanted to move into a sentiment, a pure sentiment strategy, yes, you could. Um, I wouldn't know how that would perform. Um, as we know, it is quite volatile in that space. <laughs> um, however, I can tell you that we're definitely looking at it. So uh, we started a project about two months ago uh, three months ago where we really started investigating um, our ability to offer cryptocurrencies um, as part of our offering. Um, we hope to sort of have something this year. However, it's quite a, um, it's quite a difficult space because ASIC hasn't come out with any sort of regulatory guidelines as, as yeah. such. So um, we, we're one company that, you know, we pride ourselves in being compliant. Um, we hold our own Australian financial services license, so we don't use others. So, you know, it's very important to us that, you know, we maintain that integrity as a company. Um, however, there's definitely a lot of work going on in the background. So our trading team or our quant team is actually working on, um, you know, modifying our algorithm, understanding, you know, traits of cryptocurrencies. Um, but, you know, we, we have a different perspective to crypto, I think, to others. We don't really see them as currencies. Uh, we see them as projects or companies. So mm. we believe every project, you know, has can have some good fundamentals, especially if they're solving a problem or a need. Um, you know, we're seeing some, some good disruptive DeFi plays come in, um, you know, against the SWIFT transfer protocol, XRP and all those. And, you know, those do have some really good fundamentals that you can look at compared to what's happening in the market. But, you know, we're not, we are well aware though that sentiment is a very strong driver um, in that space. And we really want to understand that influence. And that's probably where all the R&D is happening with us at the moment. But what you'll find, what we think we'll find is that we're going to keep seeing more uptake in that, that, that um, asset class. So. Over the next two years, you know, you can have more liquidity, you can have more funds in that space, and that will help iron out, you know, the volatility. Because at the moment, it's really only, a, I think, $4 trillion space, or $2 trillion, I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, that, that's still, that's $2 trillion, sorry, and that's still not the market value of Apple, as an example. So, you know, that's, that space still has a lot of growth, 
And the more investment you get into that asset class, you know, the less volatility you'll have over time. Absolutely. Now, look, that's something that you're currently developing, but there is also uh, a few portfolios that you dropped recently, namely six of them, one of which is an ETF or should I say uh, an ESG. Can you tell us a bit more about these developments at James? Yeah, so at the end of last year, we launched um, six new portfolios as part of our standard subscription. Um, and that came from obviously customer feedback that people wanted different options of portfolios to invest in specifically targeted in different sectors or different areas. So the six portfolios we released is an income portfolio, a growth portfolio, a balanced portfolio, uh, a top 50 ASX portfolio, top 50 US, um, but also a really targeted ESG portfolio, which mm. has been the highest take up portfolio since we've launched. And uh, what we've done with the ESG is that we've listened to the market because people now are really conscious about how their money's being invested and they want to say, and um, you know, the classic example is that, you know, we're now seeing superannuation funds divest or remove their investment into coal at the moment. So, you know, that's just how much um, momentum this, this whole ESG space is getting. So mm. we worked with um, Sustainalytics to access uh, really detailed and comprehensive ESG data. Um, and then we're able to use that data to really rate companies how they're performing um, against their peers, but also in generally by country on environmental, social and governance issues. And our algorithm is able to generate a really targeted ESG portfolio with the top ESG performers in the Australian and US market. And so, you know, that portfolio really suits that ethical investor who really wants to make sure that they have a nice balanced portfolio, but, you know, it's being invested in companies that have ESG as priority. We're speaking with Tui Eduara, the founder and CEO of James, which is an artificial intelligence trading company. Now, Tui, what would you say is the approach to trading in general from James? Is it more passive or active, or is it somewhat of a combination of both? Um, so we'd say that we're a combination of both now, and that was with our release last year where we introduced ETFs into the platform. But we don't do ETFs like commonly like other um, funds or trading applications. We use ETFs to diversify um, this, our portfolio. So um, one thing that we really know we're conscious of is that, you know, we're moving into a very different market from the last two years to this year. Um, as you mentioned before, we've been in really, we're getting to a high inflationary market. Um, we're already starting to see pullbacks in growth and the passive ETF strategies are not going to be as strong as they were. Like we've had an unbelievable bullish 10 years in markets and mm. um, as much as I'd love for them to continue, I think that we have to be obviously vigilant that, you know, these, the, the, the pot of gold won't continue forever. So. With James, obviously the algorithm, we are active strategy. We're holding, you know, trades anywhere from four to 100 days. However, um, you can now um, allocate, say, 30% of your allocation to ETFs. So you can have that passive strategy and you can have that active strategy. And as mentioned before, you can wind up and wind down your allocation to ETFs or the passive strategy or to the active strategy. So with us, you've got that you know, the best of both worlds that you can, you know, accommodate changes in the market and um, turn up and turn down your allocation within James. Now, we know you're taking a look at the crypto space, but what else does 2022 have in store for James? And how do you think that'll work into the market as it's unfolding? Um, so this year, we're um, all about just continuing to innovate our product into the market. Um, we've just obviously released the Android app and we've obviously had the Apple app out for a while. You will see us come to the desktop this year because um, we've just been getting a lot of requests that people do still like a desktop version. Um, we've also, we're looking at cryptocurrencies, as you mentioned. Um, that one is a working project. Um, we might see that towards the end of uh, this year. Um, and then our big project is that we're moving into the UK this year and Europe as well. So using our technology over there and, um, you know, allowing the Brits to, uh, to use uh, some good sophisticated technology. Look, you certainly won't get any whining poms with your 
technology no. arriving on their shores, that's for sure. Tui, <laughs> it's uh, very exciting to see exactly what you are developing there at James. Just before I let you go, where can we find you? Is there a website, social media? Yeah, definitely. Uh, our website is jamesapp.com. Um, but the best way is just to go to your Google store or Apple store, type in James, J-A-A-I-M-S, and then app will be come up to download. Um, and I should actually just give a quick background on James, the name, um, how, how it all started is James stands for just another artificial intelligence management system, but obviously we've shortened it to James, so um, that's the background on that. Now look, it's a great name and I'm totally not biased about that, removing all of my emotional <laughs> training, that's for sure. But from one James to another, too, it's been great to chat with you today. Thank, yeah, thank you, James, and thanks for having us on the show. Well, that's Tui Etuera, the founder and CEO of James. And if you missed any part of that interview, you can catch the whole chat on our YouTube channel, Kaokai Media, so make sure to subscribe. That's all for now. I'm James Preston, reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kaokai. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. What is an IPO, prospectus, and how does it help with investment decisions? Generally, we read the prospectuses of schools or colleges before applying for admissions. Similarly, public companies issue prospectuses to the public to make their decisions and invest in companies. IPO prospectus explained. It is a legal document that provides information about the company to make its investment decisions. It is registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission, responsible for regulating securities, enabling the company to issue bonds or stock to the public for sale. A prospectus contains all the company's details, including facts, objectives, financial statements, management information, goals, type of securities, number of shares, the company's background, and all the other necessary details. All these factors help potential investors. IPO Prospectus. An IPO Prospectus is a legal document linked with an initial public offering and provides all the details about the issuing company to investors to raise funds. An IPO Prospectus includes all the important details of a company, including the terms and conditions of the initial stock offering, company background, financial conditions, share information, regulatory landscape and more. By reviewing an IPO prospectus, investors can gain vital information about the company's business management and strategy, details of securities, risk factors and even some background information. What are the preliminary and final prospectuses? The company issues preliminary and final prospectuses. A preliminary prospectus provides information on the company and the proposed sales 
transaction details before issuing the securities. However, it generally does not include price information and details on how many shares it will issue to shareholders or investors. A final prospectus is a finalized prospectus of the securities offered to the public. It contains the complete details of the offering. It is issued when a company takes the final decisions. The final prospectus includes information about the company goals, the number of shares it will offer, financial information, business models, dividend policies and all the necessary details. The main goal of the final prospectus is to provide detailed information about the company to the investors so it can help in making investment decisions. Prospectus uses with the prospectus, investors can take their decisions and decide whether its company is right for investing or not. It informs them of the risks and factors associated with the investment. The risks are usually mentioned at the beginning of the prospectus and described later in detail. The risk column in the prospectus provides information about interest rate risks, credit risks, market risks and various other risks associated with funds. What is a mutual fund prospectus? A mutual fund prospectus is a document that includes information about the objectives of investments, investment strategies, risks, fees, expenses, fund managers and financial details and all the other information about the mutual fund. Mutual fund companies are responsible for issuing prospectus copies to the public before they buy the company's stocks. An investor can get the documents directly from the funding company through mails and the company's website or a financial planner or even an advisor. These types of documents help investors to make the right decision before investing in mutual funds. So to sum it all up for you, a prospectus provides details about the company's operations and plans, as well as a business model to potential investors. With the prospectus, investors can have a better understanding of the company, including the risks associated with securities, the company's financial conditions and other details. And all these factors can help them decide whether to invest in a particular security or not. All these factors can help them decide whether to invest in a particular security or not. Thanks for joining us in the report and if you like the information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos by Kalkine. But for more articles like this, there's a website, it's kalkinemedia.com. My name's Sage for Kalkine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know.
KSA to you. Great to have your company on Kalkine TV. And this is the Daily Crypto Catch, brought to you by Crossgate Capital. And let's now catch up on the past 24 hours from the crypto space. Beginning with, North Korean cyber criminals have stolen millions of dollars worth of cryptocurrency to fund the country's missile programs. According to a United Nations report, between 2020 and mid-2021, cyber attackers stole more than US $50 million of digital assets. Investigators have said such attacks are an important revenue source for Pyongyang's nuclear and ballistic missile program. The reported cyber attacks targeted at least three cryptocurrency exchanges in North America, Europe and Asia. The same report also said that the North Korean cyber attacks could have netted up to 400 million US dollars worth of digital assets last year. The UN report says that despite crippling sanctions which have prevented North Korea from having nuclear weapons, the rogue state has been developing nuclear and ballistic missile infrastructure. On Friday, the U.S. said that North Korea carried out nine missile tests last month alone. And since then, the U.S. announced that its North Korean representative would meet with Japanese and South Korean officials later this week to discuss the situation. And moving on now to the altcoin news. NFT gaming token Axie Infinity has mounted an impressive fight back over the past few days after a three-month period which has seen the coin in steady decline. Axie is valued at just above US $67 after being valued at US $47 just three days ago, a surge of over 40%. And the likely reason for the sudden steep rise in Axie Infinity's announcement would have a revamped reward structure for its player versus player competition round. And Axie Infinity is a blockchain-based game where players are required to collect and battle little digital creatures called Axies. The game exploded in popularity last year where its value rose incredibly as users around the world took to the game to beat the pandemic woes. And moving on now to today's winners and losers in the past 24 hours. Mean Coin Shiba Inu rose an impressive 23% overnight while Loop Ring rose 15%. And meanwhile, Convex Finance dropped 9% while Render Token fell 6.5%. And thanks for your company on today's Daily Crypto Catch. But that's all for now. Stay tuned to Calcoin TV for the latest market updates, business news and exclusive interviews. Sage signing off for now. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Tourism in China was brought pretty much to a standstill when coronavirus broke out in 2020. Many travel agencies have been forced to close and airlines are suffering huge losses as travel bans were hitting the industry. The first known COVID-19 case was identified in Wuhan in China in December 2019, causing the country to close its doors. China is the world's most populous country with a population of more than 1.4 billion. It spans five geographical time zones and borders 14 different countries the second most of any country in the world after Russia. Tourism has become an essential contributor to China's domestic economy since the beginning of reform when the Chinese government first began to work on reforms designed to turn state-owned enterprises into modern companies back in October 1992. The emergence of a middle class and an easing of movement restrictions for locals and foreign visitors supported a travel boom. The Chinese tourism market has transformed into one of the world's most watched inbound and outbound tourist markets. The number of domestic trips reached 6 billion in 2019 pre-pandemic. 
$2.53 trillion is the projected size of the tourism sector by 2025. The number of inbound and outbound tourists this year is expected to grow 20% year on year, recovering to 20% of the 2019 level. The Winter Olympics in Beijing has also provided a much needed boost to China. Athletes from around the globe are preparing to compete, showcasing China to the world. The 2022 Olympics will be historic for Beijing as it will become the first city to ever host the Summer Olympics and the Winter Olympics. The Chinese capital hosted the Olympics back in 2008. The domestic tourism industry in 2022 is expected to recover to 70% of the pre-pandemic level and the number of trips made in China is estimated to grow 16% to 3.98 billion from last year, according to an industry report. With forecasted sector GDP share expected to be 10.93% by 2025. Now, if you like the information in this video, please like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon and you'll get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Kalkai Media. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks, exclusive to Kalkine TV. In 2022, it's impossible for a business to excel without a strong digital footprint and clear marketing strategy. One company that understands this to a T is Region Branding, a digital marketing agency founded in 2016. At the core of their branding strategy is the concept of emotional resonance, and to explain exactly what that is, Managing Director Hamza Malik joins me live. Hamza, great to have you here this morning. Thanks for inviting me. Look, lovely to have you here with us. Let's start with that simple question. What exactly is emotional resonance in the world of marketing? Emotional resonance is a term that um, I kind of came up with uh, a couple of years ago. It stems from the point that marketing nowadays has gone to numbers based. It's all about, um, you know, like metrics and ROI and KPI. And I really think that how someone feels is the most important thing in marketing. How did you make your customer feel or your client? Did they smile? Did they scoff? Did they widen their eyes? Did they show a friend? And emotional resonance to me is the best way to grow a campaign because whether we like it or not, specifically with social media, uh, the biggest thing are elicit, you know, it's eliciting what they call instant emotions. Mm. Whether that's on one end of the scale or another, you have to make someone feel something, and then that's how your campaign resonates outwards. But ideally, it should be something positive because when you're putting something out in the world as a piece of content, uh, you know, you shouldn't go for sort of quick clicks and uh, inflammatory articles. You should try and put something out that helps people. Yeah, it's a really good perspective. I mean, over here in Australia, we've got uh, a few Maccas commercials which have got these sort of bizarre emotional messages behind them, whether it's uh, one old lady who likes to put pickles in her ice cream, for example, and that's a tradition that gets carried on through the generations in a family. And I don't know why, but my partner, every time she sees it, just bursts into tears, and I'm like, it's a pickle in an ice cream. But, you know, that's for her to decide herself. But certainly, I take your point about emotional resonance in that respect. Now, in your opinion, what are the most important aspects of a successful digital marketing strategy in a modern world which is fair to say very much increasingly digital yeah absolutely uh, things have gone digital but to me that doesn't mean that our entire thinking has to be digitized so weirdly my entire marketing strategy background comes from psychology so mm. I've read psychology books and that has directly translated into what makes a great marketing strategy so you start off with a customer persona who are you trying to target? What are their pain points? What are their problems? How can you delight them? How can you excite them? But then you've got to humble yourself and understand they don't care about you. They don't care about who you are or what you're selling. They just care about how you can help them. So then you've got to think about what's your value proposition. And a lot of the time I see businesses day in and day out, their value proposition is what they think makes them valuable to themselves. And I'm like, okay, so as a customer off the street, I don't care that you've got a 99.8% response rate in January 2019, <laughs> uh, although they're super proud of it. So it's kind of got to be, what can you do for your customer? How can you reach them? And then through the customer persona, you can be like, well, is that Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Tumblr, Reddit? And sometimes it's nothing to do with social media and it's email marketing 
or you can buy space uh, using media planning on other websites, so display marketing as well. And we've even used um, you know, direct mail as well. It still works amazing because if you get a big golden envelope on your, on your mat, you're going to open it. Uh, there's no way someone just chucks that in the bin without opening it to see what it is. So we kind of blend both of them in something we call omni-channel marketing, and that works really well. We're talking a lot about here about getting into the psychology of the consumer itself and also that emotional resonance aspect. Uh, you mentioned their emails. Is it quite difficult to sort of reach that particular point though with an email? I mean, it's, it's kind of just words on a piece of paper essentially. It's not the same as having sort of a, a visual medium or an audio medium where you can, I suppose, use that human emotion. Do you find it's a, a bit more challenging to get that emotional resonance message across in an email, for example? You're right. Um, so if you start off by just like going for the ask in an email, you'll most likely fail because you're right, it's not emotionally charged. Even a video, people will give a couple of seconds because it's interesting and like, you know, 90% of our brain is wired towards visual medium, like it's taking over at the moment. However, at the same time, if you've built a relationship with your customers and you've helped them, then the idea that we, you know, this has worked really well for us, uh, 10 times in a row, we give them value for free. We don't ask for anything. We don't even have a CTA button in the email. We just say, hey, this is something free that we want to give you. Uh, here's a technique, here's a tip, here's a, um, you know, an idea for a strategy that you might want to run. And then we just leave it at that. By the 10th time, we kind of want to be that familiar, um, sort of, you know, not a, not a friend because companies, they shouldn't go towards that. And, and it's really painful when they try and do that, but kind of like, a colleague, kind of like the person at work that you can always rely on for advice. We want to be that person digitally. When you're there, the next thing you say after that, like for example, we'd really appreciate your support. Now it's loaded with emotional resonance mm. because you've given all that help before and people want to give back when they've been helped. We're kind of like very kind as a species, but digital marketers forget that because they try and exploit it rather than nurture it. Is there a recent example you can give me about uh, a campaign that you've worked on where you decided to just throw the numbers away and approach purely from that emotional angle? Uh, yeah, so we worked with uh, a charity last year and they'd never done Facebook ads before and they said, right, what's the KPI, what's the ROI, for every three pounds we need this many donations. And I said, okay, well, consider that, you know, assume you're going to get a good ROI because we'll, we'll make sure of that. Um, but let's start with who are you? Like, what kind of charity are you? Why are you in this space? So we put together some videos about uh, their past, their founder, kind of work they do, uh, the patrons, the people that have actually been helped by this charity into a really nice video. We did a video views campaign and it had no call to action in it at all. It just said, hey, this is who we are. And we did use data to back that up. So this is people that were either in their database or a lookalike of their database, people that went to their website and didn't donate. But we just put out that bit of content and then something else, which was a thank you from the founder himself to say, thanks for just, you know, checking out the chat. We really appreciate it. And then if anyone watched 90% of both of those videos, then the third one was an ask to say, look, we're running a campaign. Here's what it's going to do. Here's where every single penny is going to go to be transparent and coherent. And from that, we generated, um, I think we put in, in, in the end, they kind of ended up wanting to spend more and more. So. We, we spent about eighteen thousand pounds on that, and it generated about two hundred seventy thousand, so just a wow. million. Um, but that's because we we led with emotion, and then we used data to back up. You know, just sort of as a litmus test to make sure we're going in the right direction. No, it's an incredible result for that campaign, that's for sure. Now, Hamza, we've also heard a lot about the metaverse in the past six months. Big companies such as Adidas and Nike have, for example, set up virtual stores within the framework of the metaverse. Do you think this is the next frontier for advertising and how crucial is it to get involved and is Regent Branding looking at the space themselves? Yeah, we've been looking at it for a while when people thought it was really nerdy and uh, <laughs> we were like, I was checking out the first version of the Oculus and looking at what the next version of advertising could be. Um, interestingly, I mean, everyone's talking about this now, but like Barack Obama uh, in 2008, um, they, he, he was smart because he knew where the swing states were and his team purchased advertising in games. So in Madden and Need for Speed, in Need for Speed, when you're driving by and you see a billboard in the game, it was his ad in the game. Uh, wow. And it, it worked a lot because people were like, it's relevant, it's timely, it's in the game, which is kind of like wacky as well. Now, what the metaverse wants to do, and 
just as a side note, they've been working on this for like seven years. So, you know, like Microsoft and Google and Facebook and Apple eventually probably, they've come out with this just now. Uh, they started working on this in like 2015 and they, they already know like what the next three steps are going to be. Um, we are going to be involved in this. However, we're going to wait for the hardware to catch up because we don't jump into places where the users aren't being served. At the moment, the problem I see with the metaverse is that big thing you've got to put on your head and like it's, it's kind of heavy and the graphics aren't great. It's where the internet was in like 1998, super exciting and full of potential. So we want to be part of it, but we're not going to try to monetize it at the moment. We're just going to try and create software and create tools to help push it along. Yeah, it will be interesting to see the next uh, evolution of the hardware. Potentially, we go from one of those big headsets to something more like uh, the Google Glasses, for example, where it's just sitting there on the bridge of your nose. Now, I know you've talked about that charity campaign, which worked wonders, but what would you say some of the most exciting digital campaigns that you worked on in 2021 were? We worked on quite a few. It was kind of, no one knew it was going to happen because of COVID. Um, but when we started 2021, we kind of, it was off with a bang. So we worked with the British Army uh, in, in early 2021. And then very quickly with Direct Line, who wanted to do like a virtual fair for like the, all their employees, rather than gather physically, they wanted to do something virtually. And it was like a, a mental health event, but we built kind of like a, a fun fair that you could access from your laptop. And then you could go to different tents and sort of <laughs> check out what's going on there. We partnered with companies to do that. Um, and then later on in the year, we were lucky enough to work with two or three different charities uh, one of them, it was super exciting, um, different charity than the one mentioned before, but we built a tool to help them get donations in just a swipe and a tap. So we saw the biggest problem with charity websites is that that, that form at the end, that checkout form is so long and so boring. Um, and like, you got to get your card out and get the CVC code. We built a tool in house where you can swipe and tap and it lets you pay by Apple Pay or Google Pay or something called Swipeify. We implemented this on a couple of charity websites and the results were astounding. And that campaign specifically, marketing it was super exciting because we had charities that, you know, they generate a couple of thousand pounds a month and suddenly in a week they've done 30,000 pounds all through this little widget sitting on their homepage that we made. Um, so that was very exciting as well. And then we were lucky enough to work with Illy Coffee uh, in the influencer marketing side and we kind of went to London Coffee Festival and by the end of that I was buzzed because I'd like sampled everyone's coffee um, but that was an amazing campaign that sort of really proved that if you have the right people in the right place at the right time uh, digital marketing can be quite enjoyable. Absolutely. Now, Hamza, in the past, Region Branding has been awarded as one of the top digital companies in the UK by Clutch. What would you say makes Region Branding so unique in the market? Um, so we're different because we're not restricted by location or by um, persona. And what, what I mean by that is firstly by location, we hire anywhere. So we've been fully remote and flexible since day one. So we've cherry picked the best talent from around the world. And, and these guys, like they humble me on a daily basis. So they are the best. Uh, so, you know, if we approach someone and they don't want to be full time with us, they're usually more than happy to be a contractor and you know get get paid generously for a couple of months for a project but we know that that's the best person in that niche using that framework that we can get at the, at the moment so we don't have to go out to job boards and pray and hope that someone lives in a five mile radius to our offices um so the team of about sort of 35 now completely remote completely flexible in that if you get your job done and it's at a good level and you've managed your time and you don't have any deadlines and go home, like enjoy your time. I genuinely want people to enjoy time with their family and friends and follow their hobbies. So, you know, if we're on a tough project, then of course everyone's got to put in the hours and myself included, we're there too late. But, you know, in the time where a job is meant to take three hours and it ends up taking someone one, I'm not going to just make them sit around for two hours. Um, I tell them, look, you know, some of them are in Greece, go to the beach. Some of them are in Spain. It's like, look, just chill out, go outside, go for a walk. Um, so that's what really makes us different. And in terms of persona, um, we've hired people that usually wouldn't get hired at digital agencies. So we're talking about people that are like fresh out of college, huge amount of enthusiasm. Maybe they've tried something in, you know, a little Facebook page here and there. Um, historically, they, the first thing they say is, oh, my God, I can't believe that I'm being invited to an interview because it's tough at the moment and it's very competitive. But I would much rather hire 
an enthusiastic, passionate, honest person rather than someone who's not that passionate, just there for the money and is like really, really good at coding, whatever it is, because I can I can teach and we can support our staff and our um, our contractors in getting to where they need to be. Um, so it's really about the personality rather than just sort of, you know, are you book smart? Well, look, I know the background is obviously marketing, but you've definitely sold that to me. I might actually have to go about and do a, a bit of a sea change and work remotely for you, I think. That sounds like a pretty sweet deal. But uh, just before I let you go, Amza, what's the most niche form of marketing that will outshine all others in 2022? Um, you know, that the guy on earlier, who, who was fantastic, um, he mentioned that personal branding is super important, and he's completely right. But to me, one channel of marketing that's weirdly overlooked are webinars so social media marketing it's saturated and yeah tiktok advertising is really cheap at the moment if anyone hasn't got an advertising campaign on tiktok and their demographic actually lives there do it tomorrow because it's super cheap and then you've got your snapchat and your youtube and everything and yeah that's been around for ages webinar marketing where you can get people virtually in a room and not upsell them, just impart knowledge. And from there, you can get their email address, or you can invite them to a physical event. Just getting people in a room together, there's something incredibly powerful about like-minded people being in one space. Um, so to me, webinar marketing is absolutely huge. And just as a, a small example, like we tested something a little while ago where I have a book on Amazon, and I asked a bunch of people in a webinar, like-minded people, all passionate about helping each other. I said, guys, can you all go onto this page? Because I want to test something about Amazon's algorithm. Because we're like-minded and we want to help each other, we had like a few hundred people go to that page. The book jumps to like the top 20 spot in its niche straight away. <laughs> that doesn't happen if you do Facebook ads because you've got to pay for every click and it's, it takes ages to learn the campaign. So getting people that are like-minded in one space, they want to help each other, they want to see each other thrive, whether that's a webinar, a closed group, a community, a Slack channel, a Telegram group, that is the best form of marketing because then you don't just have customers, you have brand evangelists and eventually maybe even a few friends as well, which is great. Well, look, free plug opportunity for you as well. What's the name of the book? Uh, the book's called Arius Archer and the Shadow Cloak. So it's a young adult fantasy adventure about a boy whose sister's soul is like ripped out of her body on her 13th <laughs> birthday and he's got to go to the land of Philasia to rescue her and from there he sort of learns all sorts of weird and wacky things and there's mystical creatures and fantastical adventures he's got to go on uh if anyone likes like harry potter or narnia or lord of the rings or percy jackson uh they'll really like arius archer i'll tell you what i really like what you are doing with regent branding hamza thank you so much for your time today you're most welcome thank you for yours well that's hamza malik the managing director of regent branding and if you miss any part of that chat then just head across to our youtube channel Kalkai media where you can watch the entire interview and of course don't forget to subscribe i'm james preston reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai. tune in to stay updated while on the move we will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calkine.
Welcome to the Expert Talks Executive Corner by Calkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is from the world's largest holder of self-mined Bitcoin, Canadian Hut 8 Mining Company. And the guest today is Miss Sue Ennis, Vice President at Corporate Development, sorry, for Corporate Development and Head of Investor Relations at Hut 8. And with the market capitalization of Bitcoin now being close to 1.18 trillion, which is larger than Facebook's market capitalization, do we have an interesting show for you. So please keep watching till the end. And we bring you the industry leaders, business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And live today we have Ms. Sue Ennis, Vice President of Corporate Development and Head of Investor Relations. Welcome to the show, Sue. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today speaking with you guys. Well, it's great to meet you and thank you for making time for us amidst your busy schedule. So you are one of North America's largest and most innovative digital asset miners and you have the computing power to match according to what's on your website and that's an amazing position to be in after approximately just four years of trading. Also the first Canadian yeah. mining company to be listed on the TXS and NASDAQ. So what's that's the strategy? Right. So we are, yeah, so we are, as you've said, and so very succinctly, so we're one of the oldest and the largest uh, Bitcoin miners uh, in the industry. And the reason why that matters and why that's something that we really focus on is the fact that we have weathered, obviously, the uptimes and the wonderful bull market cycles, but we've also weathered the uh, down market and bear market cycles that have come in the past with this asset class. And so accordingly, we take a balance sheet first approach to how we manage our business. Um, and that's effectively what's helped us what's helped us uh, keep the lights on during hard times and ultimately thrive during bull markets like we're in right now. Um, so we're one of the OG, you know, original hodlers in this space. That means that we've been mining and holding Bitcoin um, pretty consistently since inception um, at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. Uh, and right now we haven't sold a coin since the beginning of January. So as of our last reported date, we're at about 4,724 Bitcoin on our balance sheet. Um, we're also effectively three Bitcoin and blockchain based businesses in one trade. So we do self mining. We also have a white label hosting business um, and we also have a yield and revenue strategy on top of our health Bitcoin. Um, so, yeah, that's Hut8 Mining in a nutshell. And we're based out of um, Alberta, Canada, which is effectively like the Kuwait of North America. So it's incredibly cold, uh, incredibly windy, incredibly dry, which is um, optimal conditions for mining because the machines do tend to run a little hot. Um, and we recently just stood up actually a third mining site uh, in Northern Ontario in Canada. Again, very cold, um, very windy. And uh, yeah, we're really excited about what the future holds as, as Bitcoin continues to reach all time highs. So yeah. Absolutely. And it's a great time to connect with you at the moment. Not only have Bitcoin and Ethereum both set new all-time highs this month, but Forecast News reported that Hut 8 CEO Jamie Laverton announced the purchase of 12,000 new micro BT mining rigs, amounting to close to 58.7 million US dollars, which will be arriving at a rate of 1,000 rigs a month starting January. So that's big news just in this week. Um, and there have been some big changes to Bitcoin's hash rate earlier this year due to China's regulations partly. How does Hut8 navigate the geopolitical factors that impact the crypto sector? Yeah, so, so we definitely, you know, the geopolitical climate is certainly something we think about, you know, when we're deciding where are we going to grow next? What's our next move in terms of setting up operations and where we're building partnerships? Um, so um, Canada right now is incredibly favorable um, to the to the crypto space. Um, we ask, we actually also have a head of regulatory. Uh, her name is Tanya Woods, and she's an absolute badass lawyer uh, who was pretty instrumental in drafting some of the preliminary blockchain laws in Canada. Um, so we take building relationships with governments and regulators very seriously um, uh, because, you know, we think that that is paramount to making sure that there's thoughtful innovation within a regulatory framework happening in Canada. Um, so, so yeah, we're very cognizant as to sort of what the regulators are thinking and feeling. And we sort of are, you know, that is part of the, our decision-making um, 
strategy when we are deciding where we're going to go next uh, in terms of our business growth. Um, and I will say that one of the things we do love about Alberta is it is traditionally an oil and gas province. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's like it's like the Kuwait of North America. It's incredibly rich in resources. So so we have an incredibly accommodative government there uh, who you know is very welcoming to the jobs that we bring, the income that we bring, um, and understands sort of the, the resources space. So. So yeah, that's a little overview of how, how we look at it. Yes, um, certainly is very wealthy part of the world, Alberta, Canada. So um, at the moment, uh, Texas has been opening its doors to the displaced crypto miners from China. And is it the cost of electricity in Texas that's making mining there more attractive? How does power consumption impact the miners' earnings, please? Yeah, so so it is absolutely pretty much the number one cost of doing business. Um, and so Texas is rife in um, not only oil and natural gas, but also in solar and wind energy. So it, it is a really interesting place. Um, and it makes a lot of sense why people would be setting up shop there. Um, Ted Cruz, uh, I believe, who is the, the main government, the, sorry, one the governor of Texas, is also incredibly pro-crypto and pro-innovation um, in Texas, which is wonderful. That's what you know we want and what we need in this industry in order to ensure that we can thrive and survive and continue to innovate and prosper. Um, so I really think, yeah, it is a combination of the wind um, and the solar power there and um, also just, just the way that their energy markets are made up. Um, what we love, though, about where we are in Alberta and Ontario is that um, we do have a mix of a little bit of solar and wind, but also um, natural gas and our third site is actually behind the fence so it's we negotiated a rate of less than three cents canadian all-inclusive and that's one of the lowest rates in the western hemisphere and it's behind the fence which is again having control over the number one input of doing business aka being able to do business um, and in the case of mining have competitive power at your disposal is incredibly important um, so we're, we're pretty excited and the timing for our third site going up at this price point it's an extra 100 megawatts at le less than three thousand sorry less than three cents canadian uh, per kilowatt hour uh, is is a very big deal and very instrumental in terms of us being able to mine at the lowest cost possible and then obviously you know uh, hodl and um, you know, maintain substantial profit margins. Well, it's great to hear that the crypto industry is is being able to integrate with the regulators, with the government. I mean, it sounds like renewable resources uh, to power your energy is is extremely important to your company, Hut8. And also, I've noticed that a lot of the crypto um, exchanges are working with regulators as well to fight against cybercrime and, and share their insights in relation to how the process works with the regulators, which is, is fantastic to hear as well. And Ethereum 2.0 mm -hmm. is nearing with the transition of Beacon Chain and Bitcoin's taproot will be occurring soon. How are these uh, going to impact the mining operations at HUD8, please? Yeah, so back in, um, I believe it was April, we made a strategic decision to, you know, we will always be core Bitcoin miners, but um, we made a strategic decision to also move into Ethereum mining. And so we were actually one of three customers globally who was able to um, obtain a limited fleet of GPU miners from NVIDIA. Uh, and the strategy right now is um, we're going to be mining Ethereum, but then get be, um, get paid out in Bitcoin on the pool level at a price of less than $3,000 Canadian per Bitcoin. So we're really excited about that. Um, these are cutting edge, edge GPUs. It was a limited fleet, a limited run um, that NVIDIA put out. Again, like I mentioned, we were one of only three global customers who were able to get our hands on this on this particular fleet. So it's, it's like the Ferrari of GPU miners. Um, and before, you know, deciding on this purchase, we modeled it as though and with the assumption that Ethereum would be moving from proof of work to proof of stake within the year. So this is back in April, May. Um, and, you know, what we've been hearing from on the ground and actually what was recently announced is that the, the, the next decision, um, you know, they initially were hoping to go proof of stake for January, but um, it's actually now been pushed to at least May. Um, and so even the way that we've modeled it, uh, it still made economic sense for us to make this pivot and pivot into this this particular um, 
uh, realm of digital asset mining. You know, another thing that we really like about it is let's just say proof of stake, um, you know, does come to fruition in the next six months. Um, we are in a position that we can just simply pivot and mine the next most profitable proof of work GPU based coin. Um, but, you know, another thing that's really exciting is is the fact that, you know, there is also potential case that we do look at instead of, you know, mining Ethereum and then getting paid out in Bitcoin on the pool level at less than $3,000 Canadian per coin. Maybe we do look at potentially hodling at the beginning of January and, you know, uh, looking at a hodl strategy so that we can play in the incredibly exciting decentralized finance space that has a little bit over, I think, 65 billion in locked value at the moment. Um, and some of these really interesting, um, you know, DeFi environments, yield farming protocols that that are continuing to thrive. Um, our head of technology, uh, Jason Zalewski, is also a staking yield farming DeFi master. So he was also very instrumental um, in this decision for us to pivot uh, as well uh, and complement our business operations um, into Ethereum mining. So uh, that was a bit of a long-winded answer, but uh, yeah, we're we're really excited about the opportunity in the space. Um, and even if it moves to proof of stake, we can still, you know, feel very confident about uh, Ethereum is absolutely here to stay. And um, if anything, it will be incredibly bullish for other altcoins, we think so. Absolutely, absolutely. In a, in a segue to what you've just said, I think ThorChain seeing some surging in its price because of that very factor of some of the decentralized yeah. finance um, protocols that it operates within. And yeah. uh, there's going to be a lot of staked Ether that's going to be released um, when Beacon Chain goes live, and, and they've been talking about that for about four years now. And you've just told us that that's going to be further delayed till perhaps May next year. So that's very interesting. Thanks for that information. Yeah, I think the, the hard the hard part is that um, this decision to move from proof of work to proof of stake isn't so much a technological challenge for the for the community, and it's the number two used digital asset in the world. It's it's captured a tremendous amount of market share and ideas and innovation and and is is doing incredible things for the for just the proliferation of, of this industry in general. Um, but so it's, it's not so much of a technology, a technological challenge, but it's more so a governance challenge as well, is that, you know, the community needs to to have consensus in order for this to to move forward. Um, so I, I think it I think it is still a little bit of ways off um, before it actually does happen. And again, we, we just got noticed that it's been pushed to May. So it'll be interesting to see see where it goes. But I certainly do not see a world where Ethereum's ever going away. No. And it'll be interesting to see what the regulators say as well about the liquidity pools. I think they're still deciding about definitions surrounding that and how it relates to dark pools in the regular fiat mm -hmm. markets as well. So, yes, definitely a space to watch. So having one of the largest mining operations and cutting edge technology, how does Hut 8's infrastructure allow them to minimize their carbon footprint? You've mentioned it a little about the renewable resources. Would you mind elaborating? Yeah, absolutely. So we are grid connected in Alberta. Um, so we've got two sites in Alberta, 109 megawatts in production, and then we have a third site coming up that's an extra 100 megawatts of production out of northern Ontario. So in Alberta, um, both of our sites are grid connected. One of them is directly connected to the grid in Medicine Hat, and then the other one, the other site is connected to the grid out of Alberta, which is a mix of about 25% solar and wind. Um, and then this third site is really interesting because we will be um, uh, recycling some of the waste heat to actually melt some of the snow around um, the actual mining operation itself. And um, we, we also have undertaken quite a few um, ESG initiatives and we will be telling the market more about that. But things like, for example, electrifying our vehicles on the ground, um, partnering with a, um, a company that um, instead of uh, are the styrofoam that comes off of a lot of the mining equipment that we receive instead of that going directly to a landfill we've instead partnered with a company that will compress that styrofoam and then actually resell it into the market so looking at ways to also reduce our landfill footprint and then ultimately though um, you know looking at a carbon neutral strategy so for example this third site that we have coming up in, Nor in um, 
Northern Ontario and Canada is going to be carbon neutral by 2023. So those are just sort of high level, some of the things that we're looking at um, from an ESG perspective. And again, we really do consider the environment a stakeholder and a shareholder in our business. Um, and so being incredibly thoughtful about that footprint is something that we're incredibly committed to. And we'll certainly be updating the market more about that uh, moving well, forward. Congratulations. That sounds like a fantastic strategy and adding to the circular economy sounds great. Um, do you think the GPU supply chain crunch will have an impact on your operations? You mentioned that you've got in there with um, some of the fastest GPU processes available, um, but how do you think it's going to impact in the long run? Yeah, so there certainly is um, a supply chain constraint just across the board for, for everyone, um, and obviously not just exclusive to the mining space. Um, it's it's really happening everywhere uh, across multiple industries. Um, but one of the things that we have done um, to at least sort of mitigate for that is we actually have strengthened our relationship with MicroBT that is one of the um, largest suppliers of mining manufacturing equipment. So we are now um, the only authorized MicroBT repair shop in Canada. And so what that means is that uh, we will be uh, servicing uh, other miners and MicroBT equipment in North America and also Northern Europe. And ultimately what that means is that we do have um, more access to parts and machine parts at cost. We are a little bit closer to that supply chain. Um, you know, we do have an incredible relationship and we absolutely love our friends at MicroBT. So, so, so being strategic in terms of how we positioned ourselves to be a little bit closer to that supply chain has certainly helped us. Um, and, you know, just in general, being incredibly creative and, and looking at how many different ways can we possibly diversify this business and earn as much, um, uh, multiple different avenues of ancillary revenue so that we can continue to be core Bitcoin miners uh, has also been a priority for us as well. And um, yeah, we're, you know, we do think the future is bright and that the supply chain uh, situations will resolve it. This, that's, you know, it, it does take a little bit of creative sort of planning though at the moment. Absolutely. And, and thank you so much for connecting with us today, because although the crypto um, sector is emerging to the mainstream, to a lot of people, there still exists a massive gulf. And uh, sharing your uh, insights today has really helped to raise awareness about the ins and outs of operating a Bitcoin mining company. So thank you so much. We really do appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me. It was an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much again for making time for the show. And if you've just joined us, we have just had a very informative discussion with Ms. Sue Ennis, Vice President of Corporate Development and Investor Relations at Hard 8 Mining. Please watch the full interview on YouTube at Calkine Media and stay watching for more expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. IDEX Crypto has gained some attention after it announced its listing of Synapse Protocol on the IDEX V3 market, which is said to be the world's first hybrid liquidity decentralized exchange. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields reporting for Calcai Media. The price of this cryptocurrency shot up 41% in the last couple of days, while its market cap was sent 37% higher to over $100 million. On top of that, IDEX Crypto recorded a surge of over 650% in its one-day volume, although it's since taken a bit of a dive. But first of all, what is IDEX? Well, it does claim to be the first hybrid liquidity, DEX or DEX, and its token goes by the same name. IDEX combines efficient order book and matching with automated market making. 
AMMs are an integral part of DEXs and they remove any intermediaries in trading virtual currencies. IDEX mixes centralized and decentralized exchanges and enables users to get the best of the spreads and avoid failed transactions. According to the platform's white paper, the exchange is unique as it offers an off-chain trading engine and it helps to achieve extreme performance. IDEX is capable of processing tens of thousands of orders per second and the majority of the decentralized exchanges are on-chain and they experience high latency with blockchain transactions. IDEX also claims that users get the benefit of no failed trades on its platform. When a trade fails in a DEX, it leads to wasted gas fees. The exchange confirms orders instantly, which helps users to get the best price. IDEX Crypto has a total supply of 1 billion tokens, and its circulating supply is 635 million or thereabouts. According to CoinMarketCap, it currently ranks number 368 or thereabouts. You can find the crypto on exchanges like Uniswap, V2, Binance, Balancer, and Gate.io. What's your take on IDEX? Let us know in the comments, and as always, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Kakai Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge-watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no-buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hello, I'm Rachel Jones and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Wayne Patterson. Now Wayne is the CEO of Antares. Antares is a structural heart company creating the world's most durable heart valve. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Welcome, Wayne, to Calkine. Good morning, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Good to speak with you today. Now, such a fascinating company. Firstly, could you introduce Antares to our audience and tell us about the powerful work that you are doing? Sure, thank you. Yeah, look, we're, we're very proud of Antares um, in what's been achieved in the last several years. But Antares, as you mentioned, is a, a company in uh, a space known as a structural heart space. Predominantly, we treat a disease called aortic stenosis. This is quite a serious disease, um, uh, affects folks from their mid-60s and beyond. Um, and when this disease gets to the severe state, the mortality rate is about 50% after two years. Um, there, are, there are several products to, uh, to treat this particular condition, but the only way you can treat this condition is to actually go into the heart, take out or replace that aortic valve with a new one. There's no pharmacotherapy to treat this disease. Uh, and there are a couple of players with, uh, with older uh, products in the market. We've come at this with a completely different approach uh, to that market, and we believe, uh, as do the doctors we work if, with, that this is, in fact, a product that is very much needed right now for these younger patients who, who are starting off with this disease. Uh, when we've got some very unique and novel technologies that have been developed in Australia, uh, and we're very proud that uh, you know we probably have a technology here, an Australian uh, design and built technology that will be a global product, uh, helping out thousands of patients around the world in the years ahead. Sounds absolutely life-saving there, Wayne. And can you tell us about the recent progress achieved by Antares? 
Sure. So developing a medical product that goes into patients is obviously a, a long and arduous task and, and, and certainly can be. I've spent most of my career uh, globally in healthcare. Um, the achievements, particularly in the last 12 months, have been significant. Uh, we have had um, a fantastic group of doctors working with us on our medical advisory board for the last several years. As we've transitioned from developing our, um, our ADAPT technology, which is where we started, into, a, into the world's first 3D aortic valve for, uh, for replacement by a catheter, uh, that's a world first. Um, and getting that through the animal studies, of course, through all the design tech uh, briefs that we have to go through and into humans uh, is quite an achievement. Now, we are on the precipice as we speak of entering our first human studies uh, for this catheter-based valve, uh, and FDA approval of that study is, is imminent within the next quarter. That's great news. Now, as the world continues to battle the coronavirus pandemic, how has this escalated next generation technologies in the healthcare sector, do you believe? So I think, um, you know, the healthcare space all over the world um, has clearly been moving during the pandemic. Um, and observing from where I do, having spent my whole career in, in the global space, I've seen a lot of shift in investments, uh, both in and out in the last several years. Of course, companies who make vaccines or the promise of vaccines or diagnostics are getting a lot of, a lot of support, but not just those companies. In healthcare, there is a big shift towards digital healthcare, uh, telemedicine, uh, real hospital in the home kind of stuff that I see. And also I think I've seen movements of capital away from companies who may have been on the market for many, many years, um, developing healthcare products and not quite getting there and moving into more interesting uh, and, and very current companies that are developing things very quickly, such as Anteris. So the money's there, it's, it's happening a lot. The, the obvious choices of vaccine companies are getting a lot of attention, but I think also this whole shift away from being in person not only in the workplace, but certainly uh, from a, a doctor point of view, is going to really go up in, in the next few years. And the digital health space is just booming right now. So with that being said, do you believe the pandemic has been a help or a hindrance for healthcare funding? I think it has generated a lot of funding um, simply because the demand and the need is there. Obviously, we have had hospitals, uh, certainly here in the US, but of course everywhere, stretched to their their breaking point uh with with caseload uh we thought we were coming through that then the delta variant started to come in of course and that that created more problems so i think uh necessity is the mother of invention and because of that um sheer volume drive on the hospital and on the whole healthcare system across the world it's created new opportunities and new technologies so i think it, it it's been helpful in the fact that it's helped generate new ideas um, and those ideas uh, may have taken longer to come if we didn't have the pandemic. And I think a lot of them are good. And that's driven capital into these spaces to get those ideas to market as quickly as possible. There are obviously a lot of downsides to the pandemic, uh, too numerous to mention. But certainly it's driving innovation and creativity, uh, definitely in healthcare. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about product development now. When you are developing a product, what's one of the most important aspects that you have to keep in mind? Well, in the healthcare space, um, it's hands down clinical superiority. Uh, you want to be altruistic to the point that if your product is going to be superior to what's available, um, you know, help humanity if, if you like, um, then it's going to be profitable. And I think that's the way we look at it. Uh, my whole career, I've brought a lot of drugs to market globally. Um, you always have that perspective. There is obviously shareholders and there is a profit basis behind all of this. But if your product's not clinically superior, um, if you're not going to move the needle in your given space for us, aortic stenosis, uh, then there's no point in really doing that. And therefore, in our company particularly, we've got a lot of really incredibly creative technical people in the medical side, on the engineering side, and their sole purpose is to bring something to market that's better than what's already there, not a me too. Um, and in doing so, they're going to bring a solution that is uh, more valuable for the physicians and certainly more valuable for the patients, particularly uh, in our case, where we're bringing something very different. We're bringing a valve that actually brings these patients to a pre-diseased state, um, it, which is not possible with the current products in the market. It doesn't bring you out of the disease. It just makes the symptoms a little bit better. Um, and not only that, it's a valve that seems to be lasting a whole lot longer than what the current alternatives are. 
uh, because of its novel 3D unibody design. So that innovation is really going to end up driving clinical benefits, patient benefits, uh, and ultimately that will bring uh, returns and rewards for shareholders as well. And from the time you embarked on the journey to where you stand today, what do you believe has been the biggest achievement of Anteras? So I was fortunate when I was sitting on the board, um, we had a, a technology that was being utilized in a different area to where we are now. It's a very good technology, it's a global technology. And frankly, most small companies aren't lucky enough to have this kind of big market technology. It's called ADAPT. Um, and we were operating in a space worth about $50 million of surgical repair. Now, I believe the biggest achievement was when we divested some peripheral businesses and focused the company very much into the structural heart space. And we took a, took a gamble on this, taking that one technology and turning it into three or four different technologies that would move the game forward in this particular space. And that gamble's paid off. So I'm, I'm really proud of the technology that we had. I'm proud that it's Australian. Uh, I'm proud of what the team has achieved. And we're now, you know, we've gone through our animal work, we've gone through, we've, we've implanted cadavers, we've gone through the whole process of bringing it to market. We've been in liaison with the FDA on our submissions. Um, and so we're about to go to humans uh, very, very shortly with this product. Um, and we know what the results generally going to be because it's been so thoroughly tested. Uh, and I think that's just a massive achievement. Um, you know, Australia has some great healthcare companies and I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that Anteris in the years ahead will be another one of those big, really good uh, Australian healthcare stories. Let's hope so. And just finally, Wayne, how do you envision the healthcare industry to innovate and expand in the upcoming years? Yeah, I look, as you know, populations get older, and this is something I contemplated again um, in the pharmaceutical space where I worked prior to this. Um, you know, how do you deal with these aging populations? The shift in demographics uh, is something that I think has been front and center to the healthcare discussions uh, for many, many years. Um, I started my career in Australia in the healthcare space, uh, and Australia was, in fact, leading the world on discussions around health economics. So we're quite advanced down there. And have been and i think what's really happening is this shift away from hospital-based care uh, where you can uh, obviously there's the necessity for hospital-based care for certain diseases uh, has been accelerating over the years and i think the innovation is really going to come from um you know having people being able to be, to be treated in their homes staying in their homes longer um, having the elderly um, stay out of uh, hospitals and nursing homes where possible through telemedicine and things we talked about before. But also the therapeutics are improving quite a lot. We're kind of, in some cases, shifting away from treating symptoms to actually presenting uh, cures, um, which wasn't always the case with pharmacotherapy in the, in the years 60s, 70s and 80s. A lot of what we brought to market was simply to treat a symptom, uh, which of course is important, but we, we weren't, there weren't that many cures. Um, and Enteros, I think, is a good example of that, uh, where we're in a space where the product we bring to market could actually potentially be a functional cure for this disease where there is not one at the moment. So you see a lot more of that, but I think the hospital in the home kind of setting is, is going to be the biggest shift that we see in the next decade or so, where it becomes really, truly viable that patients can actually be treated from the, uh, from the sanctity of their own lounge room. Well, it sounds fabulous. Thank you so much for the formidable work that you are doing there, Wayne, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate the time. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for now, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calpine. Morning pass, please. Hi, I'm Holly Shields, and I'll be your host for Calkine TV's new show, Travel Insights. Tune in to get the latest developments in the travel and tourism space, from updates on restrictions to travel guides to info about recreation and outdoor activities, or tour guides to the financials of the sector. Though the travel industry has been hit hard from the pandemic, there is still potential left for a revival on the back of economic upturn and COVID safe travel measures. So if you want to know where the travel and tourism space is heading, dust off your passports, pack your bags and watch Travel Insights every Monday exclusively on Calkine TV.
When it comes to cryptocurrencies and blockchains, both usually seem inseparable and blockchain networks, including Ethereum, Phantom and Solana, are competing to offer decentralized app services to developers. There is a cryptocurrency that claims to be based on distributed ledger, but not blockchain. And this article was written by Kalkine's team of writers. I'm happy to present it to you on their behalf today. Please subscribe to the channel and keep watching to find out more. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. So here, the founders claim that blocks are never created, which means there are no fees for costs involved in the validation of transaction. And well, that's something unprecedented, isn't it? So let's get to know about this protocol a little better. So what is the IOTA network? IOTA has a distributed ledger called Tangle, which it claims is both open and scalable. The biggest unique selling proposition of the IOTA crypto project is a validation without any fees. The network steers clear of blockchain and there's said to be no miners. A user who sends a transaction to the network does it without any costs and in turn validates a couple of other transactions. Though IOTA has no block creations, it claims that the data and records are immutable. The network uses a minimal amount of energy and transactions are processed faster. And that said, it claims to have a globally distributed network at the heart of all data exchange. Now coming to the MyOta crypto. So what is the MyOta crypto? The MyOta token is the cryptocurrency linked to IOTA's distributed ledger project. And MyOta can be traded on exchanges like Binance and Bitfinex. Is the IOTA cryptocurrency a good investment? The IOTA crypto is linked to a project that claims to use a distributed ledger without creating any blocks. And this is in stark contrast to the blockchain networks of Ethereum, Solana, and the other popular cryptos. The IOTA network projects itself as an enabler for the Internet of Things or IoT ecosystem. Blockchain networks have their sets of drawbacks as well though, like high gas fees and energy usage. If any network like IOTA can genuinely overcome these weaknesses while simultaneously providing a secure and globally distributed network, the linked token may surge in value. IOTA Crypto Price Prediction IOTA ranks among the top 50 crypto assets in terms of market cap on Queen Market Cap. The IoT crypto has a market cap of nearly 2.3 billion US dollars as of now, and it is trading at nearly 84 cents US a piece. So very recently, the IoT crypto trading volume has soared by almost 50%. And if the IoT network can find takers for its blockchainless distributed ledger, the IoT crypto may touch US $2 by the end of the first quarter. So in conclusion, IOTA is a distinct cryptocurrency project that claims to work without blocks. The technology has yet to prove its utility with it. Why the IOTA crypto hasn't had a sustainable rally. If the tech is favored by developers, the prices may surge in the medium term. Thanks for joining us on the report. And if you do like this information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel Press that bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos by Calkine. But for more articles like this, there is a website, it's calkinemedia.com. And my name's Sage for Calkine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next what the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. 
Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. According to chain analysis reports, illicit activities grew by 82% in 2021 and about 7.8 billion US dollars worth of cryptocurrencies were stolen from investors. Let's take a look at three such pyramid schemes that have hurt the investors and crypto enthusiasts. And this article was written by Calkine's team of writers. I'm happy to present it to you on their behalf. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Dubai Coin. Dubai Coin was a form of pyramid scheme that had hit the crypto market last year. In May 2021, the fake crypto coin hit the headlines after it was reported that a UAE based company named Arabian Chain Technology had launched the token. Soon a new release was sent out that Dubai will get its own central bank digital currency called Dubai Coin. The prices of non-existent DBIX soared by over 1,000% within 24 hours of its virtual existence. The Dubai officials immediately cleared the air that it hadn't approved such a token. And later it was proved that it was indeed a scam whose primary aim was to entirely take away the savings of the investors and personal data of several traders and investors. Brazil's New Egypt in January 2022, another form of pyramid scheme rocked the crypto market, witnessing a bearish phase. And as per a news report by the Associated Press, Brazil's police arrested two men and a woman for robbing millions of their hard-earned money. It was reported that the accused were held with 7 million reais, Brazil's currency, which equates to US $1.3 million, in neatly packed bills in Rio de Janeiro. The detainees were employees of GAS Consulting and Technology, a cryptocurrency investment firm founded by Gladeson Acasio dos Santos. Police said that the company managed to increase their earnings to US $7 billion between 2015 and mid-2021 through a Bitcoin-based Ponzi scheme that promised investors 10% monthly returns. However, things came to a halt when Rio police seized the money at the helipad of the Insolito Boutique Hotel, and this prompted an investigation into Dos Santos's business. Now, later, the federal police raided Dos Santos's home and collected 13.8 million reais and finally arrested him. One coin. This was perhaps the longest running pyramid scheme of the crypto industry. One coin founded by the Bulgarian fraudster Ruya Ignatova alias Crypto Queen, managed to lure investors between 2014 and 2019. Dubbed as the Bitcoin killer, the scheme has defrauded investors of a whopping amount of 5.8 billion US dollars. The scheme modus operandi was members who brought in new members who were then compensated with cash rewards and this gave them a mirage of a large business venture. However, OneCoin was never a blockchain based crypto coin, so whatever amount of fake tokens the investors held was virtually worthless and the US government cracked down the operations and leveled charges against the management. So in conclusion, with the crypto market getting bigger and bigger, investors and authorities must be extra vigilant about such pyramid schemes. And these examples indicate that illicit market players with evil intentions will take advantage of investors' savings. Still, one should be careful with the investments and do in-depth research before moving. If you like this information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel and press that bell icon. You'll be notified of the latest videos by Calkine. For more articles like this, do check out the website calkinemedia.com. And my name's Sage for Calkine Media. Hello and thanks for joining us. Great to have your company here on Calkai TV. I'm Holly and you're watching The Buzzing Trends. Today we're looking at why healthcare companies Respiri and Protometics, its national laboratories, are on investors' radar. 
First up, Respiri is an Australian e-health player that mainly focuses on offering respiratory disease management solutions. The company's shares have been trading strongly on the ASX as it secured a second order for its Weezo device. RSH announced that its first partner, M Telehealth, has placed the second order for the devices in order to convert high-level interest expressed earlier with the Weezo RPM solution. Respiri expects the second order to add approximately $24,000 US dollars in revenue to the company, excluding the first order value worth $150,000 placed in 2021. Although the company does not consider the second order to be of financial interest to their business. Rather, it expects that the strategic move by M Telehealth will help the senior decision makers in the healthcare sector to understand more about the benefits of Weezo. This will, of course, also help RSH achieve a long term goal of making more M Telehealth customers adopt Weezo and increase sales in the future. However, Respiri is still unable to predict its estimated revenue at this point in time as its future sales are dependent upon internal review, testing and outcomes of a pilot study. The company is currently trading at 0.052 cents per share. And then next is Protometics International Laboratories, who announced the completion of their validation study with QIMR. Bofuku Medical Research Institute. The study was designed to target esophageal adenocarcinoma, the most common esophageal cancer in Australia. And Protomedics International is currently collaborating with QIMR Burgo for, to develop a simple blood test for the treatment. This will require the usage of a panel of biomakers protein fingerprints in the blood which QIMR Burgo for researchers initially identified. The aim of analysis was to demonstrate the strength of the biomakers across laboratories through a series of analytical and clinical validation experiments. And Protomix International stock is currently trading at $1.07 a share. Well, that is all for now, but tune in next time on The Buzzing Trends or only on Calkine TV. This is Holly Shield signing off. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what... Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Mo Hamduna. Mo is the founder of MoWorks. MoWorks is a full service independent creative agency. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hello, Mo. Good to speak with you today. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. No problem. Very interested to hear more about Mo Works. So, could you explain for our audience a little bit more about what you do? Sure. So, um, we run an agency here. We, we're based in Docklands. We work with our clients um, in three, uh, three key aspects. We work with the clients who potentially uh, utilize some form of a digital product as part of their solution. Uh, so, either uh, an application, a web app, an e-commerce, or uh, a SaaS product. Um, and then we help with them. We work with them on uh, aspect of the, the brand itself, uh, building uh, the strategy behind it, then the design and development or the innovation aspect of the product itself, and then helping uh, take it to, to, to market. 
And Mo, what do you believe are the key drivers to help a company to build a distinctive brand? Um, a distinctive brand. So uh, I believe a key aspect to build uh, a strong and distinctive brand uh, nowadays is really by having a more inclusive brand, a brand that really embraces the diversity of its people, the, the diversity of the the customer you bring in your brand to, and of course the community that's surrounding your business or, or the product itself. So, by inclusivity, I um, um, this inclusivity can be really reflected in um, in the core of the brand, like in the vision itself, in the value that you have. Um, it can also, as part of the positioning of the brand, like once you understand your include your your consumer base and how diverse they are, and you build an inclusive brand, this can be uh, reflected in the positioning of it and in the persona of the brand itself. So how do you help your clients build on their business strategies and help them to realize their ideas? Um, I mean, with this question, um, I believe it can be answered in many ways because we, um, if, if we want to build uh, or to help out work with our client in building strategy around their brand itself. So um, here it's more we take it to really uh, understand uh, uh, the, the problem they, they here trying to solve, the, um, the current uh, um, status of the market itself and understand really how they see themselves fit. Are they more uh, looking to be uh, a brand that uh, have high quality but really low in prices like some, like Google or Amazon you, you know they're competing in prices at the same time they're not compromising the quality or the expectation or are you more trying to be a premium product uh, with premium prices so uh, there's lots of things come in place if you want to think of it from um, I would say uh, a brand point of view but if you also want to strategize or you want to think of um, strategies for um, um, how you can bring your ideas uh, to life um, or what sort of idea you should explore and, um, and implement. Here potentially we, we work with them in, um, in more some form of a discovery phase where uh, we can work with their uh, front of the front staff um, they have uh, to understand uh, the pain point they're facing, um, etc. And in today's highly competitive business market, a user-centric approach is a must. How can businesses implement user-centric innovation techniques and strategies? Yep. Perfect. So this actually relates back to the last point I was talking about. So if you want to implement, uh, as you said, the user-centric uh, techniques, basically, it's really you want to go to, uh, as simple as going back to the to the users. Now, going back to consumers too early, sometimes it can backfire uh, because not every all consumers understand what they need if they don't see it just yet. So I believe a good approach usually is by chatting to. Uh, your front staff, the staff that really dealing and dealing on a daily basis with their your consumer, because usually your your front staff have their own pain by this uh, daily interaction with the consumers, or they actually see the pain or hear it from the consumer themselves. So I believe it's always a great start. It's by going to your um, your employee who interact on a daily basis with the consumer. Another way to, uh, in uh, implementing uh, a user-centric uh, technique is really by checking other complementary um, industries, not particularly your industry. So you can look at something similar or uh, can be complementary to your space or not. And just really and see how they innovate. How what what is new in that industry? Uh, what the stuff that they brought in and it's doing a mass success? And see how you can bring this into your own industry. And we've seen this one like with our clients um, in either in the construction sp uh, space or solar or safety. We've been looking at other industries such as retail, e-commerce, fintech, and we're seeing what been happening in that space that 
booming for them that doing great result uh, showing lots of innovation and then we are bringing them into those let's say less digitized uh, industries and see okay this is it's a, a new concept it's an, a new it's been tested but in another industry and maybe it's time to test it in in this space itself like in the solar or in a b2b construction space etc now, in relation to the pandemic, what have you witnessed regarding businesses moving to meet the demands of the transforming digital world? Look, um, at this stage, I believe it's almost clear for all of us how, how many things has changed. Like we've been mo mo over a year uh, on it and um, uh, it's quite obvious that things like majority of the consumers and businesses are more tech savvy. Uh, everyone understand how to navigate their way through QR codes, through Zoom calls, etc. So, so this is one of the most important things. Is really, it pushed people. I believe that were hesitant or to to change, hesitant to digitize lots of um, um, of aspect of their business, and pushed them to 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 do that change. And once, I believe, once they've been in the change now for over a year, most of them they start recognizing how actually it's it's more comfortable in the digital world um, and it's easier to do business it's cutting lots of the stuff that is unwanted um, um, and we saw changes in how you do grocery in how you do learning in how you do the telehealth qr code majority of these stuff uh, are here to stay this is i believe are one of the biggest changes that uh, is happening currently to the australian market uh, and its consumers um, for us, for example, at MoWorks, we saw also um, a different type of request from our clients. And this has really been, um, I don't want to say shocking, but it's, uh, it was expected, but was really great to see that. Now, uh, last year, we built an, an app, for example, for telehealth that connect uh, uh, people with pharmacists to issue uh, a medical certificate. Uh, we also worked on in a new project to uh, digitize an event, business event uh, business into a virtual events um, and help different businesses who just start digitizing their processes to allow their, their team to work from anywhere, from home, etc. Well, it's such a great space to be working in. Thank you so much for explaining Mo Works to us, Mo. No worries. Thank you for having me. And thank you for your time today. With that, I will sign off, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market, as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Kalkine. Earnings season is when most quarterly corporate earnings are released to the public, such as earnings per share, revenue, and other important financial aspects from companies. Every earnings season starts one or two weeks after the previous month of each quarter. The earnings of some ASX-listed companies are reported twice in a year. First in February, which offers a glimpse as to what the end of December figures were, and in August, which follows till the Australian end of financial year on June the 30th. During this time, companies can see a change in shares as the market responds to the latest data. Earnings season is a great way for investors to get the latest information related to a company. It also helps investors understand a company's financial health and its long-term point of view. 
Businesses are compelled to disclose their entire accounts, allowing investors to look under their financial book. Earnings season also creates opportunities for investors to find new companies or take advantage of inactive share prices. Now, if you like this information, please like, share and comment on this video. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and pressing the bell icon will give you notifications of our latest videos. I'm Rachel for Calkine Media. Welcome to Expert Talks, the executive corner by Calkine TV, Sage here. And today's guest is Mr. Ben Lakoff, co-founder of Charged Particles. He's also the business lead. And he'll share with us the insights as the founder of a groundbreaking NFT protocol that's sparking a DeFi revolution. The internet has been enabling the exchange of endlessly rep reproducible ideas, sounds, and images and words you may have noticed. And they were all open to the copy-paste function that computers offer. And NFTs are showing us that the future provides a different scenario where everything is tokenized and ownership is recorded and it's for sale. So to find out more, stay watching till the end. And as you know, we bring you the industry advocates and successful business owners to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And bringing you live today, we have Mr. Ben Lakoff, co-founder and business lead of Charged Particles. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. It's a pleasure to e meet you, and we need to make the most of your time, so let's get started. Um, you're the co-founder and business lead of Charged Particles. That sounds like a gr brilliant position to be in. Um, how did you find yourself in this position, and what opportunities did you come across along your DeFi journey? Yeah, sure. Uh, my background's in finance. I've been in the crypto space uh, since 2017. Um, so ended up meeting Rob Secord, who's the uh, other co-founder. He was the original founder and visionary of Charge Particles. And uh, yeah, NFTs are pretty hot right now, but he was dreaming about this thing in late 2019. Um, our Twitter user, our Twitter handle is DeFi NFT. So long before DeFi really was a thing, let alone DeFi and NFT, the convergence. So pretty forward thinking in this space and uh, excited to be here. and working with all these awesome people. Wow, fantastic. Thank you for sharing your story with us. So you just mentioned it a few years ago, like in 2018, no one was really talking about NFTs, yet they existed. And now they seem to be the talk of the town. What do you think has led to this? Is it the community aspect related to this space that stirred the interest? Uh, yeah, that's a lot of it. I mean, um, NFTs are just non-fungible tokens. So it's a token that is not fungible. It's a unique token. So this has its first kind of mainstream adoption and awareness around media files, like you said in the intro. So uh, these in infinitely replicable content, like a, a picture or an audio file or any sort of digital media can now be made provably unique and given this home and this um, proof of uniqueness on the blockchain. So they've been a thing since 2017, but I think there were a number of more like infrastructural pieces that needed to happen before um, sort of mainstream adoption. And I think there's a number of fa factors here with the rise of cryptocurrencies, more and more people know about it, more and more people have had gains. So maybe they're looking to into some new potential niche within the cryptocurrency space um, and all of these, the and, and then COVID, um, so uh, lots of artists kind of losing their their revenue model. Um, all of these kind of factors converged as like the perfect storm to get people more and more interested with um, NFTs as they currently are, that's for sure. Sure, and it seems that it does attract uh, people who are interested in arts, but it also is a very welcoming space where people are encouraged to join in and, and people are welcomed by the artists to get involved and, and jump on the platforms and connect, such as Discord and, and uh, Medium and things like that. So your Charged Particles protocol is unique as it allows people to mint their own NFTs. Can you talk us through this, please? Yeah, sure. So. An NFT is just attaching a media file to a unique token. 
ERC721 or 1155, this is a token standard that just says this is a unique token. So charge particles, yes, we do allow users to mint NFTs, create NFTs, so take this digital file, attach an a, a, a ERC721 token to it and say, this media file is now associated with this token. It is now provably unique on the blockchain. Uh, but that's not really the unique aspect that we do. Uh, there are many platforms that allow this. Um, we are free to mint. There's no fees or anything like that. We're on layer one and layer two. So you have this other cheaper, easier option. Um, but what we allow you to do is take your NFT and picture it as a basket or a container that allows it to hold other assets in a programmatic way. So with art, this could look like me creating a piece of art and putting my own social token time locked into it for a year, um, a bit a, a bit like a bond perhaps, but um, it's, it's converting this uh, financial aspects uh, with NFTs and certainly art. But then when thinking a little bit more broadly of NFTs as not just art, as in-game items, as financial products, as tickets, as virtual real estate, as um, identity perhaps, all of these things as a container, being able to hold other digital assets, uh, like like uh, whatever type of crypto in a programmatic way, that's when things get really, really interesting. So we are an NFT protocol then uh, that allows users to take their NFT and put things inside of it. Fantastic. And, and it's very cost effective. Apparently there are no fees involved with this process from charged particles, but there are some uh, gassing fees, is that correct, that the uh, artists who come on board have to pay? Yes, correct. So um, Ethereum works a bit like Uber surge pricing. So if a lot of people are driving Uber, the surge pricing kind of adjusts the price up until less people are wanting it. Um, you can think of Ethereum and gas uh, in a similar manner. So during periods of high traffic, when a lot of people are using the network, uh, gas fees are more expensive and can be quite costly. And during periods where there is like less traffic, traffic and use on the on on, on um, the blockchain, the fees can be smaller. So yes, you have to pay gas fees, um, but there are no additional fees from charge particles or anything like that right now. Great. And um, could you just quickly tell us about any real world situations where this system's being used to create liquidity in the market for artists? Yeah, sure. So I, I mean, we went. We've had a proof of concept since uh, early 2020, so a year and a half now. And since early 2021, we've been live on mainnet and kind of mid 2021 uh, on layer two Polygon. Um, and we've had a lot of really, really interesting, um, innovative artwork been done on our platform, uh, pieces uh, that are generating interest and the interest going to charity. Um, just recently, we had this community initiative where we, we would get an NFT and pass it along. It was called Pass the Particle. Each person would deposit another NFT inside of it. At the end, we had like 15 NFTs. We sold this and we donated all the money to charity. So there's a, a lot of different, it, we're giving artists the tools to be truly, truly unique and create this have this this dashboard of tools that are only available at a place like Charge Particles to create truly unique pieces of digital art. That's fantastic. I'm sending my artist friends, digital artist friends, your way starting today. And is it true that the protocol involves use of dApps? Um, so that's similar to smart contracts from my understanding, is that correct? And correct. how is this yeah. related? So, uh, I was just going to ask how it relates to the question no, so, of liquidity. <laughs> no worries, we have a, a little bit of a lag. Um, oh. So charge particles, we're we're a protocol, and then on top of this protocol, we've built our, our first D app, decentralized application. So this is just a front end for users to interact with the protocol in one specific way. So our D app allows users to create art, list on a marketplace, and do a number of other things. But in the future, we plan to have additional D apps built on top of our protocol, uh, targeting different niches within the NFT space uh, that is in more uniquely enabled by a charge particle protocol. 
Fantastic. Sounds like a very exciting time to be talking to you. So I was just wondering um, about the creation of liquidity through staking. How is the DAP related to staking of, of tokens? Yeah, sure. So there's, um, I mean, people say the crypto rabbit hole quite a bit, right? Because you talk about one little thing and before you know it, you're in like this uh, purgatory of um, uh, definitions. But uh, <laughs> there's there's a thing called staking, which traditionally would be something like proof of stake um, and part of the consensus mechanism of a type of blockchain. But when people are talking about staking with DeFi, a lot of times what they're referring to is the 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 act of taking tokens and putting them into a smart contract and then that protocol can be rewarding you for putting your tokens in that smart contract so you could be putting your tokens in this smart contract to participate in voting which is what we're doing at charge particles but then you have these borrowing and lending protocols so an entire an, an entire section of a bank has been replaced by a few smart contracts i take my eth or my crypto that i have I put $100 into the smart contract, and then I'm able to pull an $80 loan completely trustlessly without interacting with anybody with a few clicks of a button and paying a little bit of gas. Then I have this $80 to go and do whatever I want with. If the price of that collateral goes down, they keep that $100 of ETH that I've put in there, and I keep this $80, and it's all happening with a few clicks and in a completely censorship-resistant manner that um, you know has the characteristics of of these unstoppable blockchains and protocols. So um, it's certainly certainly really exciting. Well, I, I can see the positive side to this. I'd love to see the world working that way, and hopefully we can keep on moving towards making this this style of transacting. Um, just more common and more easy to understand and hopefully that's why conversations like this help to raise awareness and more people get involved and it becomes mainstream so um you have some new partnerships on the horizon we have to start winding up the discussion and i appreciate your time so much today could you tell us a little bit about what's in the pipeline for charge particles in the near future and and your new partnerships yeah, sure. So, I mean, for protocols, we are a protocol. We are an NFT protocol. So a lot of these partnerships um, are with different niches within the NFT space and kind of prepping us for this protocol first mentality. So partnering with different games and the idea of a game, being able to leverage charge particle technology, you have an in-game item that is able to hold a, a another token that's increasing value that equates to the power of the sword. Like there's there's a lot that you can do there. And when thinking about NFTs is not just art, but you have metaverse, you have uh, financial products, you have in-game items, you have tickets, you have all of these things, gift cards, whatever you want. Um, a lot of our upcoming partnerships are kind of uh, spreading around that. Uh, we've started to organize ourselves into guilds, focusing on each of these different niches. So. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot coming up, that's for sure, and we'll there's a lot going on, which is really exciting and fun. Yeah, what a great space to work in. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Um, apparently, you have an artist onboarding uh, personnel that people can contact if they're interested in sending their art to you to see if it fits the criteria. Is is that correct? Is that Raphael? Yes, it is. And I mean, so we are we are an open platform. Anybody can come mint an NFT. They can fill it full of tokens. They can do whatever they want. Um, you can talk in our Discord and get your art listed on our marketplace. Um, but yes, we, we have a, a large team at this point, I think 15 people. But the easiest way is probably to reach out on our Twitter um, or send us an email, info at charge.fi and we'll get you um, hooked up with somebody like Rafa to onboard you and get you creating art with, or NFTs of your, of your preference within no time. Fantastic, it's very inspiring to hear that. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, Ben, really do appreciate it. And just so I don't get your surname wrong again, could you just say it one more time for me? Yes, it's Ben Lakoff, and Lake. all my um, socials are at Ben Lakoff, so first name, last name together happy to connect with anybody listening that's for sure thank you so much again for your time that was a fantastic show thank you so
And viewers, if you just joined us, we just had a very inspiring discussion. Mr. Ben Lakoff, the co-founder and business lead of Charged Particles. Please check out the full interview on YouTube at Calkine Media's channel. Stay watching for more expert talks, live market reports. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Amidst the downward slump that the crypto markets are facing, there are a few altcoins defying the current trend lines. Let's look at top five performing altcoins over the past one week. And this article was devised by the team of writers at Calkine, and I'm happy to present it to you on their behalf today. Subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Let's begin with FTX token. The FTT token ranks among the top 30 altcoins by market cap on coin market cap. It is linked to FTX, a cryptocurrency derivatives platform. Launched in 2019, the FTX exchange claims to have the edge over other crypto futures trading platforms. It has a mechanism where settlements are done using stable coins, which is different from the fragmented collateral mechanism in some other derivatives platforms. The FTT token is one of those altcoins that are trading at a price higher than its price at the start of the year. And the market cap of the FTT token is approximately 6.1 billion US dollars. Decentraland. Decentraland regularly makes the news for its virtual real estate, a popular metaverse token. Decentraland alongside the Sandbox and Axie Infinity, you may have heard of them, were tokens that rallied last year when Mark Zuckerberg announced his meta move and Samsung recently announced the launch of its virtual reality store on Decentraland's metaverse. Tezos. Tezos is a leading blockchain network that allows developers to deploy smart contracts. A rival to Ethereum and Solana, Phantom and other blockchains, the Tezos network claims it does not require a hard fork. An XTZ serves the same purpose in Tezos as Ether in Ethereum. The blockchain claims that XTZ tokens holders can participate in the governance of the network. Staking of tokens can be done to vote on proposals, for example. Solana. Now, after a stellar run in 2021, Solana has become a close watch for the crypto enthusiasts. Solana's blockchain is often termed an Ethereum killer, but there are multiple other networks like Phantom and Cardano that are competing with Ethereum's dominance in the DeFi and DApps development space. So far in 2022, the SOL token of Solana has lost value, but a rebound seems to have begun. The Sandbox. The Sandbox is a metaverse gaming token that boasts SoftBank as one of the backers. The metaverse made news recently after it announced a partnership with Warner Music. And this could be the beginning of a virtual musical universe underpinned by blockchain. The Sandbox is one of the top metaverse tokens with a market cap of nearly 3.6 billion US dollars.
Thanks for joining us on the report and if you do like the information let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel, press that bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos by Calcine. For more articles like this though head to the website it's calcinemedia.com and I'm Sage for Calcine Media. Good afternoon and welcome to Expert Talks on Kalkine TV. I'm your host, Rose Jacobs. This is where we chat to industry leaders and experts in an effort to inspire you to make the most of your own financial investments. Today we're exploring the topic of taboos in the workplace around gender and sexuality. Gender is not binary, nor is sexuality. However, many of us have been taught otherwise. So. To come out of such taboos, today we have a special guest on our show, Brett Hayhoe, who will enlighten us with his current thoughts on the scenario of queer communities in Australian workplaces. Brett Hayhoe is the publisher and editor at Q Magazine. He's also the Chief Executive Officer at Gay Friendly. Hi Brett and welcome to the show. Good afternoon. Thank you, Rose. Thank you for it's inviting me. Pleasure to have you with us today. Now, Brett, I'd like to start if you could give us an overview, really, in your own words, about Q Magazine and what you aim to achieve. Well, Q Magazine started in 2004, so I guess whatever we want to achieve, we probably should have by now. Um, but the, the magazine, we identified that there was a, a, a gap in the market for a good quality publication that was not overtly gay and I will explain that the it's it's not about naked bodies or or uh, or gay imagery it's about the places and faces that make uh, Melbourne and, and Australia wonderful and also uh, lifestyle of of the LGBT community now of course our lifestyle is very very broad we do everything so the ma magazine has been filled with some wonderful articles over over the um, what's that 16 years and uh, and in 2006 we went fully digital um it's already it's always had a digital footprint um but in 2016 sorry i um i decided that printing was just way too expensive and yes. uh, and so if i wanted to keep the magazine then i had to um stop with a silly notion that people liked up paper and, and, and roll it. And, <laughs> I'm uh, guilty and, of that. Uh, oh, a terrible traditionalist. Uh, and, um, it's not and, always and affordable, course, though, as you've pointed out yet. Well, no, it's not. And, and, and on a business level, financially, it did hurt me by, by not printing it. Um, but that's starting to come back. But of course, the costs are almost nil. So it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, give and take. Well, it sounds like you've progressed very well with the times in terms of the printing and the affordability, and you certainly sound like a very unique production, which is wonderful. So I guess let's start with the questions. You know, unfortunately, the world as a whole hasn't ultimately come out of some of those stereotypical notions attached to the queer community. However, people like you are really making a significant impact in changing our society's perspectives with your publication. So. As a person who's exclusively working on this, what changes have you observed in the Australian culture concerning the understanding of this queer community life? Look, I think it's probably pertinent to understand that some stereotypes about the, the, the LGBT community are true. Um, generally, if you get your hair cut by a really good hairdresser, they're generally gay. Um, <laughs> <but> <laughs> <laughs> and you know, if, if you want your if you want your house to look absolutely stunning, get a gay interior designer because they really are better <laughs> than the other. But in regard to changes, look, I, I I think people have been slowly but methodically pushed into understanding that we are all the same. Um, gay people just happen to be attracted to people of their. Uh, their, their same sex and gender and 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 so but it, it, I don't think you go to I, I don't think you will find every jurisdiction in the world welcoming 
uh, to the LGBT community, and and you know that's sad, but it's a reality. Um, and not not all communities accept others, but in Australia we've had some amazing uh, movements forward in the political sphere. Uh, gay conversion therapy, for example, is outlawed in at least mm. three states uh, that I know of: Queensland, oh, oh sorry, New South Wales as well. Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, and South Australia. Um, I may be wrong. There may be some others, but but certainly the east coast of the country has uh, has made that illegal. Um, we worked very very hard, everybody in the LGBT community um, in Victoria, to get that legislation through. Gay conversion therapy is simply barbaric and should never ever even be thought of as as a form of practice. And I think those sorts of things make other people understand that the community in general is changing. I'd also like to tap into your perspective from a media point of view. Um, in my experience, the media can be incredibly influential in influencing public opinion. So you're in a very unique position in that you are um, you know, creating a publication here now digitally where we can start to build that queer friendly space um, for organizations or individuals. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think it's important also. We, every community has its quirks and its nuances. I'm not sure that they need to be thrown down everybody's throat. Um, where the gay media such as Q Magazine comes in uh, into, f into the fore is that nothing in my publication should be confronting but everything is unashamedly about, for and from the, the LGBT community. And I think that, I hate to use the word normal, normalize, um, I'm also so, certainly not an assimilationist um, not at the excuse, not at the uh, uh, the peril of a community, but I think everybody who shows um, LGBT people in a, in a very again I hate using the word normal because I really hate the word, mm. but but there's but there's no other word to use. Uh, look, we've seen it in film and and television over the years, where instead of a gay character just being an added extra, we've seen the character being very pivotal and just so happens to be gay. They're the sorts of things that change hearts and minds in, in all societies across the world. Actually, as a side point, I noticed in the news this week that the print version of Spider-Man has now been um, diversified to be a bisexual, which is quite fascinating. I always thought it anyway. <laughs> Now, I'd like to move on. Diverse sexualities are widely and now legally and socially accepted in the mainstream in Australia at least, and more people are coming out with their honest sexual orientation. So I'd like to know your thoughts on how industries and market marketplaces can proceed towards better catering for that. It's very interesting you say that because uh, attached to gayfriendly.com, which is a website uh, based out of the UK, is also an organization that I uh, am a consultant for, which is Pride 365. Pride 365, as the name would suggest, means that you should be proud of who you are, regardless of what that happens to be, 365 days a year, but also that as a business, you should be supporting your LGBT staff 365 days a year, not just conveniently during June, for example, which is the North American Pride season, the month is, is Pride mm. Month. So Pride 365 works very, very closely with business. They go into the organization from the bottom up and look at everything that should be changed and make sure that those changes all be them uh, incremental over a 12 month period. As long as those changes are being made, Pride 365 are, are there with those businesses. I really strongly support that concept for all business, all organizations. Um, you may not be 100% perfect right now, but as long as you're willing to change, I don't think that's a bad thing. 
the 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 main thing about Pride three six five is a, is a, um, a a public pledge to do better, to be better, and to be more inclusive, and and that's really all we can ask people to do. And businesses, I think, are hopping on board. That sounds like a wonderful organisation. Uh, now, as you mentioned, you do use sometimes exciting, perhaps provocative, but classy, definitely humorous and often timeless photographs or illustrations, and also witty features in your magazine editions. What would you say your inspiration is behind such imagery and, and the messages that you intend to send to your readers? Look, certainly on an imagery basis, I, I think people need to have a bit of fun. Um, I live in Melbourne, by the way, so um, I haven't had too much fun over the last two years. <laughs> um, <laughs> however, I have to say that not only have we broken through the shackles today, it's also one of the hottest days we have had in two years, which is why I'm wearing a T-shirt. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I normally wear a suit. Um, but I it's a actually love the, the heart. It's that beautiful. Is so dark. Well, it's a, a Fiat de Montreal, which is a Montreal Pride. Um, and, and I've forgotten exactly what we were talking about. Um, well, just in terms of the, the imagery that, um, that you do oh, yes, sorry. utilize, yes. you know, yes, what, what, what is the ultimate message that you intend to send to your readers with that? Well, on a, on a, on a very basic level, because it's a magazine format, um, having a magazine full of words without any imagery would be really boring. Um, <laughs> It would bore me putting it together. I design it as well. Um, but look, I, I think the message is very much that the community is very uh, is an integral part of the overall community, every citizenry, whether people like it or not. And uh, and President Erdogan, of course, made some stupid comment many, many years ago, uh, several years ago, that there were no gay people in Turkey. Um, I said, I've got news for you, baby, and it's all bad. Mm. There, there is there are gay people in every society, and so there should be. There's also people who do knitting. There is also people who do shooting and fishing, and you, you know, there, there are our community is made up of many, many communities, and the imagery. Um, I don't know that there, there's a deliberate there's a deliberate um, reason to to change anybody's hearts or minds, but they're always fun imagery, and uh, and sometimes a little naughty. But you'll never, you'll never ever see in Q magazine anything that's blatantly um, rude or, or, yeah. or, yes, exactly. But please don't look at the second issue. <laughs> now I must buy a copy. That got somebody so, fired. That got somebody just fired. for our final question, <laughs> in your opinion, which industry or area in Australia is really m the most queer friendly, and and what's the rationale, or why is Where's the success behind that? I know you mentioned you're from Melbourne, so I'm guessing that's going to be part of the uh, response from you. Well, it, it, I, I read this question, and thank you for sending it through. Um, <laughs> I read this question, and, I, and I'm not quite sure that there is one industry or one area that is that is better than another. Um, I think any look, obviously, that the, there are very obvious ones, like the airline industry has um, under under the current chief executive officer is has gone a long way to welcoming all of his employees. I have to say, by the way, that the under former uh, chiefs, and I'm, I'm sure this one as well, that the Victoria Police are very, very welcoming of, of gay people, and also their interaction with the gay community is exceptional. And that's not by accident. That's by a bunch of people who go in there and train the cadets on diversity, inclusion, acceptance, uh, tolerance is a terrible word and should never mm. be used, mm. um, acceptance most definitely, and, and how to deal with, with people from different backgrounds, different sexualities. And, uh, and, and so I would have to give a shout out to the Victoria Police. I think they've come a long way. They're by no means perfect, please don't misunderstand me. Um, and they have a very, very long way to go. But um, take out the last two years, which have just been stupid. Um, the last two years have just been stupid. But um, leading on from here uh, and, t and picking up from where they left off two years ago, I, I really think they're a wonderful organisation. And certainly one to keep an eye on moving forward. But that's all we have time Indeed. for for today. Thank you so much for joining us. 
and we hope to chat with you Rose, again soon. Rose, my pleasure. I, I hope so too. Thank you very much. Indeed. I'm Rose Jacobs and you've been watching Expert Talks for Kalkine TV. Stay tuned. Plenty more coming right up. Hello, one and all. Thanks for tuning in to Calkine TV. I'm Sage, and this is The Hot Performers, a show where we take a look at stocks and sectors that could be heating up. And today we have ASX-listed company ANZ Group under the spotlight. And ANZ Bank was trading 4% lower at $26.02 in the morning trade after unveiling weak margins in its quarterly update. We will look at why ANZ's net interest margin fell in the first quarter in today's show. So let's get started. The Australia and New Zealand banking group very recently announced a fall in its net interest margin during the quarter that ended 31st December 2021. The bank reported an eight basis points decline in its net interest margin during the period under review. The bank attributed the decline in margin majorly to a lower exit rate at the full year and a continuation of the structural headwinds impacting the sector. And on that note, let's have a quick look at why Australia and New Zealand Banking Group's margin has plummeted and what are its views about the occurrence. ANZ Banking Group suffered group net interest margin deterioration of eight basis points over the first quarter or five basis points on an underlying basis. The bank attributed the decline to a lower exit rate at the full year and a continuation of the structural headwinds impacting the sector. The lender expected its first half performance to take a hit owing to harsh trading conditions in the month of October. In its latest market update, ANZ said that the revenue within its market's business for the month of October was softer given trading conditions, while subsequent months have performed more in line with the revenue trends of financial year 21. It stated that the softer start in October will likely impact first half performance. However, it also added that the bank expects the current headwinds to moderate in the second quarter due to a potential increase in interest rates, predominantly in New Zealand, and recent deposit pricing changes. The bank said that it was upgrading the size of its previously announced 1.5 billion Australian dollar on market buyback with a common equity tier one ratio of 11.65%. It noted that the credit quality environment has remained benign with a total provision release of $44 million during the quarter. And this comprises a collective provision release of $122 million and an individually assessed provision of $78 million. The bank was also of the view that nearly $140 million Australian dollars of negative transitional impact is expected to negatively impact operating income, spread over both the first and second halves of financial year 2022 on account of changes made to customer banking packages in its Australian retail and commercial segments. ANZ Mortgage Application Processing for Basic Home Loans is now in line with other banks after improvements to the bank's systems. First half revenue from the market side of the business will be dented by a softer start to the quarter during October, given trading conditions. Costs are broadly flat. Well, before we wrap up the show, let's look at ANZ's share price performance. The stock has delivered a negative year-to-date return of over 3%. In the past year, the share price witnessed a significant drop. Today, it opened at $26.41 today and is trading around the similar price currently. And thanks for your company on that report. That's all for now. We will be back again with the exclusive Hot Performers stock tomorrow. Until then, keep watching Calkine TV for the latest market updates and related insights. Sage here, signing off. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV.
Hi there, Rose Jacobs with you for Calkine. Before we dive in, make sure you hit that bell icon at the bottom of your screen for all the latest updates. Some Canadians are protesting against vaccine mandates. Will it impact Canadian economies? Well, let's find out in this video. Canada is witnessing protests over vaccine mandates and COVID-19 measures. After a week-long drive across the country, a fleet of big rigs known as the Freedom Convoy reached Ottawa recently. Truckers reportedly started protesting against the vaccine mandate for crossing the US-Canada border implemented by the Justin Trudeau government earlier in January. Let's take a look at the issue. So what is the vaccine mandate? As per the mandate, unvaccinated Canadian truckers need to quarantine upon returning home after crossing the US-Canada border. Published reports claim that after the new measures were announced, truckers and conservative groups got together to organise the Cross Canada Drive. After starting from Western Canada, the drive got momentum and gathered support as it drove to the eastern parts of the country. It is expected that the protesters will continue to stay near Parliament Hill and hope for the government to take back their border vaccine and any other public health mandate right across the country. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was reportedly shifted to a secret location along with his family as the unprecedented protests gripped the national capital. Will the protests impact on the Canadian economy? Well, some retailers in Canada require customers to show their proof of vaccination and government issued identity cards before entering the stores. In Quebec, retailers like Walmart, Costco, Ikea and Canadian Tire Corporation are among retailers who have to take such measures to limit unvaccinated people to purchasing only essential goods. Public health restrictions like these could affect retailers and consumers negatively as the pandemic and lockdowns have already forced people to live in a restricted environment. If these restrictions continue, consumers could stop visiting stores, which would most likely reduce the retailers' sales. Additionally, truckers play an essential role in the Canadian economy and according to the Government of Canada, the transportation and warehousing industry is vital to the country's economy. The Canadian Transportation Economic Account data of 2016 stated the transportation sector contributed 168.1 billion Canadian dollars or 8% of the gross domestic product. If the truckers continue protesting against the vaccine mandate, the transport industry could incur losses. And so the conclusion? Well, the period of uncertainty due to any event is worst for a stock market. As reports surface that the Prime Minister has shifted to a secret location due to ongoing protests, could be taken negatively by equities markets investors. If this uncertainty continues, the markets could see a dip as investors will likely be wary of making investments. But that's a wrap for now. Please check out the website for more, calkinemedia.com, and make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thanks for joining me. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV.
Did you know that there's an Ethereum powered token that primarily aims to increase engagement between brands and consumers? I'm talking about Suku Crypto. Hey, thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields reporting for Calcai Media. By bringing transparency and accountability into its system, Suku aims to provide and simplify ways to connect in both physical and virtual worlds, including the metaverse. The Florida-based startup focuses on building Web 3.0 tools, which can be utilized by a range of sectors. Recently, Suku has been generating hype after registering gains of over 30% in the past week and 29% in the past 14 days or so. On top of that, it's gained a whopping 51% and seen a significant volume rise of over 900% but since it's calmed down. So why did the crypto rally and how well is it faring in the market at the moment? Well, the exact reason for Suku's rally is still unclear, but going by the Twitter account, it seems to be largely due to its announcement of providing the requisite infrastructure to scale up its Web3 adoption with NFT marketplace Infinite World. According to Suku's white paper, the ecosystem works to provide some main solutions. Namely, through the Suku Omni Protocol, it's transforming the supply chain data and analytics to offer transparency and traceability. With the Infinite World Marketplace, it aims to tap into the world of the metaverse, and Suku DeFi offers supply chain participants to engage in micro-lending and collateralization of the products. As it stands, the Suku token is ranked number 439. Backed by a strong team consisting of James Bauer, Addison McKenzie, and Jonathan Lapchik, the project seems promising and has a great potential to establish itself as a strong token. Suku also has a growing community and is available on the leading exchanges like Kubi Global, KuCoin, Coinbase and others. What's your take on Suku? Let us know in the comments and as always check out some of our videos to stay up to date. Soon Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. This is Rachel Jones and this is Kalkine TV's breaking news. Now lockdown recovery has seen Australian retail sales volumes rise to a record 8.2% in the December quarter 2021. That's seasonally adjusted according to figures just released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. This follows a 4.4% fall in the December quarter 2021. Now this 8.2% increase in retail sales volumes is the strongest quarterly rise on record, surpassing the previous record set in the September 2020 quarter. Sales volumes are now at their highest quarterly level of the series, up 3.4% on the June quarter 2021 and 3.6% through the year. 
Director of Quarterly Economy-Wide Statistics, Ben James, says consumers enthusiastically return to discretionary spending following the end of Delta-related lockdowns in October and the continued easing of restrictions over the quarter. Well-publicized concerns over product availability and delivery timeliness led to consumers bringing forward their end-of-year shopping in conjunction with a reopening spending splurge due to pent-up consumer demand. The quarterly rise was driven by the spending in the discretionary industries, all of which saw a sharp fall in the September quarter. Clothing, footwear and personal accessory retailing had the largest rise at 43.1%, followed by cafes, restaurants and takeaway food services at 18.8%. Household goods retailing at 9%, department stores were up 25%, and other retailing at 6.8% in seasonally adjusted volume terms. Now, food retailing was 1.6%. That was the only industry, discretionary or non-discretionary, to fall, with consumers reducing their grocery spending and returning to hospitality venues and dining out. The release of constrained consumer demand Post-lockdown saw New South Wales at 15.3% and Victoria at 10.2% record the largest volume rises of all the states and territories. The Australian Capital Territory recorded a 12.4% rise, having also been significantly impacted by lockdowns in the previous quarter. There also continues to be underlying strength in the states and territories that were largely able to avoid extended Delta lockdowns, with rises in the December quarter for all except Tasmania, which saw a drop of 1.2%. Queensland rose 3%, followed by WA up 1.6%, with South Australia up 1.1% and the Northern Territory at 0.9%. Well, that's all from me for now. Stay tuned to Calkine TV for all the economic news that matters. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. 
whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Welcome to the Expert Talks Executive Corner by Calkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Mr. Nitin Dashpande, Sales and Operations Country Head of Katonic. And Katonic ML Ops platform is a collaborative platform with unified UI to manage all data science in one place. It is for customers and developers to introduce the ML Ops practice into their production systems. And for those that are new to this term, ML Ops is a set of practices that combines the creative scientific process of data scientists with the professional software engineering process to build and deploy machine learning models into production safely, quickly and sustainably. And we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. Bringing you live today, we have Mr. Nithin Deshpande, Sales and Operations Country Head of Katonic. Welcome to the show, Nithin. Thank you very much and I appreciate inviting us to this particular tech show. Uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, we can get into the interview. Our Thank you. Tech, tech talk. Thank you. Yes, let's get started now. Artificial intelligence has tremendous power to transform organizations. However, those possibilities can only be realized after ML models are deployed into production and there are thousands of organizations with great potential that are yet to embed ML models. So what advice would you like to give such organizations? Yeah, so uh, if you look at the ML models, ML models are the combination of data and code and each organization has a lot of data which is cold but it is in a messy condition. Uh, the data is there all over the place within the internal uh, business systems, IT systems and it is outside the system which is in the social media platform. Moreover, the data is growing exponentially, it is becoming increasingly diverse and uh, it is faced through new data sources and is being used and analyzed by many people. So organizations are looking at extracting the value from the data. So our organization therefore need to start with uh, data insights or analytics platform that could scale up with minimal efforts. They need faster business insights through an archi architecture which enables a rapid build of an agile, scalable analytics capability. And they need to set up a governance and compliance mechanism in a unified way to secure, monitor and manage access to the data. So the next step to move up, move up the value chain is to infuse data and AI models into ML platform. And the only way to do this is to have your own AI to differentiate uh, yourself with respect to the competitors. Rather than, give, rather than giving this data to any third party uh, uh, service provider who may, there is a possibility that he may give it to your competitors. So at Atonic, what we have done is we have built a unified platform which can do both. It can do business IQ intelligence uh, and provide the analytics uh, insights to you as well as ML ops capability to provide inference, inferences and predictions. Right. It's, it sounds like such a step forward into the future because a lot of these high level theoretical um, ideas that seem good in theory sometimes don't apply so well to the practical world. 
So it's great to hear that Catonic has something in motion there. Thank you for sharing that. And Gartner reported that 85% of AI models don't make it to production. Additionally, according to a 2021 study from Algorithmia, the average deployment time for models that make it into production is about 18 months. So as per yourself working for Catonic, what, from your experience, what could you see as a reasoning behind this, please? Yeah, this is a, this is a, gr a great question. And uh, in fact, uh, unfortunately, this is a reality. Uh, because AI is hard while taking ML data into production. And uh, therefore, there are, uh, there are many reasons. But I see there are four reasons as to why ML models do not see a light at the end of the tunnel. The first and foremost thing is that there is a general perception in the organization that machine learning is all about machine learning code. And most of the organizations, what they do is they engage data scientists to build the data model, experiment with the data models, take the best model out of it. And then uh, the data scientists come out with the inference. We, he creates a beautiful dashboard, which organization says, yes, this is what we wanted. But when they take into production, they fail. Uh, and the main reason is that the ML code is a very tiny part or a small part of the entire data science process because it requires a lot of activities preceding the ML model uh, experimentation or training of the ML model and subsequent activities. And these activities are not the end goal. The monitoring is not the end goal. So you need to perform these activities right from your data extraction from various sources, entity resolution, data transformation, data cleaning, creating the features out of that data. And this particular aspect is uh, uh, is neglected by most of the organizations. So that is the first reason. The second reason is on the AI, because AI is a combination of data and code. For example, if I give you a Windows 8 software and if you load it on your existing or the latest uh, laptop which you have, it will work. But uh, as uh, data, uh, uh, data changes with respect to the time as, as well as with respect to the uh, 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 additional data sets or respect to the geography, then your model also uh, changes and there is a drift in the performance. You need to continuously monitor, retrain the model and redeploy the model. Now this particular cycle is sometimes very complex and then this aspect is generally missed while designing the platform. The third reason is that ML lifecycle has got uh, many uh, roles. So there are data scientists, data engineers, machine learning engineers, then you have DevOps engineers, IT operations team. And then there has to be a, a, a smooth handover from one role to another role. And generally what we have found that the data scientists who build the model, they do this entire uh, building operation in an isolated manner. And then they throw this particular work to the next role, which is ML ops, who then take this model into production and this often results in uh, uh, in results in writing the models as well as there is an awkward handshake which happens which makes the process more difficult and error prone uh, the, the fourth thing is basically the ai requires a lot of tools to be integrated because i have mentioned that there are a lot of preceding activities before the ml model training and taking into production and testing it out as well as the subsequent activities and and each of these requires a lot of tools to do the work and so what you need to do is you need to integrate all these tools on a, on, a, on a platform which can work seamlessly and then you are able to build a, a monitoring and management layer as well as a governance layer on top of it as well as security feature which is wrapped around it. Now all this takes, uh, all this takes time, money and it is very complex. And then uh, it becomes very difficult for the organization to sustain the program and they burn a lot of money and then the program is called off. So that is the fourth uh, reason why the uh, models do not make into the production. Now what we have seen in the IDC or Gartner, they say that there are only 6% of the organizations who have built this kind of uh, platform where they have invested time, they have invested money and they have seen that they have the right tools, right uh, people, right uh, resources, right governance mechanism, right security features so that they are able to do the entire data science process uh, end to end seamlessly.
Wow, you've really told us so much in just that one to two minute answer. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Now, the AI industry is set to boom in about four or five years. They're expecting trillions of dollars to be invested into the development of AI and for it to emerge further into the mainstream through industry. Um, just off the main discussion, do you think that blockchain will help um, AI and Katonic do what they are planning to do? Is there any chance that you will move on to the blockchain with your operations? Uh, in fact, uh, my CEO, uh, Mr. Prem Narayan Das, in fact, he has in fact implemented one of the largest or uh, the uh, big, uh, big uh, blockchain program for one of the bank in Australia, Commonwealth Bank of Australia. This program was almost around one year, uh, one year where uh, the program was awarded. So definitely, Catonic, uh, we would like to focus on to see how we can embed blockchain into our AI ML journey. Because we have all the platform, but we would definitely like to look at the other technology which we can integrate with our platform. Okay, thank you so much. Back to the main discussion. To solve the challenges of AI, the practice of MLOps has been introduced over the last two to three years. Could you talk about in more detail uh, the growth prospects that MLOps have achieved in these past two to three years? The practical practice across the application into the golden era of machine learning with increasing day by day across all the customer segments. So ML Ops has evolved into an independent approach to ML life cycle management. In short, ML Ops, if I uh, put it, it is equal to uh, machine learning plus DevOps plus data engineering. So in our IT parlance, we put it as it is CI plus CD, CI continuous integration, continuous development, continuous monitoring and continuous training. So in last two to three years, uh, if you look at it, the ML Ops has gone through three stages of transformation. The first stage has been entry level model training and manual deployment. The second is automated triggering of ML model. And the third stage has been the ML automation using continuous monitoring, retraining and redeployment into production environment. And according to the IDC report, the compounded annual growth rate, CAGR, in last five years in the ML ops area has been around 23%. And by 2027, it is expected to grow by more than 30%. Wow, thank you. It's, it's growing at a very rapid pace. So hopefully the deployment is uh, quite intuitive and an easy process and not too involved. Seems like it would be quite um, involved and technical, however. Um, using ML Ops to effectively manage and govern the AI lifecycle from experimentation to production is the business's next competitive frontier. And in your opinion, what types of industries have positively deployed ML models uh, most significantly? Yeah, so we launched this platform in July 2021 and in the last three months I've been uh, talking to more than 40 CIOs covering around 15 industry domains. So from experience, what I found is that they are at a different uh, uh, maturity level of AI ML journey. Most of them are in maturity level 1 and 2 and few of them are in level 3. And some of the uh, some are up the value chain are benefiting from the ML ops on efficiency reduction, customer satisfaction, and competitive value. Now, if you look at the if you, uh, divide the industries into part, those who are leading and those who are lagging. So there are certain sectors who, uh, who are leading in server space, and those are like BFSI, high tech, and telecommunications, healthcare, manufacturing, specifically in the automotive and consumer goods retail, transportation, logistics, uh, energy and power, media and entertainment. And those who are lagging are in areas like travel tourism, shipping and port management, real estate and construction, education and profit service. And uh, the laggards, so now what they have understood is that this AI ML is being they need to go off. So they are also now catching the data and they are trying to see that how, how they can establish the Ethics platform first and then go into using AI into their ML operations. And that is where we play a role where we have a platform which can do both. 
can be able to really use, uh, which is the uh, the best level uh, uh, best level service which can be provided. And then on top of it, you can infuse your IC, uh, AI into ML op ML operations. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, in a nutshell, sounds like there's still plenty of room for growth there. Thank you very much for your insights. And we're reaching the end of the discussion. So lastly, Nathan, please talk how you're envisioning the future of MLOps for the coming years. Just touched on a little bit with the issues that are yet to jump on yeah, board. Yeah. Any other insights? Yes, I think uh, if you look at the uh, uh, 20 years horizon, then AIML uh, is going to be one of the key technology area which will play a major role. So automated machine learning tools and ML ops are the two areas of the broader ML market over the next few years. Now leading ML ops tools are the next frontier of scaling AI in the enterprise. ML ops is also on the rise as critical technology to help scale machine learning in the enterprises. So there will be increased MLOps capabilities within existing ML platform solution as the scope of platform continues to expand. Uh, ML tools are being interrupted company find it hard to hire data science talent or want to be the racing team more efficient. This has a significant effect on uh, impact on MLOps. So as per the investors, analysts and market watch indicate that global MLOps markets of 25 million US dollar today is expected to grow by grow at five times by 2027 due to uh, adoption and according to the recent study by 2023 nearly 70% of AI workloads will use application containers for being built using service programming by setting ML or culture. Well wow, that's, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing valuable making time for the show today. Nith, we really do appreciate your time. Thank you very much and my pleasure to be on this particular call. Thank you. Thank you. So from all the way to India viewers, Nithin is Sales and Operations Country Head at Onic. And for those that have joined us, you can view a full discussion on YouTube via Calkine Media and more of the expert talks and live market updates and say stay apprised and invest wisely. Have you heard of Sabre Crypto? Hey, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields reporting for Kalkine Media. Sabre is a decentralized exchange primarily built on the Solana blockchain network, and it aims to be one of the critical liquidity foundations for stable coins. It claims to provide swapping opportunities for more than 30 cryptos with a swap pair of USDT and USDC. Let's find out what makes Sabre tick. Well, one of the advantages of this crypto is its ability to offer services at a low transaction fee and faster transaction speed as well. Sabre can do this thanks to Solana's faster throughput ability, which offers low transaction costs as against the likes of Ethereum. 
Recently, Sabre completed the integration with Clover Finance Wallet to expand its vision to create a multi-chain ecosystem, which aims to accelerate and to improve the DeFi experience. So how does Sabre work exactly? Well, one of the key components of Sabre's functionality is its ability to work as an automated market maker. Traditionally, all AMM-based exchanges are not trader dependent on completing a particular transaction. The liquidity pool provides managers with flows of funds and they are in turn given a portion of the transaction fees. So investors can execute their respective transactions without waiting for trader availability. Meaning you can complete the transaction against the pool as you're not dependent on the coin's availability. Sabre is governed by the native token SBR and it's ranked number 3,191 on CoinMarketCap. The crypto has been on a bearish trend of late and hasn't seen much of a positive run. Although the overall market is seeing significant lows where SBR token was down by over 41% over the past week. But some investors believe that they'll see a positive rally in Solana's price once the market revives. So what's your take on Sabre? Let us know in the comments and as always check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. This has been Hollow Shields for Calcine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Welcome to Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage, and today's guest is Mr. Robert Russell, founder of Truckit.net, Australia's leading freight marketplace, which offers listings for freight jobs with access to a vast network of transport providers, and you'll sure find someone for your job. Truckit.net is an Australian company with an easy-to-use online marketplace to receive competitive quotes. So keep watching till the end to find out more. And as you know, we bring you the industry advocates, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets and bringing you live today. We have Mr. Robert Russell, founder of CEO Truckit.net. Welcome to the show, Robert. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sage. So, Robert, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. You've had quite an impressive journey from the international rugby circuit to now running an innovative digital marketplace for freight. Could you share your journey with us, please? Yeah, I, I guess it all, well, it all started here in, I'm based in Brisbane and um, before I, I guess my rugby career played a bit of a part in it, we, I moved over to, uh, to Scotland to play to play in uh, to play a professional rugby, which led on to an international career, and I think as a rugby player you get a bit of spare time. So uh, throughout that process, I started looking into um, what would be life after rugby, and, and I think it was e-commerce that really um, I'd done a bachelor of business or commerce back here in Brisbane, and and um, I, I really saw the opportunity in the online world and started a business over there. Uh, and on exiting that business and coming back to Australia in 2012, it was during my time over there that I, I really saw the um, opportunity, I guess, in, in online tech and, and marketplaces. Um, you know, marketplaces have become a big part of uh, the online space and, and our lives, I think, um, yeah, for everyone. So it was sort of, yeah, international rugby through to, to, to now um, running a, yeah, Truck It, which is Australia's largest freight marketplace. That's fantastic. A very inspirational story because not everyone has the foresight to think that way. So congratulations and here we are today interviewing you on Expert Talks. Well, established in 2012, Truckett's digital marketplace matches people wishing to freight large items 
with transport operators. Um, who do you tend to find are your main clients? Do they tend to come from one industry or veer towards domestic or international freight? And do you count yourself as somewhat of a watchdog for consumers? Yeah, look, you know, as, as you said, we're a, we're a marketplace. We're here to match, um, you know, freight consumers of, of all, um, you know, both personal and business. So we, we have uh, customers or clients, you know, in the business space, we've got large corporates, um, we've got mining and resources companies, we've got, you know, large retailers, right down to the, the mum and, and dad businesses. And on the personal side, we've got a lot of um, personal freight being done, I suppose, with, um, you know, the increase in online shopping. There's a lot of people that buy off places such as Grays Online. Um, we have a great partnership with Grays Online. And, you know, they're, they're buying things such as, you know, could be vehicles, motor vehicles, cars, jet skis, uh, furniture, anything like that. And, and we're really here to help them move it. So um, we do, um, I guess, yeah, absolutely. I, we, we consider ourselves a bit of a watchdog. I mean, we're a very transparent marketplace with the, um, you know, everyone can see what's going on. So it's the, you know, free market forces of supply and demand that, that really, um, you, you know, that really run the, the marketplace, I guess. And, and I guess in a sense, it's a, it's a watchdog for everyone. So, you know, it's, it's mostly down to, to sort of spot market um, or spot prices rather than contracted rates. So when someone's got that harder to move item or something they don't have a contract in place for, um, yeah, they use truck it. Sounds great. So do you find, you mentioned there, the supply and demand um, of the free market tends to uh, balance out the more expensive um, providers to, and to the cheaper ones that offer more economical rates. Do you think it sort of balances out or do the more expensive ones actually offer a better service? Yeah, no, we, we see all that. I mean, um, absolutely. We, we've a lot of customers are users for exactly that reason. They, you know, they, they the rates they might get, or they don't know where to start, who to go to, and especially if they've got a, a rate with a network carrier or someone that, and it's going to a place that they're not regularly using, they probably don't have that sort of volume discount. So um, we see, you know, price differentials, you know, you know, is a huge range, um, and we hear that from our customers all the time. So it's exactly that reason that they use us, and. Um, yeah, that's been a, it's been a great asset of the business, I suppose, being able to do that. And, you know, just back on the, on the provider side, we, we've got providers who are, you know, tier one uh, carriers right down to, again, the owner operators um, doing business, but they're all um, competing for the work. And um, I think free markets, as I said before, they, they have a balancing effect. So, um, the, you know, the customers looked after. Well, I think your service definitely provides plenty of advantages for both the providers and the customers. It sounds great. It makes it so easy all in one place and they can just pick and choose what they want. That sounds fantastic. Um, in September, truck users posted more than 17,000 freight jobs on the marketplace. And this is a 65% increase on the June uh, figures, which was 60% on the same month last year. So what do you think is driving this growth? Is there a fee for using your service? Yeah, well, in terms of driving the growth, I mean, obviously the, the COVID effect has certainly played a part. Um, you know, it's forced people to do a lot more stuff online, which has been great for the business. But I think ultimately, um, you know, the, the scale of business is now, we really see sort of network effects taking hold. You know, we've got great liquidity in the marketplace. We've got a lot of We've got over 6,000 transport providers that use us and we've, um, we've had over 400,000 customers. So there is really good liquidity and um, I think that's really starting to show the way now. I mean, even with COVID restrictions um, you know, easing, we don't expect um, it to change. You know, people's you know, user behaviours have, uh, I'd say, have learnt to trust and use marketplaces such as Trucker. And we'll, we uh, you know, believe that that will continue. So. Um, I think it's you know it's a it's a very bright future. And I think that's that's the main reason for you know the growth that we've seen um, you know between uh, this time last year and now. Yeah. Fantastic. And this is a little bit off the main discussion, but just wondering, uh, search engine optimization is vital um, in e-commerce. Um, do you think your e-commerce strategy has helped put you in the forefront of the industry? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, digital marketing is is paramount to what we do. We've got some great um, agencies that help look after us, and we've got great staff that really run all those marketing campaigns and SEO, search engine optimization, is a is a is a big part of what we do. Um, just as other paid forms of, of marketing as well. So it is, you know, it's, it's critical to get that part right. And we're, we're very fortunate to have um, great people in those positions to, to, to ensure that we're getting great results. Fantastic, thanks very much for sharing your insights. So um, another side of things that's a little bit gray is how are freight fees decided upon generally? Does it vary from company to company or is there a standard overall? Um, how do the fuel levy and road vehicle operating costs come into play please? Yeah well those things obviously as, as they increase they, they play a part in the, in the pricing. Um, but just to be clear we, we don't actually set the pricing. We're not um, the likes of we're not uber who, who, who name the price we let our providers our transport providers name their price so um you know they factor all those things in when that when they're doing that some people have rate tables and they get adjusted but yeah we, we see it's a it's a bit of a, a topic i suppose at the moment those those mm. increasing costs are are driving the prices up they certainly are they're making it quite tricky for certain industries depending if you're in table grapes or wine or some of the commodities at the moment, it's uh, getting quite expensive. Uh, and shipping costs have surged with many expecting inflation to hit record levels due to this. Uh, what are your thoughts on the subject for the near future and your near term goals for truckit.net please? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, inflation's, inflation's just part of life as I mm -hmm. see it, um, you know, it, it's, there will be inflationary things that happen, and certainly in this industry, I believe. But it, you know, it's not going to change um, the opportunities we have uh, or the goals we have. I mean, I think it's a great time, it's a great opportunity for for transport providers at the moment. And um, you know, we're seeing a lot of people coming into the market. It has um, struggled a bit with the uh, the last few months with some of the more restricted lockdowns we've seen. But um, right now, we're seeing a lot come back in, and um, yeah, it's a busy space and. You know, yeah, I think it's got a, a, a very bright future for, for, for the transport providers who want to get involved in the industry. And obviously consumers are using it, are using us more and more and they're using on, you know, um, digital means to, to move their goods. So, yeah, so it's, um, we've got a, yeah, a very optimistic future. Yes, yeah, so, well, the industry has been great for creating jobs over the downturn, that's for sure. It's been giving a lot of people a chance to keep, um, keep the roof over their heads working in deliveries and logistics so that's that's been fantastic well we have to start winding up the discussion was there anything you'd like to share with the viewers before we close up today uh, no nothing other than that I think it's um, yeah like I, I think I've hopefully I've given a, them a good rundown of um, what the business is and if they if they'd like to know more yeah go to truckit.net and um, we've got a you know we pride ourselves on great customer support um, that's been a key focus for us for a long time. So if we can help anyone out, we're, we, we have phone support and um, yeah, only too happy to help anyone. Thanks so much for sharing your time today, Robert. We really do appreciate your insights. Thanks very much, Sage. And for those who just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion with Mr. Robert Russell, CEO, founder of Truckit.net. Please watch the full recording on YouTube via Kalkine Media and keep watching for more expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. I'm Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV.
Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Mr. Anuranjan Sharma, the Digital Marketing Head of Works for You. And the employment sector is in focus with the economy reopening after arduous lockdowns. New Zealand's unemployment rate is at the lowest it's been in years. And there is speculation that workers are becoming more fussy about the type of role they take on. Well, Works for You is an outsourcing company that offers admin assistance, customer support, customer feedback surveys, digital marketing, software development, graphics and web designing, as well as back office support for a range of businesses from aerospace to education. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets. And bringing you live today, we have Mr. Anuranjan Sharma, Digital Marketing Head at Works for You. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Sage. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to meet you. We're keen to share your insights today. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, get started. Well, I would like to thank you. Sure. Yes. Thank you so much. In your opinion, what makes Works for You a preferred outsourcing company in Australia, please? Uh, well, Sage, uh, Work for You is an outfit that believes in the agile methodology to deliver to its clients' requirements. In simpler terms, it means that we follow a process where we are in constant conversation with our clients. Almost all successful IT outfits have switched from the traditional waterfall model to an agile one. We strongly believe in a client-oriented approach, which makes us the preferred outsourcing company in Australia. People at work for you value human values and believe in giving a human touch to the work that we do. What we believe is crucial, uh, we go back to the basics and offer not only the best services to our clients, but also provide them with a personalized quality of work. This model of ours has proven to be quite successful and it is evident in a high rate of customer retention and satisfaction. So that's the secret source of work for you. I like the way you put it, the secret source. and. Just that added human touch, especially at this time when we've been so remote from each other, working remotely, uh, isolating, quarantining, all that, I think people will appreciate that human touch and just a little bit of extra attention and interest put into the needs of your clients sounds like a great strategy to move forward in the right direction. So during these times of pandemic, cost cutting has become a significant part to sustain a business. What would you suggest is the most effective way of cutting capital and other expenditures in these challenging times, please, Anuranjan? Uh, well, adapting to the pandemic has been quite a challenging task for all the companies. And uh, there's no hiding that product-based companies have been hit the hardest by this worldwide crisis. However, at work for you, the case is opposite. The reason behind this is that our business process is built over relieving the workload and the burden of our clients. Remote outsourcing services are all about this. We have been pretty successful with the service bracket in these times. Many of our clients have managed to pull through this pandemic because of a dedicated remote assistance and outsourcing. They had been saving on the overhead costs and they saved a bit more during this pandemic. Tens of millions of people that have been pushed to work from their homes and infrastructure costs are naturally down because of this. Cost cutting while maintaining a healthy workforce has been the biggest challenge for any digital or IT company. This problem has been acknowledged by the top level CFOs in the world. Our cost cutting strategy has been simple. We aim to remove any sort of redundancy in terms of employee compensation. And the pandemic has also proven to us that work can be done from our homes and geographical boundaries are mere psychological. They're not really practical. With every Zoom meeting, we realize that the customers uh, and our employees can save time and effort. They were optimizing the business process. Secondly, we have also reviewed our investment plans. Although the pandemic hit everyone by surprise, but there was enough time to plan. The warning signs were almost there around when this pandemic started and we had been quite responsive to that. Uh, along with our MD, Mr. Deepak Mandy, he is the uh, torch bearer of uh, this company. So this has helped us switch around the most robust investments that we were capable of withstanding the economic decline during the pandemic. Lastly, uh, there have been some things uh, which naturally fell into place. Overhead costs such as travel and ent entertainment were reduced by a very large margin. So that obviously worked in our favor. 
Thank you so much for sharing your insights there. And although remote working seems to work uh, for a temporary period, I think a lot of businesses are keen to get their people back into the office, which is why using outsourced um, digital professionals to help with the transition and the pivot for, to adapt to the pandemic conditions was so important. So thank you so much for sharing those insights. Um, what are the essential tools needed for any brand to achieve and maintain consistent growth and development of a business, please? Uh, well, we at work for you believe that the most essential tool is flexibility and adaptiveness. Every day we hear of a new technology making a breakthrough. Companies such as ours need to be open to new ideas and methods and review their operational and processes very frequently. The sole purpose of technology is to make our lives easier. Right from the wheel to where we are today, technology has helped us live better and earn better. If we do not accept and more importantly, we don't adopt new methods and systems, there is a very little chance that we are going to be successful or we are going to grow. Apart from this, using these latest technologies to drive a customer-centric approach is crucial to a successful business model, especially in outsourcing and IT and digital marketing. Especially in our case as an outsourcing company, our clients expect us, and rightly so, to deliver to, deliver to the requirement with the best tools at hand. So these are some of the tools that we put into practice. That's right. Um couldn't say it better myself. Thank you so much for sharing that. And as an expert, how do you solve different kinds of business problems to help your clients achieve optimum efficiency? Well, uh, this is something our MD, Mr. Deepak Kamandi, is an expert at. He has developed quite a unique methodology to uh, solve various kinds of business problems, which is being emulated at work for you. To begin with, we gather as much data points as possible for the situation at hand. We improve efficiency. It is crucial to define the problem first. We bring in multiple factors to help us do that. Market research and competitor analysis is one of them. After that, we do a SWOT analysis. We identify blockers early on, which uh, helps us solve large problems, which helps us avoid large problems. After that, we go about with a human centric approach or uh, we also call it design thinking to come up with multiple solutions. There is not one single solution that we provide to a client, there are multiple solutions. Design thinking aims to understand the customer requirements at hand and helps in rapid prototyping and constant feedback management from the customer. Design thinking is customer centric, which also resonates with work for use vision and Mr. Deepak Mandy's awesome problem solving abilities. We also believe in involving mentors and team members. Brainstorming sessions have been, uh, you know, they've proven quite successful and positive for work for you. Uh, we get on frequent calls with our customers in order to track vital signs, absolutely, which are absolutely necessary for a healthy functioning of a company and processes. Also, before any problem, lean planning is absolutely paramount. It is a conscious and fast way to jot down business strategies and possible workarounds. So that's exactly what we're doing at work for you. Fantastic. And sometimes I think having a fresh set of eyes, taking a look at a business's moat, what they offer, how they fit into the wider sector uh, from an outsourced company like yours can be such a benefit to see the opportunities and the threats that maybe they sometimes can't see. And then to expand those horizons for them for future prospects that may not yet be available. Uh, fantastic. Sounds like you offer a, a really efficient service yourself. And lastly, in your opinion, how has the pandemic transformed the way businesses advertise themselves? Uh, we've noticed Facebook's had a rebranding in a way with their company name changing to Meta. Uh, how does the future uh, instigate or encourage this type of rebranding in your opinion? Uh, well, identifying uh, a customer segment has been the highlight of the pandemic and how we advertise ourselves is like a B2B outsourcing company. The five major parameters that have been identified after the pandemic are cost, health, planet, society and experience. Well, instead of competing with other companies, what we are doing is that we are competing with the last best experience that the customer has had with us. That's the best mode of advertising that we can carry out for us. There is no monopoly in services at the moment. Maybe a minority may disagree, but customers go for an experience rather than a brand. And the bar for expectations has gone up since the pandemic hit us. Customers expect fast results and quick processes. Yes, advertising does come into play, but that is to a very certain level. 
earlier prospecting and roping in new customers was just like dating. Now it's exactly like online dating. The advertising sector has shifted almost entirely to the digital medium instead of the physical medium. Well, instead of developing gate products, the pandemic has infused the realization that uh, developing great values is more important. Companies that followed a human-centric approach even before the pandemic proved to be more resistant to the economic negative climate during the pandemic. And marketing, of course, is the center of a company's growth, and it's not just a branch or division of the company. So it's kind of a soul for any company. Thank you so much for putting it in a nutshell for us. And yes, it does seem that the pandemic uh, has offered a bit of a redistribution in power. And, and now with more transparency, we're working out exactly how workers and businesses can be perfectly matched. Like you say, I love the analogy of the uh, online dating. And yes, it looks like the, the sky's the limit. Once you match the right people with the right work, you can really get the most out of them. Um, thank you, Anuranjan. Was there any final insights you'd like to share? What are the near-term uh, pipeline goals for your business? Well, uh, we have uh, quite big plans for the future. We are uh, expanding like anything. The pandemic uh, was kind of an opportunity for us to uh, redevelop uh, our processes. And we have really come up with a uh, new workforce, new enthusiasm and new processes in place. And yes, we have big plans for the future and we are going to grow uh, quite exponentially in one or two years. Sounds great. And best of luck with your near term goals and your growth uh, strategy. Thanks. Well, thank you for being available for Expert Talks by Calcom. We really do appreciate your insights today. Thank you. Thank you. Sage. It was a pleasure interacting with you. And if you've just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion, Mr. Anuranjan Sharma, Digital Marketing Head at works for you and the full recorded interview will be available on YouTube at Calkine Media and as we say stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Welcome to the Executive Corner Expert Talks by Calcine TV. I'm Sage, but today's guest is an Australian essayist, author and economist whose most recent offering is his published book, Different Essays. They're certainly different. Published in 2021 by Balboa Press, a division of Hay House. His friends say that Charles is a conceptual thinker meaning that he's normally to be found outside of the box. He challenges the economic and political status quo with a laconic dry wit, and we're excited to have him live on the show today. Please keep watching for what should be a very interesting interview. So bringing you live today, we have Mr. Charles Pinwell, the author of Different Essays. They're certainly different. Welcome to the show, Charles. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to be here. Thanks. In my work, Charles. <laughs> Yes, thank you for making it along. Um, we're glad you found us. Congratulations on your book. I've read some of it and found it stimulating and humorous. And just off the cuff, could you share with us your driving inspiration, please? Well, I think I'm probably a political animal to some extent. I, I, uh, I'm inspired by something called um, subsidiarity, which is, which is a concept that everything uh, should 
decisions and policies should be made at the lowest possible point in society. You don't ask the world government to patch your potholes. You don't ask the state to raise your children. And that's why I got interested in things like money because they empower or disempower um, people at the bottom of the pyramid. Exactly right. But we all have the same needs, basically, don't we? We're all human. And you've, ha you've had some very interesting concepts in your book, between those pages, to say the least, about the national dividend, about bankruptcy being a survival tactic for the current fiat system. <laughs> some very interesting discussion points, which I'm sure would take more than the 10-minute time slot that we've got. Absolutely. So um, just a comment. Yeah, Please. On. Well, probably the most interesting thing or the most important thing I've done is um, a national profit and loss account or a supply and demand account. I did it for the United States because the statistics are easy to come by there. And it showed that the um, income of all Americans uh, aggregated together is $10.1 uh, trillion. And they actually produced and sold 12 and a half trillion dollars worth of consumer goods. So that to me means that they're profitable, they're producing more than they're consuming in the process. So I'm suggesting that uh, one option is to pay a national dividend. Um, and since money is now all living in cyberspace as it were, it's not difficult or impossible to do that and large sums have been created with quantitative easing uh, that can now... Quantitative easing could have been issued in a democratic way where we all get an equal share of the money votes, as it were. Exactly. I, li I like the sound of this so far, resonating very strongly with the discussion we're just about to have. So let's get started. Um, the Australian right. Emissions Target sounds like a good place to start. We've come into the spotlight again for being the developed country ranked last for climate change action. Hopefully that's changed with some of the summits that have been going on this week. But how does Australia's position in the commodities and cyclicals play a role in this lag, in your opinion, please? Well, um, probably not that right fellow to ask that question to because I started a more basic level and I come from a different place as the book says. I'm very interested and have researched what I can on the role of CO2 as um, a hothouse gas and it's true that it's very effective it's also true that it's very limited. In fact CO2 can only operate at very specific wavelengths of the heat radiating from Earth or the uh, ultra-red um, radiation. And that, that happens around about either side of 4.1 microns and between 14 and 16 microns. Outside of that, CO2 has no impact at all, it's not a hothouse gas at all. And even within those wavelengths, the most um, effective and the most active the hothouse gas is water vapour. And so when all the analysis is done, and I'm quoting science against those who say that we need to look at the science, 18% of the heat operating, uh, escaping from Earth can be theoretically uh, intercepted by CO2, but <clears throat> the facts are that water vapour does most of that, and according to Professor uh, Van Briefsen, um, only 4.5% of the heat escaping from Earth is susceptible to being intercepted by CO2, and therefore that confirms actually the best evidence, which is the uh, geological evidence, which shows that in the Cambrian period, when CO2's level were five times higher than they are now, 2,000 parts per million, the Earth was only two or three degrees hotter than it is now. So I'm afraid, although it's not politically correct and it's not done in polite society, 
CI2 has a very limited ability to alter our climate and therefore all the other questions related around that don't make any sense to me. Okay. <laughs> very interesting perspective. It certainly does kind of reset your understanding of what the current environmental crisis in some ways is posing. Thank you, Charles. I, I, for think, <laughs> I think it has to be done. I'm, honestly, it has to be done. We have to confront some of those. If anybody can tell me that CO2 operates outside of those limited wavelengths, nobody does. I mean, it's accepted that that's it's limited there. Um, sorry, I'll have to kill my phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you had a few yes. other questions. Mine, yes. and I'll, I'll probably throw you up wild card answers as well, but there you go. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very interesting. On to the next one, which kind of might provide a solution to the national dividend um, proposition that you have brought up. Cryptocurrency adoption into the mainstream is a trending topic. Cyber money. How do you see this decentralised finance to disrupt the existing fiat system of finance? Do you think there is a way these high-level theories can be put into the real-world application? My own view is that the cryptocurrencies, because they're going to have to be arbitrated when disputes arise between somebody's paid his cryptocurrency and he hasn't got his product or they're given the product and not got the cryptocurrency, once government starts to arbitrate that, what government arbitrates, it regulates, and that's, that's just how it is. I think it will be regulated if government, and more particularly, if the current masters of the fiat money system decide that they want it regulated. Um, I think the, the orthodox system may adopt some of their technical means of transferring blips, as it were, but um, I, I really can't see cryptocurrency um, making a big difference in the world. I think what has to happen is that the current credit creation system has to be changed. Instead of issuing all new money uh, as debt, it will have to be issued as credit. In other words, instead of having a a minus sign in front of it for everybody, it will have a plus sign in front of it and will liquidate debt. The national debts of the world actually reflect the accumulated profits that have had to be monetized because we can't afford to buy them. You know, if you, if you paid $10 to produce $12 worth of product, you can't buy $2 worth. So the only thing is to create, at the moment, you create more debt of $2, so the national debt goes up by $2. Now, if you can say, well, right, let's not create a debt of $2, but a credit, then you cancel $2 worth of that debt as well as keep the economy operating. So, you know, people don't talk like this. Um, it's, there's been a small body of people who've thought this thing out over the last 100 years, um, and I perhaps represent them today. Thank you so much for sharing your insights there. And you mentioned that there's been a lot of quantitative easing over the, the lockdown period and the pandemic. And that's possibly the cause of the inflation spikes that we're seeing at the moment. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it pans out. Australian's yeah. Reserve Bank is saying it's only transitory, and hopefully it is only transitory. Moving on to our next discussion point, the US President Joe Biden's infrastructure bill is promising many things, including local manufacturing of semiconductors. Do you think this will help the global demand for GPUs? We've heard of Tesla having to put back or having delays with creating manufacturing cars and Nintendos now as well. I don't think anything much will interrupt the advance of technologically and technology and its application. There will be at times shortages of purchasing power and if that's not attended to by making sure that, you know, um, fiat money is available and the economy can operate normally. But I don't, I don't think that uh, we'll see um, uh, Joe Biden's actions 
influence develop of technology particularly. I mean, he hasn't got it through yet, so that's another problem he's got, but <laughs> I'm not very hopeful of it doing anything much in technology that's not inevitably going to happen anyhow. Okay, thank you very much for sharing your perspective there. Now, we just touched on quantitative easing a little bit earlier and how it's affecting yeah. inflation. Um, what do you think about cryptocurrency providing a hedge against inflation? Is cryptocurrency the new gold? Well, the first thing I do is define what inflation is. Inflation is too much money chasing too few goods in in uh, some people's minds. I define it as an increase in the money supply accompanied by an increase in prices. And we haven't had much in the way of inflation lately because the creation of money has been less than the deficiency of purchasing power. Um, cryptocurrency, um, it doesn't seem to me to be penetrating into the everyday household goods and services type market. And I honestly, I doubt that it will. You can't pay your taxes with it. Uh, there are a lot of things you can't do with it. And my friends or acquaintances that are involved in it seem to want to buy cryptocurrencies if they think they're going to go up and sell them if they think they're going to go down. And that's, it's a bit like, they might as well go to the roulette in the, in the, in the casino. Um, I don't think they're going to play much of a part. What's going to shift things is the amount of fiat money which is created. And more importantly, just as important, is how that's put into circulation whether it's put into circulation by giving it to high net worth individuals, as has been the case with um, quantitative easing, or whether we decide that everybody's a shareholder in their country. We do that politically, we get more um, same amount of votes. If we decide that everybody's a shareholder in this Australia Unlimited or wherever we, or whatever country it is, and distribute them as a dividend. Um, it's not going to be inflationary if we're not issuing more than the numbers tell us to issue when we've done our books of accounts. See, governments don't do uh, normal books of account that companies do. Uh, it's it's nearly it's nearly ten years since the Australian government did it. A, uh, a balance sheet and that wasn't a comprehensive balance sheet and they left out the two biggest items there uh, the biggest liability and the biggest asset and they just don't do profit and loss accounts or supply and demand accounts at all so they can't really they can't really be informed uh, about what the economy needs about what's happening and until until something like that happens uh, it's all a big guessing game you're not wrong. It's it's very difficult to work out what's driving the crypto markets. You're absolutely right. Um, but there have been some developments. Apparently, Commonwealth Bank will be accepting some crypto payments. That's just been announced. And MasterCard as well. So it would be very interesting to see how it does progress into the mainstream and if it does work out. We're reaching the end of the discussion now, Charles. Thank you for making time for us today. And this Thanks, is a topic that's just started simmering. Australia's foreign relations have become of interest, firstly with China over the inquiry into the beginnings of COVID-19. Now with France over uh, Mr Morrison breaking the submarine deal. How do you think Australia's role in AUKUS, an international alliance between the UK, USA and Australia, will impact Australia's foreign relations further? I think Australia's being included in the US and UK uh, threesome because of our geopolitical position. Um, with that type of alliance, there'd be a presence in both sides of the Atlantic, both sides of the Pacific, and one side of the Indian Ocean. So we've got a pretty good geographical 
uh, distribution on the planet in order to do whatever has to be done defence-wise. My big question, I, and I don't, I'll never have, I'll never be given the answer to this one, but in my experience, almost every week, Australian mining companies are finding um, metals of all sorts, hundreds of metres under the ground by all sorts of technologies that have to do with um, specific gravity, they have to do with magnetism and whatever, what have you. So it seems to me, is that technology operate at sea? Um, a submarine's no, no use to anybody, everybody knows where it is, or the enemy knows where it is. It's, it's, if it's not on the surface, you can't see it, but if you know where it is, you don't need to see it. So I'd like to, you know, if I were making a decision, that's the first thing I'd want to know. <laughs> Are these submarines really give us an advantage if they're under the water instead of on top of it? Or is that just a nonsense? As it may be with some technology in the future, or even of the present for that matter. So uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's from Australia's point of view, there are pl big pluses in being part of the geopolitical threesome, as it were. There will also be obligations. And I have a few doubts about the our partners at times. <laughs> the Americans have done some really stupid things in the past, but they're the first people to finance Ho Chi Minh, for instance, and, and they handed the Indonesian Peninsula over to the Japanese uh, appointed government there. And uh, we're okay about handing over West Aryan. You know, um, we're still going to have to keep our our wits about us, and and have an independent insight into what happens in our our part of the world. Thank you, <laughs> Charles. Apparently, um, President Biden was invited to the ASEAN conference recently. It's the first time a, a U.S. president has attended. So. I guess uh, he's trying to build up some uh, brownie points with the Asia Pacific region now that he's joined AUKUS. <laughs> and, um... there's, some, there's something there. I mean, uh, honestly, I, right back at Brexit, I suspected that there was an intent behind Brexit that didn't altogether conflict with the establishment's wish in the matter, um, although it seemed otherwise. and. With Brexit, the United States and Australia, I think we might be starting to see a pattern there. Uh, we're not, these things are not shared with the great unwashed, and I'm just part of the hoi polloi, but I can smell. Um, I got a bit of a bloodhound's nose for that type of thing, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> mm. Yes, it'll be interesting to see how things develop. Um, and Brexit is very interesting to watch. And French fishing boats in British waters seems to be still a pulsing issue in regards to Brexit. Well, thank you for making time for the show. Your concepts and ideas are definitely attention-grabbing and <laughs> thought-provoking. <laughs> we do appreciate your different. insights. It's certainly different. I've got another 21 that haven't been published yet, so I don't know. We might have a... Might have a sequence come up before I'm a lot older, we'll see. Oh, that'll be nice. Let us nice know how you go and best of luck. Thank you. And for those that have just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion. Mr Charles Pinwell, an essayist and author of Different Essays. They're certainly different. That's the name of the book. And the full recorded interview will be available on YouTube at Calkine Media. Please check it out. Keep watching Calkine Media for more of the expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. 
whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and MBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Chris Poria, co-founder and CEO of Early Birds. Now Early Birds is a privately held information services company specializing in innovation programs, disruptive technology, consulting, strategy, amongst other areas. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Now, Chris launched Early Birds back in 2019 and it has now more than 2 million innovators on the platform, 500 companies and over 100 SME consultants with the numbers growing quickly. Hello there, Chris. Great to have you to speak to you today. Hey, Rachel. Thank you very much for having me. Now, Alibirds has a myriad of applications of technology with a lot to offer across multiple industries. Can you name some of the early focus areas and some of the key areas of Alibirds? Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Yes, of course. Uh, so Alibird, to start with, just to give you a bit of context, um, Early Birds is an open ecosystem uh, that connects organizations, uh, including um, innovators, early adopters, and subject matter experts, uh, to accelerate capacity, speed, culture, uh, to innovate and solve uh, business and technical challenges. Um, just these, some of these keywords I have used, like innovators, um, I mean startups, scale-ups, and mature companies, uh, and when I'm saying early adopters, basically organizations looking to build capacity uh, and a competitive edge uh, and subject matter experts or SMEs are basically domain or industry experts. So we try to connect basically all of those three uh, uh, key stakeholders as part of our, our platform. Uh, and uh, as per your question, um, though we do not have any limitations in terms of our focus, uh, but the key focus, uh, of course, are cybersecurity, for example, AI, uh, Internet of Things, blockchain, uh, especially recently net zero technology, uh, and fin fintech and ad tech as well. Now, you recently revamped your platform and website. What was the reasoning behind this? I think uh, uh, there are a couple of reasons for that, uh, especially uh, because and, uh, the first reason is especially we are preparing from startup uh, to to becoming a scale-up company. Uh, so we just wanted to make sure that we are aligned uh, uh, our brand uh, that people can remember. So therefore, you might have seen that in our uh, new brand, uh, we have a focus on the space because humans are very curious about space and it also links with innovation. Uh, so our new brand team is around space. Uh, and number two is uh, we just wanted to have a clear messaging for all of our three key stakeholders, um, innovators, early adopters, and subject matter experts. And of course, uh, the third is our milestone uh, that we have crossed. Uh, actually, we have crossed 2.5 million innovators. Uh, so we just wanted to create that uh, kind of milestone as well. There's some fabulous numbers there. So does Early Birds follow an established mechanism or a customized approach to help assist early adopters? Yes, we do actually. Uh, what we call it agility framework. So our agility framework is basically a combination of uh, agile and agility, those two keywords, uh, because every organization now wanted to become what we call it self-learning organization. And to become a self-learning organization, we believe that we have to do three things. The first thing is 
continuous improvement across all business functions uh, because you cannot be just successful by improving just your IT, for example. Uh, the second thing you need to do is resolve business and technical challenges as quickly as possible. Uh, and it, it's interesting, actually, with some of the organization we are working with, uh, even defining the challenge itself can take months. Uh, so we are definitely helping them to reduce that. The third thing is you have to explore disruptive uh, solutions and innovations. So what we are doing is using our agility framework, uh, we are delivering to those three key uh, initiatives uh, using our challenger program, where uh, we solve one business or technical challenge at a time, uh, our explorer program, which is basically on, uh, ongoing innovation as a service, and then the third one is our platform ecosystem that includes our innovators and subject matter experts. So how does Early Birds look to enhance its umbrella of capabilities amid the advancing culture, obviously it's moving so fast, to innovate and to help solve business and technical challenges? Yeah, so basically, uh, 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 as I said, the Early Birds focus is to bring um, early adopter organizations, um, innovators and SMEs together. And as part of our core business, uh, we identify solutions uh, to businesses and technical challenges. Therefore, what we do is we keep investing in the technology processes uh, to support those capabilities. Uh, as an example, uh, we have uh, a couple of months back, we uh, launched our, our innovation maps. So basically innovation maps is looking into a specific industry theme or a challenge theme uh, where we can provide more specific insight into that. For example, we re uh, launched a cybersecurity innovation map where we are tracking global cybersecurity capabilities through those innovation maps. And recently we have just started uh, working on net zero technology uh, maps to help uh, not only Australian organizations, but globally uh, uh, organizations who are interested in technologies which can help us to achieve our net zero targets. And the number of registered innovators with early birds has now increased to more than two million. How do you project future growth in the number of innovators? Yeah, so uh, it's interesting that initial, uh, initially we had our challenge uh, that we have to build one side of the platform, which was basically innovators. Uh, so we have done that successfully. Uh, now uh, we have also got subject matter experts to serve our, what we call it, initial early adopter customers uh, in Australia to start with um, and we have done that as well so what we see now going forward we see consistent growth in the innovators because we are capturing more and more innovators globally um, as well as we will see a lot of growth in earlier uh, adopter organizations who wanted to look into our platform our ecosystem uh, to take advantage of, uh, of uh, the opportunities through the platform. Oh, fabulous. And just finally, Chris, you've mentioned there about assisting global organizations where Early Birds has been successful in. What are your expansion plans? So we have, uh, actually, there are a number of global organizations who are already subscribers to our platform. Uh, but those are mostly the individual subscribers coming from these big organizations. Uh, our initial focus is to build enterprise customers in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, on the other hand, we are already talking to organizations in US and UK. Uh, so most probably uh, we will establish ourselves well in uh, Australia and New Zealand to start with. And then we are going to look at uh, North America and Europe as our next steps. And you've been working with some public and private sector organizations that are on the journey to build Australia's sovereign innovation capabilities. What is the scale like there that we're talking about? So, uh, in um, actually, early birds tracking more than 130,000 Australian based organizations. And uh, we are continuing to increase that local innovation capability so that we can assist public and private sector to build Australian sovereign capability. Uh, but on top of this, what we are also doing is we are looking at the capability at the global level and look at where are the sweet spots for different regions 
And if Australia needs to work with other countries to build those specific capabilities and vice versa, of course. Uh, so it's kind of a mix of both, uh, you know, building a sovereign capability, but then looking into what are our, what are our strategy in the next few years uh, and which area uh, and where do we stand in those, uh, those uh, you know, plans and strategies. And then we look at globally how we can fill that gap if we want to look at those building those specific capability going forward. Well, it's been fantastic chatting with you today, Chris, and learning about early birds. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Rachel, for your time. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, Rose Jacobs here with you for Kalkine Media. Today we're exploring why businesses are moving out of Myanmar. Before we dive in, make sure you hit that bell icon at the bottom of your screen for all the latest updates. Since Feb of 21, a lot has been happening in Myanmar as the world collectively fights the COVID-19 pandemic. This third world country has another life-threatening war going on. Last year in February, the military took over the country, causing civil, economic and political unrest. The military junta took over Myanmar in Feb of 2021. And this political, economic and civil disruption is likely to be continued for years. The world power and international organizations are against this military takeover. Therefore, Myanmar is isolated amid the pandemic. The organized rival government, the National Unity Government, is fighting against the military and thankfully, it has the full support of the other ASEAN and Western countries. The business environment is at risk in Myanmar. The US has passed an act that legitimizes and supports NUG and stands against the military rule and the businesses running under it. Thus, the businesses functioning under military rule are now at risk. Additionally, international communities would impose penalties on businesses dealing with the military. There is a high propensity that the conflict will escalate in the coming months. So businesses are becoming more and more hesitant about continuing their services in the country. Now let's take a glance at Myanmar's economic monitor for January 2022 released by the World Bank. The World Bank released the Myanmar economic monitor report on 25th of January. The report summarizes that the civilians of Myanmar are being severely tested by the ongoing pandemic and the military takeover. The report projects 
projects growth of 1% in Myanmar in the current year till September of 2022. Additionally, the economy will continue to contract about 30% smaller than it would have been without the pandemic and the military clash. Sectors like finance, electricity, logistics and digital connections face significant issues. The country is also undergoing foreign exchange constraints. Conflicts are escalating in Myanmar, firstly because of humanitarian constraints and secondly because of a fall in economic activities. The supply and demand chain in the country is severely disrupted. However, output and employment seems to have stabilised in recent months. So the conclusion for now? Because of these problems, most firms in the country have gone through significant losses, mostly facing a financial crunch and cash flow shortages. Because of disruptions in the economic activities, businesses are moving out of Myanmar, which poses weak growth prospects for the country. So do continue to watch this space, but that's a wrap for now. Be sure to check out the website for more, calkinemedia.com, and make sure that you do like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thank you again for joining me. Could DeFi impact the global economy? An interesting thought, right? Well, let's find out more in this video. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. The world went through a financial crisis in 2008 and is currently dealing with the corona epidemic, both of which have put world's financial systems to the test. Decentralized finance has managed to flourish despite many earth-shattering events. DeFi was invented in 2018 by a group of Ethereum creators and entrepreneurs eager to liberate finance applications from existing infrastructure. And DeFi's blockchain-based technology turned out to be a lifesaver for many in these trying times, challenging the existing financial ecosystem. So how is DeFi revolutionizing the financial economy at the macro level? Decentralized finance is built on the peer-to-peer -peer principle, which removes the need for middlemen in the system. And DeFi democratizes finance. They're replacing traditional centralized institutions like non-banking, financial companies, brokerages and banks by relying on self-executing smart contracts on the blockchain network and peer-to-peer -peer philosophies. Smart contracts govern the transactions, which are almost instantaneous and nearly free. In addition, other financial organizations and banks impose fees for using their services, but DeFi eliminates them. And rather than keeping money at a bank, it is possible to retain it in a secure digital wallet. And anyone with an internet connection will be able to use it without the requirement for approval and funds will be transferred within seconds. DeFi aspires to establish a more fundamentally functional financial landscape powered by blockchain technology. Before stepping into the future, it's important to know how DeFi platforms in 2020 and 2021 worked. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic, among other factors, played a major role in the emergence of DeFi. 
Due to the severe financial conditions of millions of people around the world, many people were looking for other ways of making money. DeFi meets most consumer concerns in several ways. And moreover, DeFi does not require huge cash to get started and has very low entry criteria. Blockchain and smart contracts make it possible to retain a high level of secrecy while doing transactions and there's less danger of being misled. So in 2021, more people were getting into the digital asset sector due to the growing popularity of cryptocurrencies and blockchains. And on its road to becoming the next big thing in finance, DeFi is at a critical juncture. And it must develop to suit its expansion and the demand of the outside world. What's next? The potential of DeFi is enormous. Given DeFi has very low entry criteria, it might enable the unbanked to participate in the economy, lower the cost of doing business, as well as open new investment opportunities for people worldwide. And if you do like this information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel. If you press that bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos by Kalkine. But for more articles like this, there's a website. It's kalkinemedia.com. And I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Hello and welcome to the Penny Picks here on Calcine TV. I'm your host Holly and today we'll be shedding some light on Melbana Energy, Cooper Metals, I should say, and Alara Resources, which are three penny stocks delivering stellar gains. Now the Australian market is trading negative for the day after ending last week with a 0.6% gain on Friday. The benchmark ASX 200 was down 0.55 or 39.2 points by the lunch hours. Meanwhile, A read to the worst hit, having tumbled around 2%, and financials, telcos, and healthcare were all down over 1% each. Small caps as well are performing relatively better today, but still trading lower than Friday's close. And the ASX Small Ordinary Index took a hit of 0.34%. However, a few penny stocks are delivering stellar intraday returns, overcoming investor pessimism in today's session. Let's have a look at three of these stocks. First up is Sydney-based Melbana Energy, an independent oil and gas exploration company, having an attractive portfolio of development stage projects in Cuba and in Australia. The company has been continuously abating its losses, having reported $1.4 million in the financial year 24, 21, I should say, compared with $2.16 million a year ago and $3.36 million in 2019. Melbourne shares have been on a tear since the beginning of February so far as well this month. It's rallied over 100% in a matter of five trading sessions to the last trading price of 0.046 cents. Now today's 24.32% gain has come in Melbourne Energy shares after the company announced that its drilling operations at the Amir One Exploration Well have indicated a potential gross reservoir. On top of that, there have also been significant oil shows present throughout the shale shakers and in cutting samples. And then the next stock to have a look at is Cooper Metals, which is also an Australian ASEC listed mineral exploration company. The company has a market cap of $18.4 million and they're primarily focused on the discovery of gold and copper projects. And on Friday, Cooper Metal shares rallied 26.03%, and today the stock was up as well at 15.22. Now, investor sentiment has seen a positive change after the follow-up wrong chip sampling at the company's Mount Isa East project, which continues to demonstrate widespread copper and gold mineralization. Today, Cooper Metal shares traded at the second highest volume over 3.1 million since their listing in November last year. And then finally, Alara Resources has been a frequent name on our list in the last few weeks, all thanks to its massive ongoing rally. The company has two mining projects, one each in Saudi Arabia and Oman, and its market cap has touched the $56 million mark for the first time in the last several years. Now, Alara Resources shares have surged to a high of 0.12 cents today's session, and they were seen trading at 21.25 and 0.095 cents. 
The reason for today's rally is the commencement of the initial mining activities at its 51% owned Alwashi Majaza Copper Gold project. The project is now a few months away from becoming an ore producing mine. And in the last one month, Alara stock has delivered a mammoth return of over 395%, so almost 400% there. Well, with that, it's time to wrap up the penny picks, but join us next time only on Calcine TV. This is Holly Shields signing off. Hi there, James Preston for Calcine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Hi there, Rose Jacobs with you for Calkine. Before we dive in, make sure you hit that bell icon at the bottom of your screen for all the latest updates. Some Canadians are protesting against vaccine mandates. Will it impact Canadian economies? Well, let's find out in this video. Canada is witnessing protests over vaccine mandates and COVID-19 measures. After a week-long drive across the country, a fleet of big rigs known as the Freedom Convoy reached Ottawa recently. Truckers reportedly started protesting against the vaccine mandate for crossing the US-Canada border implemented by the Justin Trudeau government earlier in January. Let's take a look at the issue. So what is the vaccine mandate? As per the mandate, unvaccinated Canadian truckers need to quarantine upon returning home after crossing the US-Canada border. Published reports claim that after the new measures were announced, truckers and conservative groups got together to organise the Cross Canada Drive. After starting from Western Canada, the drive got momentum and gathered support as it drove to the eastern parts of the country. It is expected that the protesters will continue to stay near Parliament Hill and hope for the government to take back their border vaccine and any other public health mandate right across the country. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was reportedly shifted to a secret location along with his family as the unprecedented protests gripped the national capital. Will the protests impact on the Canadian economy? Well, some retailers in Canada require customers to show their proof of vaccination and government issued identity cards before entering the stores. In Quebec, retailers like Walmart, Costco, Ikea and Canadian Tire Corporation are among retailers who have to take such measures to limit unvaccinated people to purchasing 
only essential goods. Public health restrictions like these could affect retailers and consumers negatively as the pandemic and lockdowns have already forced people to live in a restricted environment. If these restrictions continue, consumers could stop visiting stores, which would most likely reduce the retailer's sales. Additionally, truckers play an essential role in the Canadian economy, and according to the Government of Canada, the transportation and warehousing industry is vital to the country's economy. The Canadian Transportation Economic Account data of 2016 stated the transportation sector contributed 168.1 billion Canadian dollars or 8% of the gross domestic product. If the truckers continue protesting against the vaccine mandate, the transport industry could incur losses. And so the conclusion? Well, the period of uncertainty due to any event is worst for a stock market. As reports surface that the Prime Minister has shifted to a secret location due to ongoing protests, could be taken negatively by equities markets investors. If this uncertainty continues, the markets could see a dip as investors will likely be wary of making investments. But that's a wrap for now. Please check out the website for more, calkinemedia.com, and make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thanks for joining me. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks exclusive to Kalkine TV. The troubles in Victoria by now have been well documented. Whilst COVID-19 is causing problems, the real virus increasingly is that of the Daniel Andrews government. Ruling with a hand over fist mentality that includes weaponising the police force against citizens, mandating vaccines for millions and as it now turns out, barring members of parliament from entering the Victorian chamber. One of those politicians who has been banned from entry into Parliament is Legislative Council Representative Tim Quilty from the Liberal Democrats, and he joins me live now on Calkine TV. Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Hopefully you're hearing me this time. Tim, got you loud and clear. Now, look, you're one of the members of the Parliament Excellent. in Exile at the moment. Can you explain what that is and why you're a part of it? OK, so... Uh a couple of weeks ago, the Andrews government brought in rules to say that uh, all members of parliament would have to show their vaccine passports in order to participate in the parliament. Um, it's because, and because they're doing this to everyone else in Victoria as well, they decided to make some special rules for them as well. Um, David and I refused to show our papers because we don't believe in the vaccine. We think it's a uh, gross violation of human rights of Victorians. Um, we, we, we're both vaccinated. We could easily show our papers and turn up, but we refused to do that, so we got kicked out of the parliament. Um, we called it a, a, a purge. Um, they kicked MPs out of parliament. What's left is a rump parliament. Last time this happened in a West, Westminster democracy was back in 1648 when Cromwell uh, purged the so he could get a, a remaining rump that would vote for him, support for him being the king, um, when he went on then to become dictator of... Uh, England. Um, so a, a shocking thing that they've done. They've upturned hundreds of centuries of press, parliamentary precedent to do it. Um, but we didn't buckle under it. So we have set up a rebel parliament or parliament in exile in a basement in a nightclub in Melbourne. Um, <laughs> and we've been conducting parliament from here for the last week. Now, I understand as well that whilst you have got your separate parliament set up there, it now doesn't actually allow you to vote on parliamentary issues. How can that possibly be the case, given you are still an elected representative? Yeah, well, exactly. This is the whole problem with it. Um, because te technically under the Constitution, you can't vote unless you're at the parliament. And then by passing this, this rule that barred us from accessing the parliament, they took our vote away. Um, and right when they were introducing their uh, permanent pandemic legislation mm. power that's going to give uh, the power to extend this state of emergency in depth. Um, or that their motivation was to get rid of our voices, um, to get rid of our vote, to make it easier for them to push. 
Well, let's touch on that right now because obviously this is the big talking point at the moment is the fact that it's, it's pretty intense legislation that's being pushed forward. Typically what we've seen is a state of emergency that just seems to be constantly rolled over despite the current scenario that Victoria is experiencing. This would obviously give somewhat unprecedented powers. We're having people like yourself who can't vote on it. Do you now know what is actually included in it? Because it's been very much a document of secrecy. Oh, absolutely. They, they've been working on this bill for months, but uh, they didn't show it to any In fact, the official government line was uh, MPs didn't deserve to see it. We weren't. Uh, um, I think the tennis authority should push back and can't open again if government, if, if um, Andrew is trying to chuck his weight around like this. Um, it's nothing to do with tennis. It's nothing to do with safety. It's, it's uh, about Andrew's ego. Well, Tim, thank you so much for your time today. Is there any final thoughts you'd like to leave with our audience? Um, I don't know. I don't know. This, it just, this keeps going on. Um, if one, one day we'll get out of this. Uh, we're going to push back against this legislation the government's proposing. Uh, we've got to block it or not. Um, but at some point, people got to wake up and realise that the government's completely out of control. Um, I'll say what I said to someone yesterday. Never trust your governments. Don't give them the Use it. We've seen that now for 18 months. Um, governments are not to be trusted. Well, Tim, thank you so much for your time today. Right, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Well, that's Tim Quilty, MP for the Liberal Democrats. And if you missed any part of that conversation, you can catch the full interview later on our YouTube channel, Kalkai Media. I'm James Preston, signing off for now.